based in Cairo. So some of you who may not know about ERF, it's a think tank like AERC, uh, mainly covering uh, North Africa and Middle East. So it's uh, one of uh, highly reputed uh, research and capacity building forums. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to see that our project has come uh, through. Uh, and today we are uh, almost disseminating the findings. Uh, when we started this project, there was no COVID, there was no Ukraine war, and uh, the world was more or less predictable. So some of the things we are hearing from our panelists uh, about the role of disruptive technologies might seem from the perspective where we are standing today a little bit overreaching, but the technologies are evolving, emerging, uh, and potentially transforming uh, economies globally, regionally, and also nationally. So I'm very pleased to invite uh, the Director of Research uh, and Programs in ERF, uh, Ms. Yasmin Fahim, uh, to give us her opening uh, remarks on behalf of ERF, uh, and then we proceed to uh, the next uh, um, item of the agenda. Uh, the Executive Director of ARC will join us uh, later in the day. Uh, so while we wait, uh, uh, let me give uh, Yasmin the floor. So Yasmin, uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, go ahead and uh, make your opening statements. And we all uh, welcome to listen to you. Thank you. We are very happy and excited about today's event. Uh, by way of background, we launched this project in March 2020, indeed before COVID times. Uh, this project uh, received generous support from Carnegie Corporation. Uh, this inter-regional collaboration uh, on implication of digitalization and disruptive technologies for sustainable growth, poverty, inequality, women and youth uh, in MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa involves three country case studies from the MENA region. Those are Egypt, Morocco, and Jordan, and four Sub-Saharan countries, South Africa, Senegal, Kenya, and Ethiopia. The, uh, the, in addition to that, there are th uh, two broader thematic framework papers that were, were produced. One highlighting the role of digitalization in the structural transformation in MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa, and another providing a comparative analysis of mobile internet uptake and use in both regions. Today, we are delighted to share with you the results of the two thematic papers, in addition to the five case studies of the four Sub-Saharan African countries. As for the MENA uh, case studies, these are still under production. We just concluded data collection in uh, the three countries, Morocco, Jordan, and Egypt. Uh, the, sur we, the surveys are extensive surveys providing information on e-firms. Uh, such data and information was not available. Uh, so this brings a lot of value also to the project. Um, the MENA studies will be disseminated in early 2023 in a similar event. And we hope you will also join us for that one. We are grateful for the generous contribution of the Carnegie Corporation, which made this project possible. And I would like also to thank the authors of the papers uh, for their efforts and dedication throughout the project. Uh, of course, we are very thankful to our partner and sister organization, the ARC, for this fruitful collaboration, uh, their valuable support and insights in this project. Uh, it really was a pleasure working with the ARC team as usual. Uh, and we are looking forward to continuing this partnership in the future through new fruitful projects and collaborations. Enjoy the presentations and look forward to engaging and uh, stimulating discussions. Thank you. Over to you, Abebe. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful uh, welcoming, as uh, she mentioned, uh, this has been uh, just one of the uh, collaborations we have with ERF. We work on multiple projects with them, uh, and it has been growing and strengthening uh, over the past few years. Uh, and we are very grateful uh, for the support uh, and at the same time for the partnership. 
Uh, so, uh, as we wait uh, our keynote speakers from uh, the Safaricom, uh, which is, we thought is uh, most appropriate for us to um, give us insights. They are one of the companies, uh, at least in Africa, who have made uh, advances in uh, uh, new technologies with regard to payment systems. Uh, and they have first-hand experience, if at all, about the uh, nature of technological disruptions uh, in the sector, in the financial sector in which they specialize. Um, so while we wait for them, probably we take a little health break. I mean, this is too soon to take a break, but scholars, that's what we are planning to do. And then uh, we come straight forward in uh, about uh, 10 minutes, uh, stretching the legs, whatever. Uh, and then uh, uh, we go straight into the presentations of the papers. Um, so we apologize a bit uh, for the disruptions in discussing disruptive technologies. <laughs> but we'll manage, uh, and, and uh, I beg your indulgence. Uh, since you have also stakeholders here, uh, very happy to uh, see that uh, we will be uh, navigating very well uh, through the afternoon. We have uh, coffee and uh, tea uh, available uh, to all of you. Uh, so we'll get back to you in about a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Hello. Good morning, Jam. Yeah. Do, do you hear me? Yes, yes. we hear you. Are okay, you okay. Well? I just couldn't, uh, didn't seem to work. No, it works very well. So. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to check that you, you could hear me. Yeah, we want to check also. Okay. Are, are you ready? Because we are having a short, me? A short break. <laughs> So I was looking at uh, the. Uh, yeah, I'm. If you are ready, we could we could just uh, uh, probably uh, go ahead um, with your presentation. I think that makes a lot of sense. No, it's okay either way. But no, no, no. We that, are. I'm very happy. Um, it's up to you. Yes, uh, it's up to me. Uh, so why don't we put up your presentation? Uh, Colleagues, you can help us uh, with the PowerPoint for uh, the first session. It's uh, Professor Jem De Melo. He's a good friend, so okay. I, I can abuse him. Maybe, maybe I should. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. Um, should I? You can share your PowerPoint with us. Wait a second. If I say share now, do you, can, do you see my screen? Um, yeah, I'm seeing it uh, on the Zoom, uh, but we should be able to see it can also you, on the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we see it. Yes, Jamie, we can. Yes. Yeah, we see it. Uh, so go okay. ahead. Okay. Yeah. All right. You are live now. So if, if that's okay, and, and uh, while we're waiting, uh, if, if it's okay with you, I'll just start and, and uh, quickly uh, go through what I, I tried to do. And uh, by the way, I'm, I'm very sorry that I have not been uh, either available to, to come over. 
and be with you, which is what I was hoping to do. But I was in, a, in another meeting uh, for two days here in Florence, and I just finished last night after two long days uh, of meetings. Uh, and then uh, I had prepared the, the uh, uh, presentation and I, I, I did a, a few changes uh, last night. That's why I didn't send it to you earlier. So uh, let me just say that I'm, in, I'm presenting today the paper that we did for ERF as part of this project which was mostly with a, a somewhat more of a MENA focus, even though it was also uh, concentrating on, on Sub-Saharan Africa. So part of the time, there'd be maybe just a little bit more on MENA than on Sub-Saharan Africa, although I try to do the comparisons all the time. There is also another project which is very closely related, which Abebe has been uh, directing, which is a a uh, collaborative research project on uh, global value chains in Africa. And there we have, a, we have just uh, finished producing eight papers and I'm, I'm sure that 10 papers, I'm sure there will be a, a meeting on that project too. And uh, in that other project, our uh, contribution, which I will not speak about today, is about the implications of um, global value chains and just in general of uh, structural transformation on uh, CO2 emissions. And there the project is looking at the sources of growth in emissions and what to do to reduce emission intensities and globally emissions across African countries and in comparison with other regions. So this is yeah, the other project which is also uh, somewhat related to, to this one. So let me just go ahead and, and try in about 10 minutes to give you the, the gist of the paper, which is both available on, uh, on the website, on the ERF website. There's also a link to a blog, which is a 2000 word summary of that paper and also the links to, to the two pa to those papers at the end of this uh, at the end of this presentation so if i go uh, is 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 it working yes we are, we i'm on the first page no we are seeing yes uh, jimmy okay i'm sorry i'm i'm just just checking okay so very quickly, the, the, the paper is very long. There are, there are a lot of uh, graphs. There are, uh, there are also a lot of tables. And, and I just want to go a, a quick appreciation, looking first at the challenges for, for MENA and the challenges for Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, there's a huge diversity everywhere. But I'm just, for the sake of presentation, going to try and say, well, you know, this, this is maybe the challenge more appropriate for MENA, and this is the one more appropriate for Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'll just go through the overall appreciation for MENA, then the one for Sub-Saharan Africa, even though there's a lot of diversity, and I'll ask you to be kind enough to say, okay, well, he's simplifying, but uh, th that can be somewhat useful. So <clears throat> the data, and I'm not gonna go through it in, in the details, but you, you will have access to it both in some of the the uh, slides in, 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 in the presentation, but especially throughout the paper. For MENA, what we observe is that servi servicification has been extremely low. And I'll get to what is servicification, which is basically what are the share of services, services trade in the, in the economy. As you know, the growth of services has been outpacing the growth of manufacturing for more than a decade. And part of that is uh, what is distinguishing Africa and to some extent also uh, MENA or MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa. They have been growing, their services have been growing 
faster than manufacturing, but not as fast as other comparable countries. Now, what are comparable countries? Well, you know, to make it simple, we say, I, we just go by low income, middle income, and we compare African, Sub-Saharan African and uh, MENA countries with their comparators in terms of per capita income. So MENA has lagged. Okay, so there's a question of why have they lagged? And I'll try and give you some, uh, a, a couple of uh, possible explanations. And there are, two, there are really two, two, two scenarios you could say. Well, so far, <clears throat> there is, because of the growth has been so slow, there's a strong potential and opportunity to leverage digitalization. Now, digitalization was the topic I was assigned, we were assigned to write in this, uh, in this project. So what, 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 what are, the, uh, what are the, the components of digitalization and what are the outcomes? I'll have a slide on that just a little bit later. So the idea is, well, if you can digitalize successfully, then you, know, you will be catching up. And of course, you, you should be catching up because the rest of the world services is growing faster than manufacturing. So you know why uh, we should try and get on the bandwagon. Now, the, the good, uh, or let's say the optimistic scenario is that we have a rather young computer savvy workforce that uh, could be put to, to work, let's say, on digitalization and relative relative to sub-Saharan Africa, the hardware part of digitalization, that is the cables, the networks, the access, the access to, to the digital infrastructure is higher, higher in MENA than in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So in some sense, the elements are there, the hardware is there, but then the, you could say, well, what about the software? The software there will be the policies that go with it on the one hand, and that's the government, but also the readiness of the workforce uh, to participate in digitalization. Now, when I'm talking about digitalization, it's not just access and uh, to do uh, SMS and just uh, communication, but also to use data, data processing, which is very important. And that is where, uh, MENA so far, uh, and of course, even more Sub-Saharan Africa have been, have, have been uh, lagging. So uh, if you're optimistic, you might say, well, digitalization, which is really going to mean the ultimate death of distance, meaning by that death of distance properly measured for services trade data, where services trade data is an increasingly important part of trade, even though very often you cannot measure it because data doesn't cross borders and, and you don't see customs. So uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge to measure it. But as you know, services uh, being uh, embodied in goods, uh, then uh, it's, it will be a complement and very, very uh, important. Now, MENA by and large, I'm exaggerating, of course, but somehow you could say, well, MENA has missed the boat of uh, manufacturing growth. But uh, maybe now they can just uh, get on to this new uh, challenge, which is to digitize, or well, digitize is to get into what was on paper in, in, into digital information but also to digitalize, which is to get all the activities or more of the economic activities uh, in, uh, via, uh, via ICT communications. Now, if they succeed, then uh, they will have missed the boat maybe on manufacturing, but they could catch and they should catch up on uh, the digitalization process. Now, that means that you could, the MENA would be catching up and they, everything is there, at least the hardware is there. But then you have two issues. One is the readiness, and I'll have some, I'll compare here again, the readiness for the network readiness of uh, the MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa with other comparable countries. And there, 
indicators of network readiness are low and also, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, is the uh, importance or, or let's say the, the relative uh, uh, readiness of uh, the public and of people to use uh, digit, digital. So I'll go through the, the, and so here, this is the, let's say the, the two possible scenarios. The bad, uh, well, let's say the, the, the pessimistic, pessimistic scenario is that lack of readiness might slow this, op this opportunity. Now we go, if I go to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, here the challenge is a little bit different because even though we have absolutely no information yet, because digitalization has just started. It is just starting actually in parts of the world, especially in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but to some extent also in MENA. So we haven't observed the outcomes. It's an ongoing process. So all we can do is guess and maybe, of course, also take a look at what has happened in the last 10 years. So in, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, digital readiness is also low. But in addition to that, the cost of capital is high. And uh, there, perhaps the challenge is that if it turns out that the digitalization is going to mean a loss of jobs, or if there are jobs, that the jobs that are created by digitalization are not as high as they would be in the standard manufacturing growth as not even taking into account that uh, there is, of course, some services are embodied in goods trade, then uh, it could be a challenge for employment because it could rob Sub-Saharan Africa from its domestic demographic dividend offered by rising wages in China. So you have rising wages in China, of course. So you have rising wages in China, of course. But geographically, MENA is very close to Europe. So it's very close to its major market. So one of the uh, comments you might say is, well, men has been defying uh, geography. They should be doing better. They, they should have been higher already, okay, uh, initially. Or if you wanted, you could go vertically, say, well, maybe it should have been at 35% in uh, 1990, but then today it should be at, at 50, 55%, or very close to what it is in Europe and Central Asia, right? Because we're so close to it. And so that, that, is the, uh, that, that is somewhat the, the challenge. So uh, you, it is pretty clear in the data that, that MENA should have been doing better. Look at Sub-Saharan Africa. The, the amount of participation isn't uh, that low, uh, let's say compared to East Asia and the Pacific. It also has been growing, but less than East Asia and the Pacific. Okay, but uh, MENA is, uh, MENA should really be uh, doing better if, if you look at, at, at this data. So let's go just a little bit further and, and dig, into, dig into this. So I will not go, I, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not going to go through, through this in great detail. But uh, one of the reasons, of course, is that trade costs have been high. Now, trade costs, if trade costs are high, uh, what are trade costs? Well, there are many elements into it, but the effect of high trade costs, if trade costs are high, then you're going to trade less. And that's what's related. The famous gravity model that economists use all the time show that high trade costs are associated, not to mention are the main cause of, of uh, low trade. So what, what we see is, Relative to other regions, trade costs have been falling. I'm going to show you this in, in, in the next slide. But it has not been slowing down as rapidly as uh, in other parts of the world, or at least in certain countries. So uh, then the, the other part of the, the presentation, I'll be very quick on that, is to show that services trade has been low, especially in MENA, and that it has concentrated in transport and tourism. It has not been trade in uh, services uh, that, that uh, involve data, which is all what is what service, service vacation is all about. Now, 
in MENA, there has been a relatively high mobile usage, but that high mobile usage is really mostly for just uh, SM SMS and, and other, just uh, other, other parts uh, of the uh, digitalization has not uh, occurred yet. So uh, let's very quickly just, I define words, it's been done many times, but uh, digitization is, going, is ongoing. So analog representations of data are being digitized and digitalization, which is almost the same word, but not quite the same, uh, has been confusing me initially, so that's why I'm pulling out the slide. It's applying digital technologies to existing business processes. Now, to get there, of course, you have to digitize, and maybe to digitize, you need to have the hardware, submarine cables, of course, and other uh, access, but then also you need to know how to use it, right? And th that is uh, the process of digital transformation. And there's a hard and soft aspect to it, which I'll go in very quickly. And servification is this increasing intensity of the share of services in GDP. As I said earlier, it's been higher. It's been growing faster than GDP everywhere in the world. Although relative to other regions, it has not grown as fast as others. So here you have the number. Services percent of GDP in Arab states has gone up by five percentage points, which is uh, not negligible, but it's been less than in other countries. In middle income uh, countries, of which most uh, many countries belong, it's been uh, seven, half of what has been in other middle income countries. I will say the other middle income countries is of course the superstars in East Asia, but there are other countries as well. Uh, not notably Latin America and so on. So there, there's been a lag, it's very clear in the data and the issue is, 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 is why. So this, I, I'm going to skip this uh, slide pretty much, but what you see is trade costs relative to the trade costs of the 20 partners in the world that have the lowest bilateral trade costs. What am I saying here? Well, what matters in trade, as you know, is really almost all the time is how are you doing relative to others, what we call comparative advantage. So, you know, if, if your trade costs are falling faster than others, then you're catching up. But if everyone's trade costs are falling and yours are not falling as fast, you're losing ground, right? So what you have here is some type of, of let's say, a very summary, which are averages across the region, which show that in MENA, and in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the trade costs have been falling and they've been catching up a little bit. You see that they're, they're lagging, let's say MENA, they were lagging, they were 182% higher than the bilateral trade costs of the 20 countries with the lowest. So there you're 182% above, you go down to 144. You're doing a little bit better, but you're still lagging hugely. And, and that is a problem. And then the GCC group has been doing somewhat better. But even so, controlling for all these geographic factors, trade costs are, are very high. Now, what is that reflected in? Well, when you look at the data, is what you find, especially in uh, MENA, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, is very low backward GVC participation. Now, GVC participation, is when you have much more trade in intermediate goods than in final goods. This is what's been going on around the world for the last 40 years. But, okay, you could be participating in backward or forward. Now, the forward is what uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa, but also men have been uh, participating in. And you'll see the, the, the figures in the table in a minute. But the, the, the simple observation is whatever they export, whatever value added that is exported by these countries is going into further processing before reaching the consumer. Okay, so forward, forward GVC participation, is whatever you export is only intermediate exports that are going to be processed further before they, they reach the, the, the consumer. Now the backward participation, which is very important or being judged to be very important for productivity growth, is the amount of imports 
that are embodied in your export. So high backward participation means that you have uh, a lot of imports that are uh, embodied in your exports. And that is good in general because a lot of studies have shown that you uh, import, if not innovation and productivity growth, imports embody that, and, and that's what you want. So let's, let's look at the data here. Well, you see that you go from 1995 to 2015, because the data in 1990 was not that good. So there we just looked at 95 to 2015. And you look at the world average, and you see in the yellow that men are in sub-Saharan Africa, they're much lower in backward. They're about half of what it is, half of the world average. And sub-Saharan Africa also, they are low, low on backward participation. Now forward participation, they are high. Of course, the total is the sum of the two, but if you look at the structure, which is what's important, you see that they are above the average on, on forward, which is what I was mentioning earlier. And you have some figures here. Uh, this was the paper we did for ERF. And on ERF, we just looked mostly at uh, the uh, countries in yellow. Those are in MENA, but we also compare with some in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay? So the, there is a relatively low content of imports in exports. If you have a low content, it means you have low backward uh, participation. So that is clearly, it's all relative, of course, and we is, I'm, we're not saying that anything really new, but you know, we're giving some numbers and a little bit more concreteness in that statement that's been often made. Now, we're not the only ones who have done that. The World Bank had, had a report on it as well. There are more, far more studies that can go in, into the details of it. But this is a part of the broad picture. <clears throat> so now we get into this digitalization. Now, the digitalization, I had the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Took me took us quite a while to try and see all the elements here because it's a bit confusing. So uh, on the left-hand side is what goes into it, the digitalization. And on the right-hand side is uh, the outcome of it. And the outcome of it is, in, in general, what is important is that you have a lot of data cross uh, cross border uh, development of data. Now that is the development of data, cross border development of data is very often, as I said earlier, cannot be measured. So because it's embodied in the goods, but I mean that's the outcome. So on the, on the left hand side, the national data infrastructure, we have a lot of uh, information now, which shows the hard infrastructure, which is ICT. There's information on submarine cables. The countries are getting access to it. The internet exchange points, the collocation data centers, and all that reflected also in the network readiness indicators, which some call national data uh, ecosystem. So on the ICT, MENA is doing pretty well. Sub-Saharan Africa, they still have a ways to go. Now, the soft part of this is uh, the Digitech. And the Digitech is uh, one of the re... Of course, everyone's going to get ICT. It's coming down pretty fast, the hardware. Although there, there are huge challenges in the very low densification, population density, in some sub-Saharan African countries, and that's discussed in the paper, and you, you should neglect that. But the Digitech part is, what is going to happen? 3D printing, machine, artificial intelligence, all this, you know, it could mean that we will be, uh, my colleague Richard Baldwin at, at Geneva has been uh, mentioning this for a while. And let's suppose now that you have, that uh, you have very little labor embodied in, in trade, basically. And what is trade going to be? What well, is going to be trade that you're not going to see because a lot of the trade, you'll still have trade in commodities, but a lot of the trade that you're going to see will be, you can't say virtual trade, but trade that doesn't uh, cross the borders. And that we just don't know yet uh, what will happen. Will computer-aided design 
lead to reshoring. Well, if it leads to reshoring, it means then that in, in high income countries, you're going to be producing at home what, you were, what was being produced uh, in part in other countries. If you have additive manufacturing, on the other hand, like 3D printing, I mean, economies of scale will be much less important. And that could really be very positive uh, for, uh, it could be very positive for uh, uh, manufacturing, developing manufacturing sectors, in particular in, in Africa, where the size of the market is small. Okay, so there are all these, there are all these activities on the Digitech side. We just don't know what's going to happen yet. But I mean, there, there, are, there are several papers that have been written, mostly from the standpoint of high income countries, where we're talking about the substitution of labor with automation. So that could be a huge challenge for, for Sub-Saharan Africa, but it could also be good because there'll be a reinstatement of labor. Reinstatement of labor is what has happened in the past uh, innovation in the, in the industrial, uh, in the industrialization where you know, you had a lot of jobs destroyed, but you had new jobs that were created. In fact, the reinstatement of labor effects with new jobs was more in, 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 in important. However, the general feeling is that manufacturing-led development will be harder and services-led development will be easier. easier. So if you, if you look at this picture, that's some of what is discussed in much more detail uh, in, in the paper. I'm not going to go through that uh, because I don't have the time, but I just want to tell you that this this is what what I do. So I'll go quickly now because I've been now speaking for or, or already almost fifteen minutes. So let me get go very quickly through this. So so these are the challenges. Okay, automation mean manufacturing led development uh, harder, and globalization means that service led development will be easier. So the question is how much. You know, how, how can you uh, try and see what uh, what might might uh, uh, affect the level of digitalization and, and, and it's discussed here. So very quickly, if you look at uh, the, the mobile usage and you see the mobile usage in the rest of the world has been uh, uh, has been growing very rapidly, but uh, the gap between uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and MENA and the rest of the world has not, re not, be, not reduced in the last 15 years, whereas MENA uh, has caught up, right, very clearly. And this is for all, but even, and especially so for mobile, okay? So you see, you see that uh, on, on the hardware side, MENA has done well. But then when you look at uh, use data consumption, data consumption is very high in MENA, but of course the data consumption is not the data processing and other activities. And of course in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's extremely low. So how can you, why, why is it so low? Well, you know, it's uh, one way you can go about it is use this uh, network network readiness index scores and here we have it uh, here we have all the points for MENA and, and uh, sub-Saharan Africa and you see that they are you know sometimes they're below but uh, especially for sub-Saharan Africa they're below what might even be expected for the income per capita and in MENA not so much uh, but in some cases they're also below very few that are above but if you just do the big the big picture, yeah, you see in MENA, you know, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, way below, this, this is the box plots. And the, uh, the median is in the middle, and that's the interquartile range. You see that Sub-Saharan Africa, very low. Uh, MENA, lower, they are higher than Sub-Saharan Africa, but lower than the average, than the other. Now, the other has everything, so it's not very... Uh, granular, but it's good enough. Okay, and here I have uh, more details on this, and I and I don't want to go through it. But if if uh, you are interested, you can take a look. You can really take a look and and see uh, what what are some of the digital trade potential for 
Africa and for uh, MENA, uh, there, there is a lot, quite a bit of granular detail that we might go through. But, but what you see here, among others, is that in, is in uh, MENA, you see that you look at the GDP per capita and the uh, and you see that they are below the average in terms of uh, education and training levels. So for the income per capita, they are they are below what what uh, might be expected. Now, going very quickly, then what has this reflected? Look, you can see that if you have Good data. What is good data? Well, good, good, uh, good data. He has good data centers so that you can uh, be connected, uh, and uh, that means that you can be uh, exporting information services. Now, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in MENA, it's really transport and tourism part of services, and of course, information services have not have not uh, developed. And we see that there's a very close link between information, exports of information services and access to data centers. Now let's look at it in a little bit more detail. It's this digital preparedness ladder. That we have 65 low and middle income countries. We are most MENA and most Sub-Saharan Africa countries. And let's see where they are. What you have on the top, I don't know how you, if you can read it, but what you do have is the average cost, the cost of uh, internet communication uh, in countries that are in these broad uh, categories. And you see that as you go up the ladder, the average price of broadband is lower. And that means because you are more developed, okay? And then in the next slide, you'll see here the digital prep into clusters. And the clusters here are those that uh, correspond to the preparedness for digital uh, data connections. And here you go from down the clusters and uh, to the right, you're more, you're more developed. Now, very interesting, you look at Djibouti. Now Djibouti here is a country that has very, they are connected, all the cables go by there, right? But the cost is extremely high, right? Because uh, they, they, it turns out that they have a very, uh, very poor uh, infrastructure, not physical, but policy, meaning by that they have very high, uh, very extreme regulation monopolies. And when you have a, the monopoly, then the, the, the cost, all the cables are there, but the cost of the, the digital cost are, are the highest in the region. Uh, Kenya is doing very well. Uh, and they, they, are, they have uh, good access and uh, the, the cost is, is, is not too high because their policies are, are pretty good. And here, for, for West African countries, not only, but some of them. If you look at the, uh, the average, uh, the average uh, rate of uh, taxation of uh, gold in exporters, that is the mining sector in gold exporting countries is 48%, but it's 68% for mobile communication. So, you're taxing more heavily mobile. The mobile say, well, why? Well, because uh, it's pretty, it's relatively easy because they, the, the government controls the hardware, the cables. So they can, you can tax, you tax where you can, but the, the, the result is, is a big handicap. So this is really some of the, the discussions we have in the paper. And uh, I just finished, uh, I, I could have put that right at the beginning but I put it at the end. If you look at the productivity growth, look at the productivity growth. These are compound annual growth rates by region, okay, over the period 1995 to 2008. So this is the productivity growth 
in manufacturing and services. And you see that in MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa, they're very, very low. Okay, so there's really a very, uh, there's an extremely high, uh, there's a very high uh, gap to close. So final thoughts, uh, there are recommendations that I invite you to read, which are in the annexes, because I'm running out of time of what, what should be done. There's a nice paper, I think it was done, I don't know for whom, by, I think it was for Unted, by um, Sharok and Mustafa on, uh, it's here. These are the uh, challenges and uh, the bottlenecks, which you might take a look at and the detail. So thank you very much, I've taken too long. I hope this little introduction has, has been helpful. Thank you again. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you started with a good advantage. Uh, we lost some of our guests, so we, we had uh, all our attention focused on you. Uh, the discussant, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, is with us, <coughs> Prof. Uh, Sarmonai. Yes. So, um, well, I mean, we cannot have open time for you. Sorry? We cannot have uh, an open uh, time for you. you are, okay. Uh, I'm sure you'll give us 50, uh, yeah, uh, 10 minutes, yeah. 10 minutes, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you, Prof. DeMello, for your excellent paper and presentation, which I read with great interest, very rich uh, in detail. Um, my uh, observations will be of three kinds, conceptual, uh, methodological, and the implications for policy. Uh, but maybe I can just start with uh, about three days ago, uh, Microsoft Africa announced uh, a new um, managing director for the uh, Microsoft Africa Transformation Office. And in the announcement, his name is uh, Mr. Kunle Awosika. And in his uh, acceptance uh, and comments, he said, well, I'm, I'm passionate about the incredible potential Africa has to become a truly connected continent that exports digital goods and services to the rest of the world. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meaningfully impact this growth and help unlock the continent's full digital potential. So Microsoft Africa is thinking exactly along the lines that you're thinking in relation to MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so that being said, I noticed that, um, so I'm now moving to the conceptual issues and I might just declare my area of specialization is science, technology and innovation policy. So I read the paper somewhat with, with that lens in mind. Uh, and so my first observation is that there's a distinction sort of between the role of digitalization in MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the concern is primarily employment and the loss of employment uh, due to digitalization led by Chinese uh, firms or driven by Chinese firms. And on the MENA side, it's rather the opportunity for a uh, service led in the services led industrialization and i guess my query initially was and i never found it in the remainder of the paper isn't uh employment loss due to digitalization a challenge in mena as well so in other words it would be a challenge in both sub-saharan africa and mena and shouldn't services uh, driven industrialization also be an aspiration in sub-Saharan Africa as it is in MENA. Yes, there might be degrees in emphasis, but it seemed to me that those two dimensions of the, of the challenges of digitalization would apply to both MENA and sub-Saharan Africa. So perhaps you could assist me in clarifying that. Uh, but moving on to the conceptual issues, uh, the, of course, technology, digital technologies are at the center of this idea of digitalization. And so we could think of technologies as uh, endogenously driven or exogenously driven. Uh, your paper by and large was, we don't have the technologies in Africa and MENA, so we're essentially going to adopt these technologies developed elsewhere. Uh, but that does not preclude some degree of endogenous technological innovation. And as we saw in, um, in the 2018 Nobel Prize awarded to Paul Romer, 
and William Nordhaus, uh, endogenous, about endogenous growth theory, the intentional investment in technological innovation capabilities or technological knowledge, scientific knowledge by domestic firms is the most significant determinant of long-term economic growth. So it seems to me that in the, this dis discourse on digitalization, that uh, the efforts by domestic firms would, would, would uh, be significant. And uh, you mention it uh, uh, tangentially, uh, but I think one of the implications is that perhaps we can raise that level. So conceptually, the emphasis on exogenous technological development uh, versus endogenous technological development uh, is something that we need to pay attention to. Secondly, on conceptual issues, you do a very good job of uh, distinguishing between digitization, which is essentially conversion of analog documents to digital documents, digitalization, the application of digital technologies to business, uh, but I was looking for digital innovation uh, because that would be needed to respond to existing challenges and new challenges. That's related to digitalization, and I would suggest that that is looking for novel, assuming the technologies are exogenous, it would imply looking for uh, novel business models that are more responsive to uh, local challenges. And the third level, which I think may be useful to consider, is digital transformation for structural transformation. And what do I mean by uh, digital transformation? We may understand this as the application of digital innovation such that it generates or drives a significant uh, of fundamental or structural change in organizations and in society. So digitally transformed firms would be at the center of this uh, digitalization and structural transformation agenda. And I think that may be the missing link, which I'll discuss a little bit more in the methodological discussion. I need to move quickly, I know. Uh, so uh, so um, one more conceptual, one, or, one more conceptual query is the issue of comparative advantage uh, in trade needing to be boosted and maybe moving that a little bit to, and, and their gains, their loss of gains, as you pointed out, to moving that thinking a little bit to competitive advantage in technological specialization. Uh, in other words, what are the low hanging fruits on the technology side that can enable MENA and Sub-Saharan African countries uh, to apply these technologies in a more cost-effective and more rapid manner. Um, so these are just uh, conceptual uh, queries that I have for you. Uh, on the methodological side, I think that was very strong, uh, very thoughtful metrics, measures, uh, indices for thinking about uh, digitalization. Um, the natural, national, the network readiness index, all of that was really uh, very rich and interesting to me. You do have a distinction between inputs, in, in a very nice graph you showed, inputs uh, and outcomes, inputs being Digitech on the sort of hard side, although it has a soft side too, and ICT uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then you have on the outcome side, specific, uh, servicification, servitization, structural transformation, offshoring, and so on. And at the center, you have this digitalization. I would suggest that if we're elevating the role of domestic firms, and we're going to hear from Safaricom, a leading firm in that regard, uh, maybe the digitally transformed firms can feature more strongly in that, in that metric, in that schematic. And the outcomes I thought of as really being outputs of a digitalization strategy, the outcomes reflected in the theme of this seminar would relate to growth, poverty reduction, inequality reduction, gender inclusion, uh, absorption of youth employment. And so those implications, uh, of course, not everything can be said in one paper, but I, I'm just trying to connect the dot to, even if we got these outcomes, what would the outputs, uh, what, if we got these outputs, what I call outputs, what you call outcomes, what would be the broader societal outcomes be and how are those connected? Uh, so maybe I'll just close now with some of the implications of this very, the explicitness of the study uh, and the depth of the data uh, presented just uh, 
inspires many future works along these lines. But perhaps I can just conclude by, by thinking about um, the role of technology innovation capabilities in driving digital transformation towards structural transformation in Africa. One is the low hanging fruit. Given existing technologies that are already on the market, how can we improve the policy landscape? How can we improve the, the uh, institutional readiness, lower the barriers in the form of excessive taxation and so on, to more rapidly adopt uh, digital technologies, digitalization for the purpose of uh, achieving some of these outcomes, developmental outcomes that have been outlined. So that would be low hanging fruit, but that would still not enable us to cap, catch up with let's say uh, Southeast and East Asian countries uh, and, 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 and even more advanced uh, regions of the world. So that implies that secondary and original innovation in the form of more, um, a more knowledge intensive intervention into uh, the digital technologies is needed. That requires human capital uh, and development and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Uh, I, you know, I've my remarks, as I said, of a conceptual nature, methodological nature, and implications for policy. And I'm happy to share my remarks with you in written form. And I'm happy to engage with the uh, with the uh, with the participants of this forum. Thank you very much. No, I think this is this is wonderful comment. Um, uh, I believe these guys deserve uh, some applause from the room and everyone else. Uh, um, as we listen uh, uh, both to the presentation and also the uh, discussant's uh, intervention, actually it took me back, you know, when we started this project. But then uh, a bit of also what was happening, uh, some of you, if you might remember, um, the uh, disruptiveness of this emerging technology, they call it the fourth industrial revolution. Some call it um, the advent of artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, and also uh, internet of things. You know, the, the world in which uh, uh, this uh, uh, technology is advancing uh, there was actually a report by the McKinsey which tried to show the uh, percentage of jobs that could be lost because of these emerging technologies in Africa um, by taking the cue that uh, as China progressed uh, and wages start to increase, there was this belief about 18 million jobs could come to Africa. I think that was around mid to mid to mid to, I mean 2015. Something that was a big talk. 18 million jobs would come to Africa. So this is the moment to seize uh, and prepare uh, for the continent uh, in terms of light manufacturing uh, and also up, you know, using this uh, industrial. Uh, Industri industrial parks, more or less the same uh, approach of that of China. But then, you know, these disruptive technologies are creating the conditions for uh, even China to become more competitive than it was before because they continue to apply robots in, uh, in the factory floors, replacing uh, digital technology in many of the uh, uh, light manufacturing uh, so they kept on the competition uh, and productivity growing. So for Africa, what is really important now is not to wait uh, for things to shift from Asia to Africa, but rather to catch up uh, and also upgrade our uh, adoption of technology. So I think the point you have raised is more or less towards this. How could we uh, then uh, drive uh, this exogenous shock? to the best advantage of Africa. Um, Jem, do you want to say uh, anything to the reflections by our discussant? Uh, or have you already left? 
Do you... No, no, I'm still... <laughs> You're here. I'm still here, but I'm still far away, but I'm still here. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. I want to thank you for these very, very perceptive comments. Right, spot on, you're quite right. What what the real world is, this distinction between men and sub-Saharan Africa, I tried to put a distinction where there really isn't one. So I tried to decide, well, just to provoke a little bit, I will say, well, there may be slightly different uh, slightly different uh, challenges in the two regions. But of course, there's so much diversity that I think you were quite right to say, well, you know, the, the employment uh, challenge would apply to both. I fully agree. And I, I also think what, something that I should have emphasized a little bit more is that this uh, digitalization is going to be quite uh, a bonus for small firms because small firms now economies of scale will be much less important. Small firms will be able to develop much more rapidly uh, than they could have uh, before because uh, market size will not be as important. And that will be very important in, in uh, countries. You can talk about the African continental free trade area. I'm sorry to say it's not just a lot of talk and talk because it's very important to have it. But, you know, we'll still have a lot of trade costs and natural barriers to trade. So what you may not have and you should not have is uh, uh, data and digital connectedness. And there, there is some data which uh, shows that the share of small firms in exports has been increasing more rapidly in countries that have had better access, uh, better digital access. There is some, some data uh, that shows that indeed this has been very helpful for small firms, which is an important point that you made. So this digital transformation, as you say in your comments, is going to be helpful for innovation. So I fully agree to that. So uh, the only difficulty, of course, is this is happening and we don't have enough uh, data to see what the difference is yet. And, and that's... Uh, that's uh, all I, I could I, I would add. Very good comments. Thank you very much. Um, we have still three papers uh, ahead of us before breaking for lunch. Um, so may us, I suggest a ten minutes break, or we want to take one more paper and we break. Uh, how is it? The group here. In, uh, in the in-person. Uh, still energetic to follow through another paper. Yeah? Okay. If the ladies say yes, <laughs> that's a wonderful signal for me. Uh, okay, so we, let's just go, um, perhaps if there is anyone also to comment on James' paper, uh, I can allow a few minutes uh, from uh, uh, here in the room, as well as those of us uh, attending in uh, virtually, you you can comment on James' paper. Uh, if not, then uh, let me just invite uh, our colleagues from MENA, uh, Professor Isaac Atias. Uh, okay, I think I, I may also want to say a few things. Uh, these first two papers, we call them framework papers. Um, th these are designed to uh, provide more uh, methodological also uh, approach to the country case studies. Um, so Jem and uh, Isaac mm -hmm. have been working on this. Uh, so that's why it's a bit more um, cross country covering sub Saharan Africa or MENA or BOS. Um, so, my apologies for that. So, um, is it Isaac or Mark who is presenting? It will be Isaac. Yes, yes, Isaac. Uh, uh, you are most, uh, most welcome. Yes. Yeah, good to uh, hear from you. Yeah. Where Mark lives, it's uh, four o'clock in the morning now, so I will make the presentation. Oh my gosh. Um, 
you you can hear me, no? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is a joint paper with uh, uh, Mark Dutz from the World Bank. I'm uh, uh, retired actually from Sabanji University. I live in uh, Portugal at the moment. Uh, this is um, a comparative analysis of the one dimension of uh, digitization which is of uh, mobile internet uptake and use across countries in MENA and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, do I share my screen or how do we do this? I, I presume I can share my screen, no? Um, let's see. Just one second. I'm sorry, I'm having uh, Uh, if you need assistance, we can help from this side. Yeah, we can see the presentation. Uh, yes, Isaac, uh, it's projected nicely. It, yeah, yeah, go it, ahead. It, is it okay now? Yes, it's okay. Oh, okay, thank you. So it's okay now. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I can enlarge this. And uh, I, I'm, I am assuming it's still okay. Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, it's, it's, Yes, uh, okay, it's, okay, good, okay, okay. Sorry about this uh, delay here. Okay, so the motivation of the paper is uh, uh, we examine drivers and correlates of adoption and use of mob mobile internet. Uh, we focus on mobile internet, uh, or actually it's uh, unique subscriptions of mobile internet. Uh, because uh, this is GSMA data, which is available across many, many countries and for a sufficiently long period of time. And uh, we use it, or we also like it because, uh, especially in many countries in, uh, that we're focusing on, a lot of users use more than one SIM card. So there's a non-uniqueness and the GSMA data takes care of that. It, it measures number of unique subscriptions. So this is the measure that we use. And mobile internet here is treated as a key access technology, enabling many of the benefits of digitization. Uh, that's why we focus on uh, unique mobile internet. Um, we present in the paper, I'm not going to get into it here, a survey of main findings regarding the benefits of digitization in low-income countries. There's a lot of evidence now. Some of it is causal, summarized in the paper. Some of it is still in the form of correlates, correlations or uh, controlled correlations, uh, but still uh, suggestive. And at the end, the evidence suggests that there is indeed a benefit in terms of jobs or higher income or welfare in terms of increased consumption and reduced poverty of digitization. So we take that as given, as a background in the paper. And uh, uh, since uh, there is increasing evidence of benefits of digitization, we look at adoption and use. Um, we focus on three regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is 48 countries. We, uh, North Africa, which is Djibouti, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, and non-rich Middle East countries, which are listed here. Uh, uh, this is a cross-country study, uh, and uh, uh, we have to warn that there is missing data for a lot of variables, and uh, 
whatever statistical analysis that has been carried out in the paper was carried out on the largest possible data sets for each of the uh, variables, each of the correlates of adoption of unique mobile internet. Um, so what are the main findings? Let me start with main findings for a few slides and then we can get uh, into some of the more details if we still have time. Um, the, the first main finding is what we call an uptake gap. What do we mean by that? So while there remains a significant gap in the coverage of 4G networks relative to the frontier, this is especially true for countries in the sub-Saharan Africa, even though there's a large variance, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, still, uh, 3G is much more available in terms of infrastructure. And we find that a significant part of the population do not, have not adopted mobile internet in all three regions, but especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, even though it is available. We take, we call this the uptake gap. So at least in the long run, the uptake, uptake gap seems to be more critical than what we call coverage. In other words, availability of the infrastructure. Data that I will try to summarize later shows us that in many countries, there is coverage of especially 3G, which is internet enabling, but uptake or adoption is less or quite le much less than coverage. Number two, low incomes. The level of income explains a large portion of the variation of unique mobile internet uptake across countries. In fact, when you do a simple regression of, over the last 10 years and by the dependent variable you use unique mobile internet uptake as the independent variable one uses GDP per capita by itself squared and cubed, that regression itself explains roughly 70% of variation of time uptake across countries. So income is crucial. It's a very important correlate of mobile internet uptake. So low incomes and poverty is a major affordability barrier that prevents rapid uptake of mobile internet. Then we look at demand and supply correlates of uptake. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time looking at different drivers that have been shown to be important in other studies. And we look at how these countries fare in terms of these drivers. On the demand side, affordability and capabilities are crucial. By affordability, we mean both low incomes and relatively high prices. It turns out that uh, prices in these uh, countries are high in absolute levels, but significantly high relative to incomes. As you will see, uh, 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 ITU has a, a variable the price relative to uh, gross national GNI, uh, and uh, th that uh, is very high in especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Se second, lack of affordable electricity, especially in the SSA, is very important, and low levels of capabilities or skills are critical barriers. Um, attractiveness or lack of willingness to use of internet and related digital services is also a barrier, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, based especially on the subjective response of many non-users, indicating that they either don't know what internet is, this is a little bit old data now, it's 2018, RIA data, so uh, it, things may have changed since then, and we're going to have uh, a new uh, 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 set of RIA data coming soon, uh, hopefully this year. So we will see whether these, some of these findings have changed now. But there is, based on microdata, uh, either they don't know what internet is, or don't, they don't know how to use it, or they don't find it useful. There is also evidence of significant network effects, which means that a person is more likely to adopt, to adopt uh, mobile internet if friends have already adopted. On the supply side, low levels of competition are a major barrier to uptake. Um, 
And this, in our study, is captured by both high levels of concentration, which we measure by the Hirschman Hirschfeldine index, and high levels of mobile termination rates, which is a key indicator of regulatory stance, as we explain in detail in the paper. Um, so, and we have also find some evidence that a tough competitive environment also seems to play a role. Uh, what do we mean by that? Especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, the countries seem to suffer from a high level of incidence of exits of mobile network operators relative to other regions. Uh, uh, so that uh, so many many network operators leave business more frequently in sub-Saharan African countries relative to other countries. Um, just this is not in the paper, but we think it's a nice summary of some of these key drivers. So we have here capabilities, prices regulatory stands and electricity. And on each of those, uh, North Africa, non-rich Middle Eastern countries, but especially Sub-Saharan Africa uh, are lacking behind other, other regions. For example, learning adjusted years of schooling. This is from the World Bank Human Capital Index. That's only five years in Sub-Saharan Africa, 7.8 years in Latin America, for example. Uh, higher also in North Africa and non-rich Middle Eastern countries. Prices, uh, as percent of GNI, it's really high in Sub-Saharan Africa, very high. Um, uh, high also uh, relative in, in USD terms, but much higher than uh, in terms of percent of G GNI. Uh, regulatory index, ITU has an index of overall ICT regulation. According to that index, Sub-Saharan Africa does not look very bad, actually. But as we explain in the paper, that index captures de jure regulation. In other words, whether the laws and regulations exist or not. Uh, and we know from studies of the regulation that de jure does not always reflect what's actually happening in the field, de facto. Uh, we take a measure... Uh, mobile termination rates as a measure of de facto regulatory stance. And that is still quite high in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's also very high in East Asia. East Asia is doing very well with respect to most of the other uh, 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 indicators, but it's not doing very well with respect to mobile uh, termination rates. And finally, electricity. A lot of micro studies see that especially in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, access to electricity is a key driver of mobile internet. And we can see why uh, uh, access to electricity overall, this is WDI data, is just below 50% in sub-Saharan Africa. This is just average across countries, whereas it's well over 90% in most of the regions. So electricity is a, seems to be a key barrier. This is a complementary asset. It's a key barrier to adoption. Um, policy actions. We find, we conclude that the critical role of the demand side factors strongly suggest that increasing the degree of competition in digital markets, while important, will not by itself be sufficient to generate widespread adoption of mobile internet and attended digital services especially greater productive use with associated jobs, uh, increase and, uh, 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 jobs increase and poverty reduction benefits. We, we stress that policy actions will be needed on multiple fronts, including public and private investments in general education and business relevant skills, including digital skills, and in complementary infrastructure especially in electricity, wherever access is lacking, in addition to supply side pro-competition policies. And maybe not, uh, uh, we do emphasize this in the, in the paper, but uh, uh, maybe we should have emphasized more. Policy actions will also be needed to support entrepreneurs to design skills appropriate digital applications that can be productively used by households and firms that lack the necessary skills to use existing applications. So there's a skills gap. 
And that can be closed in two ways. You can increase skills or you can generate applications which are more accommodating of the existing level of skills. And we suggest that both should be done. Um, uh, a few, uh, uh, let me see. yeah, a, a few uh, of the of the papers uh, of, of the data. Uh, as we can see, there's there has been quite an increase in three G networks in the last few years in sub-Saharan Africa, but four uh, G networks is still uh, lagging behind. This is in the paper. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, uptake is seriously lagging coverage both in three G and in four G. And what we call uh, unique mobile internet uptake is below 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa and about 38% in, in non-rich Middle East countries and 44% in North Africa. Uh, and this is the uptake gap. Uh, this is the uptake gap, as, which we define as one minus the ratio of unique mobile internet subscriptions to 3D, 3G plus coverage. And as you can see, it's very high in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it has actually increased in 2020. It's, it's close to 70%. Um, that's what we call the update gap. Uh, but we also show uh, that within region variation of update is very high. And as you can see in this, in this graph, the green is uh, North African countries, red is uh, non-rich Middle Eastern countries and blue is Sub-Saharan Africa. So there is a huge variation. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, uh, mobile internet is close to fifty percent in Mauritius and below ten percent in Eritrea or just above ten percent in Central Africa Republic and Somalia. So variation is very large, and policy, of course, should focus on this high variation as well. Uh, this is the. Uh, the regression we ran just to show that, okay, this uh, table shows two things. One, if you can see, uh, this is the, uh, the dependent variable on the fourth column is mobile internet uptake. And uh, we put in some uh, dummies for regions. And, uh, and we also include uh, GDP per capita squared and uh, cubed. As you can see, R squared is 71%, explaining a large part of the variation. And Sub-Saharan Africa is, co the coefficient for that dummy variable is negative and significant, saying that Sub-Saharan Africa is, is uh, lagging even after you control for low incomes. So it's not just low incomes. Low incomes are important, but there is more going on, as we have tried to explain in terms of the key drivers. Uh, uh, how, how am I doing? Uh, uh, do, do I have five more minutes? Hello? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but let me skip that graph. So, conclusion uh, the, the, for the paper emphasizes the importance of policies to address the challenges of low uptake with uptake essential for greater productive use and associated jobs increases and poverty reduction benefits. It provides a framework highlighting the importance for uptake of both demand side factors, affordability, capabilities, and attractiveness factors, and supply side, which is uh, policy and regulatory factors affecting the degree of market competition. While we do conclude, to just to repeat myself, that while there are competition issues, uh, low incomes seem to be a key, a key barrier. Uh, also, uh, uh, anticipating papers that are going to be presented later in the day, the paper raises further uh, questions that require further uh, country-level research to support design of policies to support greater uptake, including their effects on jobs and poverty, for example, to better understand the large degree of heterogeneity across countries and sub-regions within countries, across industries, and across digital technologies beyond internet that differentially affect relative importance of different factors influencing uptake. Um, at the industry level, across heterogeneity, across agriculture, manufacturing, and services, and also uh, in terms of technology, those affecting 
general business functions and those affecting sector specific, specific business functions, such as in agriculture, irrigation, harvesting, and packaging for crop-based agriculture. Let me stop here and thank you for listening. Uh, very, very interesting results. So uh, we have Dr. Miriam, uh, Executive Director of the Africa Policy Institute, uh, to discuss this paper. The floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. And I would like to thank the authors for the very good uh, presentation because you're talking about digitalization in MENA and then sub-Saharan African countries. What I find very interesting, and I just picked it out, is that it is a very wide scope with a lot of layered issues. And I like that uh, one of the things that has been said is that uh, there's a lot going on in the, in the area of digital the technologies and uh, when we are looking at mobile internet uptake. And uh, because the way the paper has been organized and the findings, I will go with the findings and also bring out a bit of issues about data and conceptualizations. I'll give a full uh, writing of some of the comments. I think it's a very good starting point of what we can look at and even going to the recommendations where we need to now look at uh, issues of heterogeneity across countries and sub-regions and I'm particularly focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. So if I look at uh, the issues of uh, low uptake gaps and uh, having discussed about the supply side issues, one of the reasons why you find there are also low uptake gaps, look at our value chains and how they are developed. If we go to agriculture and even go by subsectors, then cost of doing business, where are the businesses going to or the business owners going to try to adopt these technologies when they're still trying to survive at that low level. So the issue of income really comes out very clearly. And then, okay. all right. So I like the way it's been said there are very many layered issues that are taking place. Secondly, Competition also in the market, and uh, there was a comment about network operators living faster. That is very true, and we look at competition, but again, it is very important that we disaggregate this data by countries, which is a good recommendation that has been given, because when we talk about uh, competition, what are the policies in place? How do we define competition in the mobile internet? market. That is very important. And even as we've talked about mobile internet, there's also the question of internet first. But before we go to internet, let's talk about the mobile telephony, the use. What type of phones are we using? Because in Kenya right now, you can actually use mobile technology without even using smartphones, the SSD phones. Are we able to differentiate this kind of usage in this uh, report? I know uh, it's already advanced, but these are questions that can be brought later. Availability of 4G, 3G, 2G, and even going downwards to the old uh, technologies. There are countries which are advanced which even have 5G. But how about countries where even 3G is still a problem? Because in Kenya you will have 4G, but when you go to certain West African countries, even 2G is still a problem. And even for us, uh, taking the example of Kenya, how about even in the Asal regions where some people have to go up to certain hills to even get mobile data? So that is just um, still another uh, issue that I'm seeing. The demand side also, we've talked about uh, affordability, capabilities. Uh, most of our activities or most of the African countries are still, majority are in the low income or middle income. But if you look at more, uh, affordability of internet, there are so many considerations that need to be made because it is a very complementary good. It has to go with mobile phones and the type of mobile phones. Let us look at even mobile phone usage and penetration. 
And smartphones, as I already said, is a very good example. Um, I've seen the comment on electricity, and electricity is very important. But I think when you come to sub-Saharan Africa, I would like to talk about off-grid and on-grid energy sources. Because when you talk about electricity, the coverage might be low or weak. But when we talk about off-grid and on-grid, I don't know how this data was aggregated or disaggregated because you've talked of data issues. How about the use of solar energy? Because most of the technologies that are being uh, used now, you find people are using solar energy. So perhaps putting solar energy or a source of uh, solar as a source of uh, power would uh, make a, a difference. Electricity costs are still high. In most African countries, there are monopolies. So, and Kenya, a good example, you only have to use, uh, it's only Kenya power that we have, whether you like it or not, it is the only source of energy, whether efficient and uh, with good costs, that is what we have. But if we bring in renewable sources, I think we can get uh, some better insights. I know data was a big problem, but something that should come out of recommendations, how can we talk about data collection for issues of digital technology, uh, just uh, beyond working with what we have with World Bank, um, because you find the data in as much as you might get households or they are mixed households and farms, I think it's important that we now start differentiating because we are talking farms, so we are talking about businesses. So those are some of the initial comments. Then, well, I don't want to focus on it right now, but uh, conceptualization when you're doing the analysis, because we are assuming that this is a one-step process. You just wake up and use mobile internet. Where do you start? Education matters. Capabilities, you've talked about it. And I've seen the variables that have been used. In this case, you've talked about, uh, I think there is primary, there is secondary. But how about if we even differentiate it to tertiary? And between secondary and tertiary, there are different levels. These are things that uh, we can talk about and even look at very well. Affordability, again, is very important. We are talking about incomes. We know that poverty levels are still high. So how do we talk about affordability and layer it very well also with uh, uh, mobile phone usage, what type of mobile phone that you use, at the same time also with uh, uh, mobile internet usage. So in terms of conceptualization, while the data is very good and uh, I mean uh, the presentation is very good and gives a lot that we can uh, discuss or even follow up in future research, conceptualization should have been a very strong component here that can be used even as we develop more papers. That's, uh, those are my comments for starters. Thank you. No, these are very, very uh, uh, precise, actually, um, comments. And I hope Isaac and his colleague, as they uh, finalize for publication, they take these uh, comments into account. So colleagues, let's uh, really show our appreciation for both Isaac and uh, Dr. Miriam. Uh, um, so before I give to Isaac uh, uh, what he thinks about the comments, anybody here? Who we, we have comments online. Uh, have comments. Okay, so you can, yeah, you can ask them to um, intervene, please. The first question from Virela Alberto, he asks, how to deal both with preference for open source digital tools and uh, eventual interest in protecting African intellectual property rights concerning uh, digital innovation. And um, the second question is, uh, can application of electricity and big data analytics bring an acceleration in digital transformation in sub-Saharan Africa? So those are the two questions. Thank you. I, I think these are uh, quite useful uh, and, and highly uh, related uh, uh, challenges, constraints we have in Africa. Yeah, you want to come in again? 
Uh, yeah, Miriam, okay. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't talk about it. We are talking about uh, digitalization and um, we are doing comparatives. How about the youth, tech startups, and mobile internet use? Because that's a niche that we really need to think about. We are having a new generation who don't work eight to five. They're always on their phones. They're always on the internet. They're always trying to be creatives, very creative. So that could be something we could look at, but data allowing as well. Thank you. No, I think these are very good comments. And uh, uh, I may also add Isaac. I think this, this is interesting because it's close to home and to our everyday life. Uh, in a, in a, a companion project where we call it data governance in Africa, uh, one of, uh, I think, the findings um, uh, and concerns many people have raised is really this continued gap in terms of accessing data as well, uh, information, uh, because of the, as you mentioned, yes, uh, low uptake on internet, but even those who have internet, the bandwidth and many other infrastructures that go along with it uh, prohibits, for instance, uh, application and usage of uh, um, uh, uh, softwares or others that require uh, um, a lot of uh, um, space and uh, other, especially for, for young people who want to, I think Mar Miriam mentioned, uh, startups and others uh, could be a challenge. So it's, uh, it's more or less uh, the constraints are uh, in many dimensions. Um, so during this time, there is um, a comparative advantage being lost also um, when you don't have proper uh, data governance uh, rules in the country. So if you want to comment on that as well, uh, that would be fine. So Isaac, uh, you have a, a bit of uh, some questions. You don't need to answer all of them. Uh, you can thank us, but uh, I give the floor to you. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are, and uh, thank you, Dr. Molo. Uh, these are really wonderful comments. Um, uh, very insightful. Um, I'll try to respond to a few of them. Uh, you have, uh, Dr. Omala, uh, Omala underlined again uh, the importance of heterogeneity, and I cannot agree with you more. You see, uh, see it very clearly in the data, uh, uh, in, in even the aggregate data, and of course aggregate data conceals heterogeneity at the country level, and we know that there is tremendous heterogeneity within countries, across regions, across rural versus urban, uh, from studies that use microdata as well. Uh, this study that we have done has relied mainly on aggregate data uh, to be able to do cross-country analysis and comparison of regions. A lot of the questions, relevant questions, cannot be answered with, with data at this level of aggreg aggregation. For example, different sources of en uh, energy. This is extremely important, on-grid versus off-grid. The data that we use for electricity comes from the world development indicators of the World Bank. And it's a valid question. How is, uh, how is it exactly measured? Does it capture all sorts of electricity that can be available through off-grid sources? And I really don't know the answer to that. Fortunately, uh, there is increased availability over time of microdata. Uh, and here I would like to mention especially data that has been provided by, by a series of um, surveys carried out by uh, research I, ICT Africa, RIA, that we have used and that some of the papers that are going to be presented uh, later have used extensively. And that kind of data, it's very difficult to do cross-country comparisons 
but it's very rich. It has very rich information within countries. For example, you have mentioned age, and it's very difficult to capture the importance of age, the role of young people, just by looking at aggregate data. But when you use, <coughs> excuse me, when you use micro data, you see that being young matters tremendously in terms of mobile internet uptake. Young people adopt mobile internet much more frequently relative to older people, even after controlling for education. Even controlling for education, age seems to matter. So very important variable. I completely agree. Uh, and uh, uh, that kind of data also helps. Uh, uh, you have, sorry, let, uh, let me back, uh, backtrack for a moment. You've mentioned the importance of different types of handsets. Extremely important, extremely important because we know that this is a very important cost factors and also uh, uh, that there are new technologies, cheaper stuff coming out, and this is changing very frequently. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, new coming uh, micro level data will provide some information on handsets as well, but it's, it's a key variable that unfortunately we cannot control uh, just by looking at uh, aggregate data. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, uh, maybe one explanation of uptake gaps, this is how I understand what you said, one explanation of uptake gaps could be obtained when we look at uh, value chains um, and things like cost of doing business. I completely agree. I completely agree. And uh, uh, how do we expect businesses to adopt mobile internet when they are still trying to survive? And there, I think uh, the, the emphasis that we want to put on skills appropriate skills appropriate applications, for example, for agriculture. I think we're going to hear more about this later today. Uh, seems to be important. Um, a lot of the available applications are uh, meaningful for certain languages and uh, for people with that have acquired at least a threshold level of skills. And it, it may be possible to go beyond that uh, with, with appropriate environments and policies. Um, big data analytics. I. Uh, 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 whether it can be useful, it's already starting to be useful as far as I can see, especially with applications for that have been developed for uh, for agriculture. <coughs> so uh, it's an important uh, and data management. Obviously, is uh, we haven't really touched upon it uh, in, in our report, but it's clearly a key variable. I completely agree. The forthcoming flagship report from the World Bank on, on uh, technology adoption uh, and uh, the, uh, the recent WDR and uh, has a, a lot to say about uh, the importance of data governance. Let me stop here and thank you again for very insightful comments. Mind, I have one question, uh, maybe a couple of questions from our uh, participants. One is the ambassador at large for the Africa plan in the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so the question is uh, uh, quite interesting. How to deal both with preference for open source digital tools and the eventual interest in protecting African intellectual property rights uh, concerning digital innovation. Um, uh, is it okay? The second uh, question is, uh, yeah, I think you answered this one. It's more like application of electricity and big data analytics. So no need uh, for that one. Maybe you want to address the first one about open source applications and uh, the need to uh, protect innovations by African property rights for African uh, uh, entrepreneurs and innovators. You are muted, Isaac. 
Isaac, you are muted. Okay. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much for reminding me. Um, uh, th this is a very valid question. And my answer would be that uh, there should be a preference for protection of intellectual property with respect to entrepreneurial activities for design of digital applications within Africa. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's like almost as, a, as a, an infant industry argument. I agree with the overall uh, necessity and desirability of open source digital tools, but you're not going to get a lot of entrepreneurial activity within Sub-Saharan Africa in these fields unless you have some level of intellectual property rights. That's uh, how I would like to respond to this. Unless it can be, uh, unless it can be th this issue of returns to these types of activities can be, uh, uh, these uh, can be dealt with through designs uh, with uh, public interventions um, uh, th that could substitute for intellectual property. But unless that's uh, until that's available, uh, I think intellectual property is uh, is important for the support of these types of activities. I don't know if this answers the question. I mean, uh, you gave it. So thank you so much. I, I believe we may have now to take a break. Uh, it's uh, 12 noon here in uh, Nairobi. Uh, elsewhere, of course, uh, in Portugal, maybe you are two hours behind, but still uh, time for coffee. So colleagues, we break uh, just for a short one, half tea, coffee and we'll be back and take the last paper for the morning session. So let's not take too much time, please. Uh, I appreciate so far the participation. Thank you so much. Is there any announcements, Scholar? We have the coffee and tea out there. Uh, for those of us in here. Okay, Scholar, go ahead. Yes, uh, we, for, because of the, for the sake of the online participants, we take 10 minutes. This coffee and some snacks outside. Thank you. Focus on services sector uh, that are vulnerable to disruptive technology. So we give him uh, the floor. He's right here. Okay, so no, you can, you can. Yeah, thanks. And, and use the mic, yeah? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, good. Sure, can I start now? Yes, yes. We're waiting, yeah. Where is that? Where am I going? Is this finished? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. starting now. Uh, good. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. My name is Alamai Yogeda. I came from Addis Ababa University. I'm a mark, pretty much a macroeconomist. Uh, <coughs> I got 15 minutes, so I got about 18 slides. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fast, a little fast. Uh, what it did was basically uh, to see what the impact of uh, disruptive technologies, and in this particular case, uh, disruptive is defined for the, for the Ethiopian case study as digitalization in the financial sector. So that, that was basically the focus. Uh, but before that, I just want to see, you know, what is the general impact of 
uh, digitalization in, in the economy because at the end of the day, even if I'm picking a particular, uh, the financial sector, the banking sector, in Ethiopia, financial sector is pretty much banking sector. Uh, and even within the banking sector, uh, the commercial bank of Ethiopia, which is the public bank, dominates everything. It accounts for 65% of you know, the loans and deposits, uh, about 60% of the assets, and about 50% of the capital. Therefore, seriously speaking, when you talk about the banking sector in Ethiopia, you're basically talking about the commercial bank of Ethiopia, which is a public bank. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, the, the, the general digital ecosystem is very much important for the, the, the banking or the financial sector. Uh, why? Because, you know, if the telecom is poor, if the telecom service is very expensive, uh, and related uh, infrastructure such as electricity is, you know, uh, has a problem of uh, providing good service, it will affect uh, the, the individual banks and the financial sector. Therefore, I tried to see what is the macro impact in general. So for that, what I did was I ran some regressions. Uh, I'm, this is, this is the, the picture of the financial sector in Ethiopia, generally. Uh, you have the national or the central bank at, at the top, and we have two public banks. One is Commercial Bank of Ethiopia. The other one is Development, of, uh, Development Bank of Ethiopia, pretty much a policy bank. And we have about 18 now uh, uh, private commercial banks, and a number of, I think, five or six new banks are still in the process of being established. We have about 18 insurance firms and 41 microfinance institutions. As you can see from that, that picture, 60% of the assets of the banking system is owned by the commercial bank, uh, leaving for the, for the other private bankers about 40% of it. And in terms of capital, also half of the capital is owned by, by commercial bank of Ethiopia. So this is pretty much the picture of uh, the financial sector. Now, before studying this, what I did was uh, I try. This again shows you the capital and uh, the branch network. It's still dominated by the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia. Uh, now, before I did, I go detail on this one. What I did was I ran. Oh, sorry. I don't know where, where, where which direction this thing is going. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Okay, my, my, I hope I'm going back. It doesn't look like it's going back. <laughs> because I'm pressing this or this. Can you hold it? Please take it to the first, please. Go again. Can you do it for me, please? If you can help me. It's not handy. Okay, please, next. <clears throat> okay, this gives you a picture of, uh, you know, the economic growth in the last uh, uh, five years. And basically, if you see the last 20 years, the Ethiopian economy is growing very, very, very fast. On the average, 9% per annum for a consecutive 15 years, although we don't believe you know, that figure, <laughs> as economists, the government says that. I believe it's a bit exaggerated, but at least 6-7% uh, is, uh, there, is a, there is a guy from the government next to me here. <laughs> a friend, fortunately a friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, it was, you know, by the African standards, very high, uh, comparable to the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, growth of the high growth period. So we did uh, quite, quite okay. Now, when you see the, this is the indicator of some of the indicators of the digitalization in, uh, in the country. If you see mobile per person, uh, you can see uh, mobile per 100 inhabitants, which was just 43, 2015. 
has jumped to 54.3 uh, today, but still very low by, by, by comparison in the region, in particular when you compare it to Kenya. It's very, very low. Uh, internet and data is extremely low, about 100 percent. It was 10 uh, some uh, six years ago, now about 24. Uh, fixed line is uh, it's, it's a general trend across, across the continent uh, it, uh, because the others are replacing it. Uh, where is, what happened? There you are. Good. Uh, can, you, can you go to the next, please? So you're getting this. It's the same problem. You're going back. Okay, let me talk about this. This, this is the government's uh, strategy of digitalization. The government has picked uh, four uh, uh, sectors uh, as a focus of uh, digitalization. One is agriculture uh, and to, you know, to, to unleash the value from agriculture using digitalization. The next one is uh, global to, in, the, in terms of the manufacturing sector, to put it in the global uh, value chain and to use digitalization, digital transformation for that purpose. Um, and the, the third focus of the government strategy is the government digital strategy is building the IT enabled service sector. And the fourth one is digital, uh, digital as the driver of tourism. These are they already picked and the government has already designed uh, a digital uh, strategy. Uh, until 2025, and this is the focus of uh, the government. Okay, next, please. Now, so before having this uh, in the paper, I have discussed all this in detail, but having this one, what I did was, let me see, let me see at a general level the impact of digitalization on economic growth. So I just fitted uh, uh, a simple uh, uh, solo growth model. Uh, where I define the, 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 the total factor productivity, uh, among other things, is a function of digitalization. So I used labor, capital, and estimated uh, this equation, and I, I got some interesting results at a general level. Next one, please. So what I did was, uh, next, please. Uh, this is what I got. Now, what I got here is interesting in the sense that, number one, the impact of digitalization on growth is very, very strong. I think a 1% growth in digitalization measured by mobile uh, subscription brings about 0.5 percentage growth in GDP. But again, the, the second interesting result, it varies across sectors. It is huge in, in the service sector and uh, very limited, extremely limited in the agriculture uh, sector, which, which Makes sense, uh, and uh, I think the top. And the second one is when I use broadband subscription in, uh, uh, as uh, an indicator of uh, digitalization. I found the, the the economic significance of the number very small. From point previously the elasticity was 0 0.05, now it becomes 0 0.03. Uh, so I think the mobile thing is more important, more important in terms of catalyzing the, the, the growth uh, than, than the, the broadband subscription. And as you see here also, the, the service sector impact is almost 1%, almost 1.1. Uh, for 10% growth, uh, the, the growth impact on the service sector GDP is uh, almost 1%. For the general GDP is 0.5%. Uh, uh, and for agriculture, 0 0.03. So the impact varies. Next, please. Now, this is the short trend result. So those of you who can, you can have a look at it, the short trend result. That one is the longest because I fit this uh, uh, autoregressive distributed lag models. Uh, so this one is the short trend result. And let, let's, next, please, sorry. Next. So once I have this general picture of, okay, I know pretty much what the impact of this thing is on the, the, globe, uh, the GDP, the growth of the economy, then I went to specific case studies. For that, what I did was I, I picked the, the dominant uh, bank, commercial bank, as I told you, is dominant in terms of deposits, lending, 65% of the banking sector is dominated by that. And uh, in terms of uh, assets, 60%. In terms of capital, 40%. So if I study uh, 
what is digitalization in the commercial bank of Ethiopia, I pretty much get an idea of what digitalization, number one. Then also I took like five private, the top five private uh, bankers, private uh, commercial bankers, and I did a key in informant interview with them, and I tried to collect also data on digitalization from uh, these firms. So the, you know, the, 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 the result of that analysis is uh, the following. Uh, next, please. Oh, okay, I already said that. Next, please. Good. Now, if you see generally the financial sector in Ethiopia, but I compared it to Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda, and I found it in general, the conclusion is by all measures, the Ethiopian financial sector is the lowest in terms of all indicators uh, compared to the region, except in some areas with Malawi. And in particular, when you compare it to Kenya, it's hugely, hugely below below the level of the level of Kenya. Like if you see, you know, the account penetration rate, the CPI financial sector indicator, uh, domestic credit to the private sector, in all these measures, it is very low. The only, the only uh, place where uh, it, it is better is in terms of uh, risk premium on lending, lending rate minus treasury bill rate, it, it has the lowest. Otherwise, uh, regionally, it is, uh, its performance is uh, the, the lowest. Next, please. And in terms of, digi the same in terms of digitalization. If, well, particularly, I want you to compare with Kenya. They're all like internet payment system, digital <coughs> payment system, mobile money account. Ethiopia, uh, as you see it in the left, Burundi and Ethiopia is way below uh, the, the countries in the region. Next, please. Good, this is the case study. What I, what I thought is this way. We have disruptive technology in the financial sector. That's what I want to study. Uh, forms and level of disruption technology, digitalization in the financial sector. Uh, this has like, what is the digitalization in core banking, IT, payment system, and other FinTech products. Then I try to see what is the positive effects, uh, opportunities of this, and what are the negative effects of this, and that has implication for financial sector business model. That's, that usually I assumed from the literature that if uh, digitalization is disruptive, it will change the business model of banks. Uh, if it doesn't, it is not affecting them. I mean, it's a good example for me is Uber, Uber say in Kenya, or in Ethiopia we call it Ride. Uh, before that in Ethiopia we have small taxis working and now the moment Uber comes, uh, completely the business model is changed. Therefore, those taxis, the, the traditional taxis, either to adopt the new business model uh, or they are out of business. So I've assumed from the literature that is the concept of disruptive technology I have. Now the question is whether the digitalization, whatever digitalization we have in Ethiopia, does it affect does it have an effect on business model of banks? That's what I was trying to answer. Uh, good, next please. Now then I, I tried to, to collect data from uh, this, the, the banks, the commercial bank as I told you, the dominant, and the other four top private banks, which account for more than 50% of the private banks, asset, loans, and what have you. So I picked them, and then I, tr I tried to see the trend. Now, what are my indicators like the use of ATM, uh, POS machines, mobile banking users, internet banking users, number of card holders, ATM transactions per year, uh, ATM trans and internet transaction customer. So I picked all this and I compared the, the period 2008-2090 uh, to 2020-21. Uh, Generally from this table, the conclusion is there is significant growth in all these indicators, or in all these indicators. Uh, for instance, if you take the CBE and the, AT the ATM use, uh, the users, which were 2.5 million, jumped to 3.1 million. Uh, again, pause use, it was 3,000, it jumped to 4,000. And mobile bank users, this is very important indicator, which used to be 2,000, 2.3 million, jumped to 6.6 .6 million. So in all indicators here, I see significant growth in this 
payment, payment systems. The next, please. Now, I, I try to compare with this with Kenya banks because for me, Kenya, the level of financial uh, development, Rose, uh, fortunately, Rose, Rose is here. Rose did some excellent stuff on the Kenyan financial system, published in, 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 in ARG a long time ago, and I use that paper very much because it shows you what happened to the banking sector in Kenya in the 80s and the 90s. And there is an excellent uh, book published on digitalization in Kenya, banking system, which shows you the latest, what happened. So if you take Rose's paper, Rose is here, and uh, that paper, you can give, it can give you the idea of how uh, the digitalization has gone in Kenya. So for me, Kenya is a good benchmark to compare it. So what I, what I found interesting uh, in this comparison, I, here I took the equity bank. In the next slide, I have the Commercial Bank of Kenya. Now, when I compare that, what I found is that some of the, indi some of the indicators that the Ethiopian banks use to show success are not success indicators in Kenya. For instance, an increase in the number of ATM is not a success indicator in Kenya. In Ethiopia, banking system, when the ATM goes up, they just climb. There is, we're doing great. Uh, not in Kenya. Or agent bank, if, if you see the trend, even agent banking is stagnating in, in, in Kenya. And if you see the trend, even the agent banking is going down, the top one. Uh, then merchant pulse stagnated pretty much, it's declining actually. The ATM is declining, as you see, and merchant pulse is stagnating. So all this, why that? Because the Kenyans are moving to more digital payment system. So in, in Ethiopia, the, the rivers, these things are going, branch is expanding, ATM is expanding, and it is considered as a success indicator. This contrast is important, I'll come to that. Uh, next. What is the implication of that for the business model? Good. Uh, then I, I, I talked to, after collecting this information, I had a discussion, a key informant discussion with the, uh, with the IT department guys uh, in these banks, as well as with the, uh, the CEO of these banks. And the conclusion I, I came up are the following. Number one, uh, the Ethiopian business model is basically based on, on still based on branch uh, banking model and focusing on customers, uh, big customers, as well as customers that have access to foreign exchange, like NGOs and what have you. So that, that is their business model. Everything is pretty much 90% served branch level. Uh, second, they focus on big firms. Uh, and third, they focus on those firms that have access to foreign exchange. Because there, we have serious foreign exchange shortage, almost rationing for the last five years. So that was the, the, business, the business model uh, they have. And by contrast, when you see the sub-Saharan African uh, thing, the focus is, the trend is towards going more micro and small, small firms. Uh, finance, and the, the focus is more on digitalization instead of uh, the branch system. That's no, number one conclusion. The second conclusion, one of the major uh, problems uh, for, uh, that I observed in Ethiopia for, for digitalization and the banking sector, as I told you, the banking sector is pretty much the financial sector in that country, is lack of methods or tools to measure the impact of investing on digitalization. You know, when, when, the, when the, the, the managers go to the board, the, the, the boards want to give as much dividend as possible to make the bank very attractive. And therefore, you, you cannot exactly show what the impact of digitalization to the board to convince them so that they will allow to invest on digitalization. So that, that I found from, from uh, uh, this study, a major problem. Third, the current business model of Ethiopia banks is focused on big customers, as I told you, and corporate entities that have handled, uh, all of them are handled in branch. Uh, this is the opposite of the trend in the continent. This for me shows me that digitalization doesn't bring about any business model change in Ethiopia. I concluded from that. 
So that it doesn't really lead them to, to change their business model. Next, please. For advanced, uh, adopting advanced level global uh, and financial digitalization and venturing on digital transformation of banking as a strategy is not observed, basically, in, in uh, substantive manner uh, in Ethiopia, despite the growth of all these digital uh, indicators. And one of the major challenge every CEO told me is that the regulator, the regulator is far behind uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, properly regulating and supervising, supervising digital products, digital products in the country. So what does that mean? The, the regulator is very weak. As it, is, it has a list of things to be done, the, uh, permissible things to be done. And if you, if you as a bank innovate, and come up with innovative products, it takes you one or two years to get approval. So by the time we get approval, the, the product is obsolete, basically. So the regulator, I found the regulator is very stifling, and very, very, they are very strict, very, very in a narrow margin, and they don't allow financial banks and the emerging small fintechs to be innovative and bring that product to the market. So unless, you know, that, and then if you, if you try to, to, to convince, they're not accountable for that either. They, 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 they you know, they held, they held the progress and then they're not accountable. Sometimes in some of CEOs told me that they could be even reprisal if you try to, to be hard on them. So that, I found that a very stifling uh, regulatory envi environment. Uh, can, I, can you go next, please? I already said that. There are also a number of areas that enhance digitalization, the financial, but needs to be taken collectively. The an another problem is especially in some products that come from global vendors, every bank is handling it individually. But if they do collectively, one, it would have minimized it enormously the cost. Uh, the second one, there are, you know, like uh, sovereignty and national security issues, uh, because if you are completely controlled by a global uh, a vendor, uh, you you could be threatened in terms of national security. So a lot of banks express that with these these things, you know, securing some digital and financial products from global vendors, if it had been handled collectively at national level. Uh, that would have been that would have been the best. So that that's the suggestion uh, uh, I got. Conclusion: Except in a few banks, I found only one actually uh, one bank. The disruptive technology nature of digitalization doesn't seem to have any implication on changing the business model of uh, most uh, banks uh, in Ethiopia. And another final interesting point I found is you know. In Ethiopia, when you see nobody pro for the outside, it could be difficult. For the insiders behind the banks, there is ethnic. Ba it is ethnic-based banking. Bank I can tell Bank A it belongs to a particular ethnic group, dominated, and Bank C uh, dominated by a particular ethnic group. And but there are also multi-ethnic banks which have multi-ethnic uh, clients, and. And increasingly now, also there is religious banks are emerging. Religious based banks are emerging. Protestants, uh, Muslims, Orthodox Christians, what have you. So therefore, some of the multi, the concern of some of the multi ethnic based bank is that these are taking customers uh, away uh, from them. And digitalization, in particular, uh, you know, Safaricom is moving to Ethiopia and other digital bank based are coming to Ethiopia. So they believe that this digitalization by allowing competition may lead to mergers of this uh, ethnic banks and could, could have a positive uh, uh, effect on them. That's pretty much what I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, very interesting paper. Uh, Dr. Ben, uh, 
we have him here. Oh, yeah. Yes, as a discussant. Thank you. Oh, okay, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Professor, for a very uh, interesting paper. Uh, I went through it and I realized it's quite, uh, it has a lot of detail. Uh, basically, it's looking at uh, digitalization as a major disruptive technology in Ethiopia. And this is again as the background that uh, digitalization is at a fairly low level within Ethiopia. And whereas it acknowledges that, uh, it agrees, it, uh, it puts out the point that digitalization is growing within Ethiopia, although not very fast. Uh, it's actually one of the slowest uh, within, within the region. Now the paper, the way it is structured, I saw it as an omnibus of several uh, things. Uh, first of all, it discusses the journey of digitalization in Ethiopia. It then highlights the importance of uh, digi disruptive technologies in bringing about structural transformation of the economy uh, and its uh, impacts. Now, one of the things I grappled with from the very beginning is that uh, disruptive technology and digitalization seems to have been equated. And whereas uh, di digital technology may not necessarily be disruptive, it is largely seen as disruptive. On the other hand, disruptive technology is not exactly digitalization. You can have other technologies which are non-digital in nature. So along the way, I think that distinction was brought out, but it will be good to probably bring it uh, much, much earlier uh, to avoid a scenario as I had, whereby you get very confused at the very beginning as to whether the two have been equated. So it looks at the impact of digitalization in the, within the Ethiopian uh, financial sector, and professors mentioned the Ethiopian financial sector is kind of uh, skewed, skewed in a particular direction, public sector, and there is one large bank which basically does a lot of things, and that is what becomes basically uh, the subject of the case study. Now, I'm approaching this from, with a business, uh, business background, and therefore my lens, I'm looking at it with a lens of uh, business innovation. And so when I look at the discussion and the distinction, it looks at digital technologies as enabling the various models, uh, new business models, uh, it can cause intermediation and obviously give a chance for customer centricity. The fact that digital digitalization is moving slowly within Ethiopia does not mean that there's no other innovation that is going on. Uh, the, the authors acknowledge that. The, the author acknowledges that there are other uh, types of innovation, innova incremental innovation that are going on uh, within, uh, within, within, within Ethiopia. Now, I have a detailed report which I'll not go through for purposes of time, but I just want to highlight a few specific things which I thought probably could be important uh, from, the, from the perspective of the presentation of today. Uh, when we look at what is the impact of digitalization, I'm glad there's been uh, some models which have been done, very novel models, uh, whereby we're able to pin the growth within digitalization using some dummy variables and its impact on the gross, uh, uh, on the gross uh, domestic product of the economy. And this has been done not only for the financial sector, but it has also been done for the other sector. Now, in terms of the question that then next comes in, when you look at that amount and the fact that the expectation of disruption should have a big delta, we may not be able to see a big delta, and that's probably what then leads us to the discussion about what is it that is slowing down uh, the, the, the impact, what is it that is affecting the impact and not making it be as great as one would ordinarily expect. Uh, the authors attributed this mainly to do with the, with the regulatory restrictions uh, within the economy, which then kind of restrict the actual growth within the economy and then you don't get, you don't derive the benefits that you'll expect uh, to have as a result of that. Uh, so there's a discussion on the financial sector, but again, as we said, it is heavily skewed. So a discussion of the Ethiopian financial sector is basically a discussion of the Ethiopian banking industry. And even within the banking industry, the author has a graph there, which shows is again concentrated 60 to 70 percent is within the public sector. And in terms of decisioning, uh, you'll find again the decisions uh, might not be as, as, as swift 
as the stakeholders uh, would expect. There is this anxiety that with the opening up of this economy, we are likely to see a lot more liberalization and a lot more prompt to change. So that will be able to tell with time. I like the detail in the paper. However, it comes at a little price because the detail at some stage I felt probably was a bit onerous um, in some areas. But if we were to focus back within the Ethiopian financial state, uh, fi 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 financial uh, financial banking sector, because we agreed financial sector and banking sector are more or less the same within Ethiopia, uh, there is a discussion as to whether the digital penetration that is led by ATM and POS uh, necessarily uh, has a trend that can be related to mobbing, mobile banking users. Uh, within Ethiopia, uh, the author states, and I hope I understood it correctly, it's led by ATMs and POS, and then followed by mobile banking users. But that's the interesting part about disruptive technology, because it does not need to follow a predictable path. Uh, the next question that will come in, is it possible that this path in the future could actually be inverted? Why I'm asking this is that there are there the, are the, the, what you call the uh, antecedents that caused this path to be there. If you look at the other markets, when we were having ATMs and POS, probably the mobile banking uh, technology was not as advanced. But right now it's very advanced. Whoever the new players that are in the market will possibly come in with the, with the advanced technology. They'll not come with the old technology. They'll come in with the advanced technology. So could there be a possibility that this trend does not uh, need uh, to, 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 does not need uh, to follow that pattern. Now, when I look at uh, the, the paper, the paper, we spent a lot of time discussing the supply side. But then the other issues, and as was uh, stated in the earlier paper, one of the earlier papers, the other demand-related issues that can actually affect the growth of uptake of digital technology. What are these demand-side discussions? What are these demand-side issues that we probably need to be cognizant of uh, that could then affect uh, the growth of digital technology. Internet is driven by education and income affordability. We could spend more time and explore that relationship and ask ourselves what exactly, and we could link into the earlier, earlier paper, what exactly uh, affects this, what exactly could be causing this growth. Comparatively, we've looked at the impact of uh, digitalization on GDP. How do you compare this with the other countries that we've looked at, Kenya? Because you've given, you said we are slow compared to the rest of the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But what is, when you look at the same measure compared to the other countries, how does it look like? How has this been influenced by the availability of uh, uh, the digital terrestrial infrastructure? Ethiopia is a very big country. So, if you look at uh, countries like Kenya, they are smaller comparatively and they've probably been able to map out the entire country with their infrastructure. So what are the challenges? What is holding back? Is it an income discussion? Because as much as we could say it's a regulatory issue, it's a macroeconomic discussion as to laying out all that infrastructure. What is the taxation regime? How, does, how do tax rates affect ICT services and appliances? And ultimately, how do they affect the uptake of digital uh, technology? The other point that I wanted to look at is the discussion about uh, the evolution, what I'm calling the evolution of telecommunications. If you look at, uh, say specifically, Kenya, for a long time it was voice driven. Now the plan is swifting towards uh, broadband and data. Does Ethiopia need to necessarily follow this path because the penetration has been low? Do you still need to push a lot of voice and rather than just go straight into, into, into data and broadband investment? So those are some of the things, some of the thoughts which come into my mind in terms of what are some of the progressive uh, things that we need to map out if you are to come out with recommendations. Understandably, we've had discussions with the, with the specific case, uh, case studies 
the owners of the farm, and they laid out what they think holds them back. But I think ultimately, we still need to look at the demand side. What is it that the population will be interested in? Because they can only subscribe to what they can afford. So comparatively, if you are going to have, uh, to have expansive financial uh, digit digitization, are the people in the rural and the more remote areas of Ethiopia able uh, to, afford, to afford that? Uh, I will stop at this stage and thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, going through the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, very, very na uh, good questions. Um, okay, so we may uh, ask some people who want to intervene. Chair, there are two questions. Uh, uh, can you read them out, please? From the online uh, participants. From uh, someone uh, with the name Jesus. I think this question was asked early, but it's relevant to, to this session. He says, hello, my question is that uh, of knowing how digital transformation can lead to financial inclusion in sub-Saharan Africa and what should be done concretely. I've just translated, this was asked in French. Then uh, Abi Kedir uh, asked uh, Tualemayu, what is mobile, oh, there was a spelling issues there, uh, it's called, what is mobile transaction? It was a uh, transition. They say, if yes, it looks to have a dramatic growth in the last couple of years and is worth investigating further. That's just a comment from Abhi Thank you. There's a rejoinder, there's a hand from Ms. Gebo. Ah, Ms. Gebo, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, both. I would like to, to thank both uh, Professor Alamayo and also the discussant because uh, they have uh, really, uh, uh, that is a good job uh, in my view and uh, uh, it's very important uh, analysis and uh, also uh, which can inform a policy, I think, in this regard. But uh, what I would like to um, get a, a clearance, I mean, a, a explanation uh, is also regarding this, uh, you know, uh, the, the analysis is all, uh, particularly focused on uh, uh, measuring, you know, uh, or uh, identifying effects of disruptive technologies in the and financial sector. But uh, what I didn't get clear is uh, the issue of ownership, uh, particularly in this analysis, particularly, uh, you know, the public sector dominance in the banking sector, uh, what matters uh, for, you know, uh, uh, or what explains, you know, uh, as a cause or uh, for, for the digitalization process not taking place. That's my, my take. Uh, of course, the fact we have to also present the fact in this uh, analysis because, you know, we we actually moved from completely uh, public dominant, 100% public dominant, public uh, you know, uh, uh, dominant uh, financial sector to somehow uh, now you know around 40% is you know uh, for the private sector so. I think it is good to uh, show that evolution because now we are also now moved to a very, very big uh, policy action which you might have heard recently that the government also decided to open, you know, the banking sector even the, to the foreigner. So uh, I think uh, that it is good to acknowledge, you know, those evolutions because uh, these policy actions are uh, of course, for, for quite some time, it was stagnant, we know. Uh, so and now, uh, again, uh, the banking sector is also, the uh, private sectors are also taking that part. And uh, so it's good to, to, to look into that. The other thing is also maybe the discussant also uh, pointed out uh, the, 
when you consider the disruptive technologies, particularly the mobile banking, it is all, uh, uh, you know, by regulation, it's only that uh, decided recently that, you know, to also, uh, you know, use mobile banking in the financial sector. It's only recently, and then we have seen a very big jump. So really, that, that timing may, may not be, in my view, a very short period of time. So maybe going forward, uh, this is a very, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I can say in the analysis, maybe this is too short to conclude anything. Maybe that's also the, my, my, my observation that I have seen. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you give us also the policy implications for, you know, uh, from your analysis, particularly uh, the policy implication is very important. So it should be, uh, of course, in the paper it, we can find it, but uh, the policy implications is also very important to, to, uh, to, to see that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, so many hands. Uh, so so uh, let's take them. Huh? I mean, it's uh, okay. So the lady. Thank you, and, and, and for a really excellent presentation. It has constantly been uh, said um, that, uh, and, and because you used Kenya uh, for comparison purposes, that uh, the um, mobile wallets have uh, contributed to the um, expansion, if I can use that term, uh, of, or entrenchment of financial inclusion in Kenya. And so with the, with the findings that you've presented to us, how, how do you think that could compare with Ethiopia, uh, with the lower levels of, uh, of uh, mobile payments, transactions, mobile wallets probably overall? Uh, would, you, would you be able to compare that with the levels of uh, uh, financial inclusion in the country? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Mine is a quick methodological question. You showed Solo's growth equation, which you modified by including digitalization as a factor of production, which is very original. I mean, this is a 1957 theory and has changed fundamentally. But my question for you then, but you proxy digitalization as sort of mobile connections. So that sounds to me, if I got you correctly, uh, as being associated with growth. But that seems to me like a, an infrastructural issue, a public level of technology that enables uh, users to access digital services. But if you endogenize the uh, digital technology or digitalization itself, meaning what do the banks themselves invest in terms of their own competences, would that have an even more significant uh, association or effect on growth. So I don't know if you thought why you stuck with the exogenous growth rather than endogenous growth. Do you have a reason for that? Thank you. Thank you. I have a question that is very close to the question that has just been raised and mine is more of a theoretical question than a methodological. But it's based on the inclusion of um, digitalization as part of the solo model. Because the um, paper computes the total factor productivity in the context of the solo residual, uh, which is rooted in the exogenous growth theory. Um, now, in this context, we know that Technological progress is responsible for long-term growth in the exogenous growth theory. And so we don't expect to see technological progress captured as part of the endogenous factors uh, informing growth. And so that leaves me with the option to interpret the inclusion of digitalization as in the context of endogenous growth theory. But then, I have a problem with that because um, my thinking is that in the context of Ethiopia and most of Africa, 
uh, technology is used is adopted after it has been developed elsewhere. And that raises the question of whether it is part of our endogenous uh, factors of production. The fact that it is adopted having been developed elsewhere, can it be grouped under endogenous factors? And if it can't, then what is the rationale for including it as part of the endogenous uh, growth theory? Uh, so, so I was going to suggest that uh, perhaps it would be interesting to, to have a secondary relationship, because I've seen in the paper that you have also tested this model with um, um, economic value added at the sectoral level. So have that as a secondary relationship, and then extract the component explained by digitalization in the value addition, and then use that as, as a factor, if possible. That is just a thought. Use that as a factor in the growth model, rather than using it directly, because I, I find it questionable to have it used directly as, uh, as an endogenous factor in the growth model. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mine is a very brief uh, clarification. In the, uh, when you are giving the comparison with Kenya, the example you gave us was just about based on equity. I just wanted to know, did you just base your comparison using equity bank or did you use other uh, bank, commercial banks? Thank you. Yes, Jason. Sorry, Alec. You have to <laughs> wait a bit. So, sorry, I, I do apologize. I'll, I'll be relatively quick. Um, you know, within most of these case studies and in most examples of industrial policy, banking policy, etc., there's a very vibrant uh, political economy that involves multiple actors, each obviously with their own interests and their own uh, ways of doing things and what they want to achieve out of a particular um, for example, like adopting a digital technology, a disruptive digital technology, there's different actors who want different things from it. Now, you mentioned the, uh, what's say, fragmented Ethiopian banking sector dominated by one large bank. And obviously, the lack of capacity and capabilities from a regulatory perspective. So, I guess my question is who is meant to drive the adoption of disruptive technologies? I mean, if you have all these banks coming together to form a banking association and they is led, or they are led by one large bank, obviously that bank is going to try and do its best to protect its own interests. So where does the starting block begin? Who kicks it off? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's give Alex a chance uh, to say uh, his bit. Uh, there are many interesting questions, Alex. Uh, yeah. You don't need yeah. to answer all of them. No, okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I think this most likely shows that people do have interest on the paper, but a lot of questions came. I'm very happy about it. Uh, let, me, let me start from the theoretical thing. Excellent comments by uh, my friend there and here on the theory, the use of the solo model. Uh, actually, what I, when I used that, what I did was I assumed, as he said, it was exogenous for us. We pretty much adopting it. Uh, so therefore, uh, it should be, I, I assumed it should be part of the residual, part of the residual in the solo model. And in the, in the, in the sense that therefore, it is an exogenous. Uh, but pretty much what you guys have said is, if, if, I, if I make it endogenous, uh, I'm, I was worried that we're not, we're not creating that technology, therefore uh, we shouldn't take it as the endogenous. That's why I stick to that. Yet I left it open. I didn't restrict the parameters to obey, you know, to add to what. I just make it open uh, so that if there is some externalities, it will show me. That was. But uh, I think he suge his suggestion is also a good one. I could try uh, what he suggested. Second, probably I would also try by having an interaction term with each of, with each of the labor and the capital in case if arguments, arguments labor and the capital. And this is excellent comment, I will, I will take it. 
And the second one is the, the Ben gave me quite, quite, quite nice comments. And for instance, the, clarif the clarification about digitalization from the outset, uh, which you emphasize it. Uh, the distinction between digitalization and disruptive, I would, I would do that. It's an excellent comment. I just take it. Uh, now, the interesting question about, about you picked, and also some other um, participants has picked, is uh, this looks like at early stage, and could 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 the trend could be inverted? That, that's quite right. I think so, because like. Now Safaricom is moving to Ethiopia. I ju they just started last last week. Now, I, I, in my reading, uh, you know, some four or five years ago, 30 percent of three zero percent of Safaricom's income is coming from uh, the financial side of the business, not from voice, not from the data. And three years ago, it was growing by 20 percent per annum in Kenya. And today, Safaricom's income 50 percent is uh, for, not from voice and data, but from the financial sector. Now, and the government allowed, I heard, now Safaricom to do a mobile business in Ethiopia. So if, for me, that is like opening up the financial sector pretty much. And I think then you are right in that sense that this could be inverted. There will be a shift towards, towards more mobile, mobile banking uh, once, once Safaricom uh, comes. And that's why even the, the, the national telecom company, that, which is a monopoly, is aggressively now working on mobile uh, banking. And I think in just one year, it managed to get a subscription of more than 20 million people. So definitely the trend is toward the start. Your good comment, the other one is the demand side. Uh, of course, you, you are absolutely right. I focused on only on the supply side. And uh, probably if I get the time, because I, this one needs more household level data to get this demand uh, side, the education, the literacy, the digital literacy as, I, I believe it, it has serious impact. The digital literacy, if you compare it in Kenya and Ethiopia is incomparable, incomparable. And definitely that will have uh, an impact. In Ethiopia, like, you know, like we had something, probably 120 million people, 80% is in rural area. And 60, 70% of them are illiterate. So, uh, definitely, that, that, that matters a lot, and I, I will take that uh, on board. But I don't think I will do, and that requires probably a separate demand, demand side uh, analysis. Uh, the same you, you picked about the infrastructure uh, issue compared to Kenya, and that the impact on growth, uh, I think that's very important. Taxation. Uh, I haven't checked that one, the taxation, the impact. I haven't checked this one, but I will check this one. Now, uh, what uh, Ms. Geber pick, Ms. Ms. Geber picked uh, an important issue. That I think he picked two issues. One, probably the ownership matters uh, because uh, like probably 20 years ago, we never had any private bankers. In the last 20 years, this private bank has developed and uh, uh, they now account for 40% of uh, the banking sector uh, uh, indicators, like loans, deposit, and what have you. So definitely it matters. But I, in this study, I also investigated the private sector bankers. And from that, what I learned was, this, in particular, the, the central bank is a major, uh, major uh, bottleneck for their activities, the, the regulatory uh, system. Uh, so I don't know. Like with the coming of the Safaricom and the Ethio Telecom uh, mobile money system, uh, I would say both will proportionately will increase because still Ethio Telecom is publicly owned as, as it stands uh, and Safaricom is private. Therefore, I think the private public share will uh, already Ethio Telecom has, uh, as I said, 22 million subscribers is ahead of Safaricom. Uh, therefore, they will probably increase proportionately. Uh, who, who else? Uh, Abi, Abi asked why the jump online. He asked why the jump uh, in the recent period. Uh, the, the major reason, probably, Ms. Um, already answered it, is that uh, the, the law to use mobile banking is a, a recent phenomenon itself. 
and that could be the major factors uh, for this one. Uh, who else? The I didn't quite get the, the last question you, you mentioned, the last, the last one. Uh, do they have an association that can counteract uh, the public sector? Is that, is that your yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm looking at the interplay between the different players within the market. Right, you've got the regulatory side of things, you've got the guys that are the banks that are actually mm -hmm. looking to, or not looking in many cases, to implement and adopt disruptive technologies. So um, I guess I'm asking is who is meant to take the first step there? Is it supposed to come driven by the state through like a digital uh, banking framework policy set, something like that? Or is, would you think that maybe the banks would kind of club together and through an association, say this is the way we're going to take the industry forward. Okay, I got it. Now they do have, you know, the banks have a banking association, the private bankers. Uh, pretty much, it's top down. Pretty much, regulator comes from the central bank, uh, and then they have to adapt to that. And one of the recommendation, I, actually, I presented this paper to some of the private bankers, and one of the recommendation I did was you guys come collectively and then you know, uh, present your cases for the central bank and make sure uh, that your interests are, are served that way. That pretty much I did. But as it stands, the, you know, the, the, government, the central bank is very much bossy. And then some of them, they even afraid to, 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 to talk to the guys there. They might, they might have represent. Rosemary, I forgot why you asked me. Rosemary. Yeah, I asked whether you used only equity or you. Oh uh, no, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, no, I used also commercial bank. I didn't show you uh, on show you on this uh, on the slide, but I used commercial bank of Kenya and equity bank, both of them. I know equity is a bit uh, unique. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think uh, we have had quite a run. Uh, thanks, Alex. So let's give him uh, and the discussion. <laughs> A round of uh, applause. Uh, uh, so maybe if you agree with me, uh, our keeper presentation, can we have it after people are awake or you want it now? Uh, my sense is uh, uh, the ED also will be coming at 2.15 uh, just to welcome and also say a, a bit of remarks himself. So we'll make it after the ED remarks. So we have one hour lunch break, nothing more. So uh, we go out and we come back at two. Uh, the lunch is right there. So I'm sorry, but we'll have maybe a longer coffee break. I promise that one. <laughs> okay. So thanks everyone. Uh, those of you vir who attend virtually, also you may have you may take one hour break. Uh, you are going to miss some nice lunch here, but still, we really appreciate your presence. Thank you so much. Recording stopped.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. And those attending virtually also, welcome back. So we start the afternoon session with uh, a remark from the executive director of ARC, uh, Professor Jugunan Dungu. Uh, no need to introduce him to the group. Uh, so he'll be speaking about the project. Uh, as you know, he is uh, one of the premier policy makers in Kenya. He was the central bank governor two terms. And then uh, he was also ARC alumni and still a professor at the University of Nairobi. So let's welcome him. We missed him this morning, but he's here. Thank you, thank you very much, Abebe, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was supposed to actually to say good morning. I was, uh, we had agreed by last night that I'll come and open the meeting around eight, uh, given that um, I was pulled into several meetings that I could not say no. Uh, but then uh, this morning at around 6.30 when I was trying to get ready, I was told I can't open at nine, and I realized I have to reorganize my day. But all along it has been messy, so you bear with me. But the most important thing is that at least maybe we, are, maybe we have taken off in terms of uh, the ideas that are pr presented in this project. And this project, on, especially on disruptive technologies, uh, of course, the new English is digitalization, but we have always made shortcuts to digitization. Digitization and um, disruptive technologies is actually something that is, we have come to accept. Remember in my initial years at the Central Bank in 2007, between 2007 and 2012, everybody was calling me to talk about disruptive technology because we disrupted the way financial system or financial services are offered. But now we have seen that it has gone to other real sectors of the economy. We can talk, start talking about the sustainable growth, we can talk about poverty reduction, we can talk about inclusiveness in terms of development where women and youth are included. We are able to talk about that because we have seen the developments. It is not only the financial system and how it can become inclusive, but more importantly, we have moved to affect other sectors of the economy. And this is the, 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 the main tenant of this project. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have come this far with this project and I'm sure we're going to consolidate ourselves into the ideas that we have. Anyway, because I was supposed to offer some opening remarks, um, I, uh, I, I'm going to j do just that. Which one, which one responds to it? Is it there? Okay, fine. Of course, for us all, we always like talking about the African Economic Research Consortium. But more importantly, we actually want to share with you, so for those who don't know much about ARC, our capacity building and knowledge generation model, which is very, very important. Most of you, I see faces, and it's, it's there in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that I go and I don't find alumni of AERC, or those people who have worked together. Rosemary, we have come a long way. Uh, Miriam, I think I call you whenever I want to deal with uh, a few things. Rose Goga is an old timer. Uh, so many of you. But why we emphasize this is because when we, ARC was started in 1988, it was started for a reason. And the whole issue is to ask where are we on that? And we didn't realize that it is massive critical mass that is required and we are still working through it. In fact, right now, though the three days I've been involved in um, government transition mechanism, the whole issue is about policy, the whole issue is about capacity. That's why I'm there actually trying to say we can do this. We have missed the board because we have missed the critical issue of what the policy driver should be, why should we emphasize this, why there is institutional failure that leads to policy failure. Those are the issues. But I think this is where AERC comes in handy to make sure that we actually provide the way forward in terms of how we build capacity through research, graduate training in economics, and also our own communication and policy outreach. In fact, I'm happy because the graduate training itself, the initial idea was to try and increase the supply of researchers, but more importantly, we wanted to make sure that we help public universities mount quality degree programs. 
To date, we have seen retention in those universities, we have seen the graduates coming from those universities, we have seen the supply of researchers. So we are very happy, and that's why I wanted to share that slide with you so that we should not forget where we have come from, we should also not forget that we need a critical mass in Africa to strengthen institutions. But then, let me say, talking, coming to the subject matter, technologies and innovation, and uh, these days, I think uh, when Nabebe and I, and I were approached by Bill and Merida Gates Foundation, asking about post-COVID post uh, economic recovery uh, um, agenda, the first thing we talked about is several things about, let's talk about protecting private investment, let's talk about protecting markets and making sure, to, sure that markets work, but the third and most important thing was actually domestic resource mobilization and reforming how we can actually reform institution and social contract. But more importantly, the final one was what coordinates all these was actually the digital evolution. And that is where the fourth industrial revolution is coming in. And thus we have seen so many developments in this area. Artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, digital finance, big data, uh, blockchains, everything. But more importantly, you can imagine we, can, we have survived in the last two years or so, uh, more than two years, with even virtual platforms. So we did not disrupt our capacity building, we did not disrupt our institutional makeup and even activities. And for us, that is very, very important. But the most important thing is developments that have taken place. And my argument has been that we should actually allow the developments to take place and institutions must actually nudge those innovators and those institutions involved in innovations, those institutions that are involved in shaping the future of work and even the structural change should not be heeded. And that is why you don't want to stifle innovation because then it means that we do not move in the same direction. And that's why I want to say that technologies have enabled, they have become an enabler, and they have shown that we can actually have some efficiency in terms of organizing ourselves, in terms of institutions, in production, in how the markets work, and that has created economic vibrancy. It's very, very important for them. The last time I was asked, when I left the Central Bank in 2015, I was asked about several things by the Brookings Institution. But the second thing, the emphasis that I need to talk about is actually about um, uh, regulatory technology because we f they felt that innovation would be killed by capacity constraints by policy makers. And that's why I put that paper there in the Brookings. In uh, that is, I actually, I talked about um, tr transformative uh, uh, regulatory technology. But of course, the title came out as Boosting Transform Transformational Technology. But actually, I wanted to see how we can boost innovative regulatory technology so that institutions do not heed innovations. Then, because if you heed innovations, we are not go going to move. I still give examples because when I left um, Central Bank, Bill and Merida Gates Foundation insisted that they have to send me to Nigeria. I hope there we have some Nigerians here. I'm not going to, there's nothing long I'm going to talk about in Nigeria, but I was supposed to talk to the, to the governor so that he can allow digital financial platforms so that at least it's a big market we can take advantage of. And uh, I went two times, but I didn't succeed even in talking to the governor. So I told myself that uh, just like revolution, it takes a long time to get to you. But once it gets to you, you start wondering why you didn't take it up faster that that's where we are, and we know that it is something that we can uh, talk about. But wherever you are, I think the one of the things we need to do is to watch, to, to see how we can change. Okay? I think even us, we are challenging to the technology, but we know it is there. We just move, move to it. Okay, oh, did I move faster? Let's see. Uh, I, moved, uh, I moved faster. I'm even saying Asante San. No, don't worry. Mm, mm. Okay, uh, the, is that, is that, the, no, okay, uh, sorry, I've seen it. Mm. I think it is moving faster than I thought. Anyway, <laughs> uh, okay, is that, okay, let me, uh, okay, that's where we were. So, we have collaborated with ERF, 
And uh, there are two uh, framework papers that have been presented here and five country case studies. And for you to understand why we organize ourselves that way, is in ARC technology or terminology, we call it collaborative research project. What we do is that we identify a topical project that can actually be fertile for policy adoption and even policy analysis and can lead to a lot of uh, examples in terms of what we need to do things. And we want to identify the key experts in that area who are going to develop the framework papers. And then we want to identify case studies so the, those case studies will be guided by the framework papers. So here we have two uh, case studies, sorry, two framework papers and five case studies. And we want to look at the impact of digitization or digital evolution and disruptive technologies across sub-Saharan Africa. And the studies is, uh, themselves also examine the political economy of issues surrounding the role of disruptive technology you know, institutions are very resistant, and that's where political economy comes in. Most of the time, you feel that you will lose because of technology. I remember we had an argument some time back, we had the uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion. It's a, uh, a financial inclusion uh, that coordinates financial inclusion policies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America that we started in 2009. We had arguments in Mozambique when we had an, a, a, a forum. And the whole issue is that nobody could understand how banks cannot maintain minimum balance, minimum balances. You can imagine. That was an argument that lasted almost an hour because the bankers could not agree. My point was that when you have minimum balances, then you exclude most of the majority of the people whose income is not well defined. That is, they get low income and even the flow of that income is uncertain, isn't it? And then you want to fix me and to have a minimum balance. And I gave my own example. I was teaching at the university. Rosemary, uh, you remember those days, my bank was somewhere in town. And when I left and I wanted to go to another bank, I told them, how do I maintain my current account? Oh, you'll be sending some money for ledger fees. He said, you are, a, are you a taxman or a bank? Because just imagine, this is not doing anything positive for me. But anyway, the debate, the debate that you can actually have an account without minimum balance, in other countries I don't think is acceptable. But in Kenya, nobody can even give you a minimum balance because you, you're going to take off. So when we talk about political economy issues, it's because there is economic rent to be lost because people are fixed with the history. They don't seem to see what the digital technology or digital evolution is, do, is doing. These studies, they cover uh, countries in different regions, uh, for example, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia and Kenya, Senegal, South Africa, are, of course, diverse in terms of nature. And this diverse is, diversity is very, very important because it tells us also where technology is most important and where techno technological uptake has, work, has been working very well. You know, I can see, like, where, when Safaricom entered the Ethiopian market, you, the headline news here were massive, yeah? The headline news. When I encouraged Equity Bank to go to Rwanda, the headline news there were massive because they know Equity is not going to, allow, to come up with minimum balance. They are going to give you technology and all that. So you can see that people already have priors, and that is why we say this diversity is going to be very, very important, and that's why our case studies cover that. And they provide some lessons that are very, very important for us to look at. But let me say, because this is a research team, if I was talking to the policy team, I would uh, be there for a long time. By the way, the end result is that what we, why we have organization in three stages, that is the framework papers, then case studies, there are stages where we bring the policymakers. And what we want to tell them is that, please, this is the frontier knowledge presented by the framework papers. And this is the evidence from country case studies. And so this is how we can actually compile or uh, imp uh, uh, profile the, 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 the policy requirements and even policy reforms. And we ask the policymakers to commit to implementation so that tomorrow they don't tell you that things are not working because you refused to implement 
or you didn't understand. So we want to make sure that there is no gap. This is the frontier knowledge, this is the evidence from the case studies, and this is how we can repackage policy. And you, your work is only to commit, to implement, and you can jug on things about how you change the implementation because of the country characteristics. That one is your case, and that is why it is very, very important. And um, there, there are key uh, disruptive technologies affecting, for example, Ethiopia. Uh, the, qu the questions being asked is, we know the, the, the disruptive technologies and how they have worked. We know Ethiopia, Kenya, Senegal, and South Africa, they will be different, but we can actually pinpoint what is happening. And the next thing is, do these countries have adequate social safety nets to deal with those who are likely to be dislocated or to lose from the changing uh, nature of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the economy after this? And what policy steps we can take actually for those countries to harness the benefits and even to institutionalize those benefits from the digital evolution? And uh, which sectors are actually going to provide better uh, take up and also to showcase what is really happening. In fact, if you look at the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, you'll find that the, digital, the, the, the finance, digital finance has taken off and has helped to shape up and even to help people understand what is really happening. And more so, it's not even digital finance. We start from the very, very low, low, low level of uh, retail transactions. They have worked very well, efficiently, transparent and safe. And even now, the benefit is also moving forward to in terms of lowering the unit cost. We are engulfed. You can pay, I, I used to tell people in the US that I can pay the wages for my workers who want to be paid weekly on Saturday afternoon when I'm still seated in the US. It doesn't matter the network. And it would work. In five seconds, they will have, they will have the money. I remember one time I was talking to the, when I, when I was just about to leave the, the central bank, I was invited by the U.S. Treasury, and um, the U.S. Treasury then, uh, uh, Jacob Dew, was telling everyone that at midnight in Kenya you can pay a taxman using your mobile phone. But what are you really doing? You're actually withdrawing your money from your account and transferring your money to the taxman's account, isn't it? So it means that the bank is earning ledger fees 24-7, isn't it? And they, they were saying, we can't do that in Washington, D.C. But in Nairobi, they are doing that. So you can see the benefits. But the other thing is that, will the countries have infrastructure and enabling environments required to take full advantage of the digital evolution? Yesterday evening, I was, uh, from around four, I was talking to health uh, consumer protection, is it international consumer protection, something in uh, Switzerland. We were, had a virtual meeting, and one of the things they asked is, what are the four things you need to emphasize on? And I started with infrastructure. The fiscal infrastructure is important for the private sector to develop the core infrastructure. You know, we have fiber optics, but what Safaricom did was to develop M-Pesa. Others came in with uh, Airtel money, everything. But th that Mpesa and all those are core infrastructure, but the physical infrastructure is very critical. But also the physical infrastructure makes sure that nobody is left behind. And that is where we are. That is why I'm talking about infrastructure is an number. And the second thing is how do we protect the market? We need to issue uh, electronic IDs. It is going to protect the market. And the third thing is everybody wakes up and talks about interoperable payments platform. I don't disagree. But I always say that there is fast move advantage, and how do we solve that? You can't replicate physical infrastructure. You can come up with leasing arrangements that will make interoperable work, uh, interoperability work. But interoperability will enlarge the market and lower, uh, lower unit cost. It's not for, to capture the market share. In Kenya, there are some who believe that it's market share. You, are, you can capture the market share. The market share will be captured by the products you roll on that platform. And finally, I argued very strongly that, that was yesterday, and it's also in my papers, that you have to have capacity so that the regulator and the regulatory institutions and government do not stifle innovations. And they need to nudge to protect the market, but also nudge the market to the optimal path. 
That is why will countries have infrastructure and enabling environments required to take full advantage of the digital revolution? That is why that point becomes very, very important and we can pick it up from there. So, as I said, the project has two outputs and they have realized them. One of them, I'm sure they have been presented. I was supposed to be here in the morning, sorry about that, but I'm still, I led a bit of those papers. It's actually to come up with the framework papers and the first paper is the structural transformation in MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa and the role of digitalization that is by James DiMero and uh, Jean Mark. I am sure this, those who, have gone, who are going to the case studies have realized that they can use that study. Of course, don't worry about the construction at all. Yeah, the second paper was the digitalization in MENA and Sub-Saharan African region, which is a, a comparative analysis by Professor Isaac and uh, Mark Dutz from the World Bank. I think uh, the World Bank has been a great support in this area. And uh, once they understood what is happening, especially in, uh, in financial markets, things have worked very well. And you can see, you see a lot of massive papers in uh, SIGA under the World Bank working very well, and I'm happy about them. So essentially, those are major outputs in terms of frontier knowledge. And then the five country case studies, I don't need to go through them. It's the product of that, guided by that. But the most important thing is to make sure that once we have this regional forum, then we can actually prepare ourselves in, towards the sharing with the senior policymakers. And uh, bringing the, the policymakers together was, is always very important for us. We make sure that they, it works. And this is the stage where we are now in this forum that we want to make sure that the policymakers understand and how we want to make sure that this forum takes advantage. When we share policies with the policymakers and even showing them where the, 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 the frontier has gone, they actually start rethinking where they have been. And they start now seeing where they should be. But otherwise, it has to be simple and very appropriate because we don't want so, also want them to fear. I've been in that, I thought I had, uh, after six years, after leaving Central Bank, after six years, I thought everything has worked well the way I, the way I thought things should work. You know, I went to the Central Bank in 2007, and I almost, uh, Rose can tell you, <laughs> that I was asking, am I in the right place? Because I'm asking people, how do you make monetary policy? And the story I get is that, um, I'm not so sure. My colleagues outside were telling me, Jumona, you stop behaving like the teacher in you. You had, you, you are not there to teach people. But I said, if I don't do that, I'm going to die very soon. Because essentially, what, how they are doing and how they are reasoning is out of this world. Last week and this week, I've, has, I've seen the same. I'm, I'm, I, that's why I'm saying this, trying to bring everyone together to try and understand where we are is very, very important. So we want to share policy, we want to share with policymakers the evidence and the pertinent issues that affect private sector development, and even how digitalization is actually affecting uh, or is becoming a disruptive in terms of the way we do things and the way we fisherize things. For me, it's actually trying to wake up and say, by the way, it can be efficient. The other day I was talking about markets, and uh, the way markets themselves, once they are well governed, they can actually affect productivity downstream, and they're going to increase incomes upstream. And all of a sudden, Nobody was seeing it that way. But we have to, uh, to, to prevent, uh, or we have to work out what prevents markets from functioning the way they're supposed to function. And the second thing is, we want to show, we're, we're, is to actually to showcase the frontier knowledge and evidence from country case studies. And I'm sure there are some countries that have gone forward. I think, Abebe, we also have this uh, financial inclusion and market development. And what we wanted to show is that, actually, you just don't want to stop at financial inclusion. You want to push market the frontiers of market development, because that's where we are going. Markets must produce products or must generate or develop products that are going to be important in terms of how they serve. They are disruptive in nature, but they are beneficial in the long run. And this is what we want to show. And we also want to make sure that we have some policy dialogue with policy stakeholders. One of them is knowledge enhancement, and the other one is actually to make sure that we have evidence in terms of how the economic is working with digitalization, and that can also be fed into policy making processes. I always start, whenever I talk, I always start with institutions because I do believe that an institutional failure problem will be a policy failure problem. 
So why we are not getting where we are in Nigeria? Because there is an institution of area problem. I failed to understand. I was reading my friend Stephen Dacon's book, and was showing that uh, poverty has become rampant in Nigeria. And why is what is the problem? We can map out that in any country that you go. When you see poverty, or even what people call corruption, you know there is an institution of area problem. But anyway, we wanted to showcase, and that for us is very very important. And um, I've said more than I was supposed to say, but in East Africa we say Asante Sana, but it actually means uh, thank you very much. That article that I showed in Brookings that was actually published in 2017 became a hit. By the way, I was asked to, I was requested that it should be translated in French. It's good for our Francophone Africa. And then after some time, then he told me, can we translate it in Spain? I said, in Spanish, I said, it's fine. So it is because it is good for the the gatekeepers, the, 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 the institutional readers, they are the gatekeepers. If you have a hostile gatekeeper, you cannot enter the room, isn't it? And that is where the problem starts, because an institution, institution of area problem starts there. So thank you very much, and I beg pardon for not being there in the morning. Actually, we had agreed in, uh, with the scholar that I would uh, open in the, at 8 o'clock. So I slept with, my, with a focus to my agenda, and then I was reorganizing all the other things. I found myself in the, at, in the office at 6.30 uh, 6 thinking that I will rush at 8 then cover other things. But then other things came and engulfed me. But uh, Kenya is in a, uh, what I call a, press, in a transition. And obviously everybody is required to support in terms of what's likely to happen. Any knowledge base is going to be very important. So some of us uh, have to offer some time and offer, offer some time for ARC. But together, I know ARC will come in and over most of the time. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope initially I was supposed to say this meeting is officially open, but I've already been overtaken by time. The best thing is to say, let's good luck with the, the rest of the activities. And I'm sure I'm going to, we are, we are not, we, this is not the end thing. We are going to continue in this space because until policies are working, we cannot rest. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Yeah, I think this is even better. You know, it's inspiring after the lunch and uh, long uh, morning. So thank you so much, uh, Jimuna. Uh, so, Scholar, what Later, is... Ah, okay, why don't you read? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a, a special request uh, with one of the presenter, Lucas Braboski. He'd like to present the paper. Uh, he was supposed to present at three, but we can bring him early because he's catching a flight. So I hope the audience obliged. And the, the chair for that session is uh, Rosemary, Professor Rosemary. Then Elda will come in. Thank you. The last presenter of the day, Lucas, is presenting, uh, is now, is online and is presenting from South Africa. Hello, okay. everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so um, I think uh, then we can be ready to welcome the next presenter. And according to the agenda, uh, the paper is um, Impacts of Dis Disruptive Technologies in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So Professor Lucas, you are welcome. You have 15 minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm just checking, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Lucas, we can. Okay, great. I will share my screen then. Um, just one second. Can you also see the screen? Yes, we can. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for inviting me to write this uh, research report, as well as my apologies that I cannot be there in person. 
also I'm actually right now at the airport because of delayed flights. So so I asked to push my presentation forward and my flight is in one hour from now. My apologies for this, maybe there's some background noise, but I hope that the presentation will go smoothly. So I would like to present a research project on which we have been working since some time. Uh, the title of it is Impact of Disruptive Technologies in South Africa. And in particular, the connecting point of the papers that I will discuss is mobile telecommunication services. So I think that mobile telecommunication services are really the, the key technology that changed uh, lots of play fields in the last year. So not only for consumers, but also for many industries with all the new products that are available. And especially in African countries where there's no other alternative technology. Um, so just to start with motivation for, for this research papers that I will present. So first of all, there's a shortage of research on how people in African countries use mobile phones and internet to access different mobile services. And consequently, how this impact the well-being of, of people as well as functioning markets. And this is largely due to the fact that there is no data easily available that would be like individual level information. Uh, there's some data that is collected. It's usually very expensive. But as I said, it's limited and uh, the, it's also hasn't been collected with uh, research question in mind that are meant to deal with the issue of disruptive technology. So we have to rely on what is available there. Just to say that African countries are not only a place where data is limited, it's also limited in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, the issue here is that uh, obviously, it's, as I said, it's costly, it takes time to collect such, such data in case of data available from firms. Teams do not want to collaborate in providing such information, so we have to really rely on, on surveys. At the same time, uh, in European countries, some of the issues I will discuss are maybe less of a problem. Uh, therefore, it's even more important to collect such information in African countries. So let me say what, what I will discuss uh, here in these three papers that I mentioned. So first of all, we would like to look into the question of what are the barriers of adoption of smartphones and mobile internet services in African countries. Second, uh, once people use mobile phones, we would like to uh, understand to what extent mobile phones enable use of financial services to send, receive, and save mobile money. And third, we would like to understand to what extent mobile phones enable people to maintain, find jobs, and participate in labor markets. So these are all very selective questions, but first, because of the data that is available, some questions cannot be others. So once we have some data that was collected, not mainly for the purpose of addressing these questions, then we have to find a question that can be addressed using uh, such information. Nevertheless, so let me start with these three, three projects. And I will not discuss this in detail. Uh, the, the three accompanying papers that uh, have all the estimation information as well as models that are being used. I will here just focus on the main idea as well as on the main results. So first of all, with respect to the question of smartphones and digital divide, um, it is an important uh, social economic question and problem that was already raised uh, earlier today, that there are uh, substantial uh, differences between rural and, and urban areas, as well as poor and rich people in terms of access to internet technologies. And this widens the gap further. Uh, the problem is more severe in African countries, in South Africa, maybe less, but there the problem is that there has been some fixed line uh, infrastructure available. So some people have access to it, mainly uh, those who are privileged in the previous system. Uh, some are uh, disadvantaged in other African countries. It's all about uh, urban versus rural, rural areas, depending on the geography of the country and so on. So there's substantial differences across the country and uh, mobile telecommunications can mit mitigate to some extent these problems. Uh, it's cheaper to deploy, um, uh, also with each uh, stage, which technology, 3G, 4G, 5G, it also becomes more efficient in terms of what can, can be done with it, and so on. So the question that we try to ask here is to what extent factors such as network coverage in first place, affordability of smartphones and mobile devices, so the prices of smartphones, and the cost of mobile data uh, play a role in adoption of uh, smartphones. And uh, we use a very detailed data that actually comes from one of the firms in South Africa that covers period between 2016 and 2018. We estimate a series of discrete choice models. I will not go into details of this. 
where we also consider that when people make decisions uh, which uh, device to adopt, uh, they, they may be forward looking. So the issue here is that as with many durable goods, people may be myopic, they just see something decide based on quality and price or in case of technology, they may postpone the decisions if they think the prices will go down. So this is also a bit academic exercise to, to develop a model like this. So, so we allow for dynamics in the model. And as I said, we estimate series of models where we exactly try to answer the question that I, that I raised before, to what extent coverage, prices of smartphones, uh, cost of data, impact adoption of smartphones. And what we find is the following. So it, it, the paper is finalized, but obviously it needs to go through another series of revision. We find that what matters most is coverage. So we find that um, based on our data, we've co conducted some counterfactual simulations where we cover the whole country artificially uh, by LTE technology, then adoption of smartphones among poorest uh, members of the population would increase from 57% now, which is still very high as you see, to 76%. Uh, in case of richer population, this adoption would be marginal increase from 81% uh, to 82%. So we are able in the study to look at different segments of society, knowing uh, the wealth of people, and we are able to simulate to what extent uh, increasing coverage in different areas would uh, stimulate adoption of smartphones. When we look at uh, the impact of prices uh, of smartphones, this is su surprisingly to us rather small. So we find that, for instance, why we cannot artificially decrease prices of smartphones, but for instance, if we would allow a policy that wouldn't put any VAT tax on smartphones, uh, so it would be like a drop in prices by about 15%, and we see that this increase in adoption of smartphones among poorest people would be rather small, basically from 57.1 to 57.7. In case of uh, richer population, so is this typo here, this would be also marginal from 81.1 to 81.7%. So the bottom line of uh, what we find is that what matters most is actually coverage by uh, LTE technology or uh, whichever technology comes next. Uh, this is what matters for adoption of smartphones. It seems that uh, people are willing to pay whatever prices they have to pay for smartphones and uh, say dropping prices of smartphones by 10 to 20% wouldn't be such a big uh, game changer. So we also can say that actually there are no dynamic effects in, in the setup. People are really uh, buying smartphones like a commodity they need it, they buy it. And as I said, even poorest people are willing to accept uh, paying higher prices because they have to. So this is the first uh, study that we conducted. The second st study now looks into use of mobile money and financial services. And in this case, we use uh, the database that was already mentioned by Isaac. Uh, research ICT Africa data, and it covers number of sub-Saharan African countries. So we don't focus on South Africa because all the countries are there. There's more variation uh, between countries. So it's nice to identify the effect. And what we look here at are two things. So one, which is similar to the previous study, to what extent uh, coverage by uh, infrastructure uh, incentivizes adoption of smartphones. And second, once people adopt smartphones, to what extent uh, distance to physical infrastructure impacts use of the services like financial services, mobile money services. The advantage of this data is that, um, which was also the case of the previous data, that we know the geolocation of people. So we know where they exactly live. There is also publicly available database of uh, different infrastructure that are available in Africa and other countries, things such as distances to roads, to, to uh, banks, to ATM, to uh, to, to different towers of different networks. So we can compute the distances between where people live and how far it is to this physical infrastructure. And as I said, we estimate the impact of, of this distance on uh, adoption of uh, smartphones and then in the next stage on the usage of financial services. What we find is this, the following. So it's similar to some extent to what I said before, that what matters for adoption of smartphones is the distance to physical infrastructure in terms of antennas. So if people live very close to antennas, they have good coverage, we observe much higher adoption of smartphones than in areas which are not covered. Second, when we look at uh, the use of uh, financial services and mobile money and the distance to uh, physical infrastructure such as ATM, banks, then we see that people who live close to ATM and banks, they tend to use less uh, mobile money. So there's substitution between physical and uh, digital financial services. But obviously, once people live far away, they start using more uh, mobile money, 
which means that uh, this technology enables people who don't have good access to physical infrastructure to have access to this uh, services. So there's indeed financial inclusion resulting from this newer services that are available due to uh, telecommunication technologies. We also find that uh, in terms of who sends money where, that people who live in uh, poorer areas, they generally receive more money than send. So they do not send money, they rather receive money. So mobile financial services also help to reduce inequality across regions where money flows from richer to poorer regions. So these are the development, the important impacts of, uh, uh, say, infrastructure that incentivizes the adoption of smartphones, second, use of financial services, and so on. And finally, the third paper uh, looks into uh, labor market in South Africa, where uh, in South Africa, well, the problem also exists in other countries is, is that there's a special distribution of supply and labor that is not efficient and results from the historical uh, system, uh, system of apartheid, where people are relocated in different places. Uh, and this doesn't match the demand for supply and, and uh, demand of labor. Uh, so this is one thing that the location of where people are and where the jobs are. And second, uh, which is obvious that uh, people living in, in poor, uh, far away areas, they don't have good access to information about possible jobs. Obviously, access to information such as internet, mobile phones, first enables to find such information, but also people can be contacted if job opportunities arise. So this is, in a way, the motivation for looking at the impact of uh, cell phones on uh, labor market. And here we use a very detailed labor market survey that has been conducted in South Africa since uh, uh, almost 15 years. Uh, the data spans over 2009 to 2017. It tracks the same households over time. So we have information about uh, what do they have at home? So including uh, say internet or, or smartphones, uh, as well as uh, whether they were employed or not. So we can look at the dynamics of employment and the dynamics of adoption of technologies. And what we conclude is that uh, say in, the, in the group of people who are unemployed, when people are unemployed, those who have cell phones, it's easier for them to get employment than those who do not have cell phones. In, in that sense, we argue that um, uh, possession of smart, uh, cell phones or technology enables people to switch employment status from unemployed to unemployed. At the same time, we do not have find similar effect for computer ownership, which is uh, surprising. So people who have computers, it's, it's not that they become more likely to be employable. Um, and when we look at uh, the possibility of losing employment, so we also observe people who were employed and over time they become unemployed. Uh, those who have uh, computers and cell phones, they, they, it, they have smaller likelihood of becoming unemployed. So technology, say computers, as in our paper to a lesser extent, but cell phones do really impact the chances of people finding employment as well as the chances of maintaining employment. So this is, these are the three papers that I wanted to discuss within this 15 minutes. And let me just very quickly summarize uh, the general finding. So first of all, there's substantial digital divide between geographic areas as well as rich and poor people, South Africa and other African countries as we know. And this can be reduced, as our papers argue, by development of mobile network infrastructure. So it's very important that, as was already said in, our, in the previous speech, as well as earlier uh, during the day, it's very important that this infrastructure is in place. Once it is in place, people are, will adopt uh, smartphones and they will adopt the services that benefit their economic and social activities. So giving infrastructure to people and letting them decide what's best for them is critically important. Uh, on the other hand, we do not find surprisingly that say things such as prices of devices really matter, but maybe it's the case people are really willing to adopt technologies and whatever price they are. Furthermore, once people adopt technologies, then they will they might use financial services and they have stronger incentives to use them if they do not have access to physical infrastructure. So financial mobile services replace lack of accessibility of uh, physical infrastructure. Moreover, we observe that there will be more transfers from uh, richer to poorer areas, so, which leads to some reduction in income inequality. So infrastructure can also contribute to reduction of income inequality. Finally, uh, we argue that access to mobile phones does really enable people to find employment, as well as reduces chances of becoming unemployed. 
And this is even more so than access to computers, at least at, least at this point of time. Thank you very much. I, I think I'm just within 16 minutes. Um, again, thank you much for the possibility to present this research, and I'm open to any questions. Straight to the discussant. I think I cannot hear the question. Sorry. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Alors, comme le professeur est prêt à aller à l'essence. OK. Yeah, Parce que je, transfère, je transférerai le temps. OK. You have uh, Alors, 10 minutes for the discussion. Um, that is Professor Mbai. So you can go ahead if you can hear me. Merci beaucoup. Alors, l'auteur a abordé une problématique, d'abord l'adoption des plateformes parmi les individus ayant différents niveaux de revenus. Ensuite, les effets de la proximité des infrastructures de réseaux de vie et des établissements bancaires sur la distribution, sur la décision plutôt d'adopter un téléphone mobile et d'utiliser le service d'argent mobile. Et enfin, l'impact de la possession d'un téléphone capable d'utiliser des statuts professionnels et des ménages. Alors, ce que je trouve excellent dans ce travail, c'est la précision des résultats qui sont trouvés et leur utilité aussi. Au niveau de chaque problème, l'auteur a trouvé des, des solutions, a proposé des solutions pour la mise en œuvre de politique économique. Alors, euh, peut-être que je ne vais pas insister sur euh, un résultat, j'ai déjà fait mes techniques, mais euh, je vais juste un D'abord, euh, au niveau de la réduction des coûts de recherche d'emploi, qui est des outils de téléphone mobile. Ça, c'est important. Et l'auteur propose de développer des politiques pour leur adoption. Et comme, euh, comme par exemple, l'extension les prix abordables. Alors, à ce niveau-là, deux questions à relever. D'abord, cette proposition implique une collaboration entre l'État et les publics, notamment à des projets communs de partenariat de transparence de l'emploi, d'information et sur le patrimoine. Ensuite, euh, la concurrence entre les fournisseurs d'accès à l'internet est Et il s'agit là d'aider des monopoles qui pourraient amener ces emplois en plus de trop de secours. Euh, dans tous les cas, il y a un coût de mise en œuvre qui est préconisé. Et un État doit éviter de faire ce qu'on fait par les coûts. Alors, c'est pourquoi je pense que nous devons changer ces réflexions dans le sens du financement de ces politiques et du rôle distorsif des interventions de l'État. Par exemple, est-ce que les subventions accordées aux entreprises de territoire seront tirés d'une augmentation de la prestation des emplois dans le pays. Maintenant, il y a des considérations méthodologiques. Je que juste, on sait déjà bien. Peut-être, c'est souvent ce que je peux dire. C'est que, parfois, on peut faire des choix méthodologiques. Euh, on s'attend à ce qu'il est justifié. Mais parfois, c'est ça qui manque. Et bien aussi, il trouve des alternatives méthodologiques qui expliquent pourquoi il préfère tel ou tel choix. Et par exemple, la fonction d'utilité indirecte posée, mais qui n'est pas justifiée dans la passion du texte. Voilà, Madame la Présidente, en résumé, comme il est un peu près.
Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambai, uh, for that uh, very clear discussion of the paper. Uh, I think before we go to the, back to the presenter, maybe if we have uh, um, inputs from the audience, from the floor, we can take uh, the comments, observations. Yes, there are. Price reduction for smartphone is enough to have an effect on low income households. Uh, that's the question uh, for Lucas. So, so that's the online. Any questions on the audience with us here? Okay, it seems we don't have any, so we'll go back to the presenter. Professor Lucas, are you there? You can address the, the issues raised by the, the that question and also the discussant. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my apologies. My French is not uh, that good. Uh, so maybe I didn't fully understand uh, some of the question. I tried to listen to translation. But nevertheless, uh, in terms of the uh, metals that, that we use, so I'd like to say two things. So first, obviously, uh, these are academic studies. Uh, we, we'd like the studies to be published in uh, academic papers. So uh, we try to uh, follow, in a way, state-of-the-art econometric methods when doing uh, the studies. Uh, some of these methods may be, uh, in a way, complicated for policymakers. Uh, say, for instance, maybe it wasn't necessary to estimate, as we call it, dynamic model of uh, adoption of smartphones, which actually we showed that maybe it's not necessary. But um, you know, the choice of the methods is driven by by these two things. So first, uh, we try to model to the best in the best way possible the behavior of people. So all these three studies they use uh, individual level information. We, uh, we, we're looking at the behavior of people, uh, and these are the methods that are generally used for this. Uh, it might be simple to produce some statistics, look, look at statistics which I actually haven't shown, uh, but nevertheless, when it comes to so, so academic scrutiny, uh, there's no other way around. We have to uh, put the data into some framework and let uh, the framework together with data tell us something interesting. Second, there's, as I already said, there's limitation because this data that, that is there has been collected for other questions. So the needs survey that I mentioned for South Africa wasn't collected to study question of how technology impacts uh, labor markets. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have the question that we would be very interested to have to uh, address this in, in more extent. On the other hand, uh, the survey by ICT Research Africa uh, also has its limitation uh, in the sense that there's no detailed information about uh, particular products that people use. Uh, this kind of information is available uh, to the firms. Firms know what their customers do, what, what kind of cell phones they use, uh, how much data they use, and so on. Uh, this is what we also used in the first paper, but uh, firms are generally not willing to share this kind of information with researchers, not to mention regulators, because they are afraid that there'll be some regulations put in place that are against the interest. So if I answer, I hope that I answer the question. So we are in a way combining the state of art methods with what is available there as data to address some interesting questions. Second, uh, I didn't fully understand the question on smartphones, so I can answer the way I understood it. So, I, so there was a question related to whether the price of smartphones doesn't impact adoption among poor households. And if I understand this correctly, so our conclusion is that it doesn't. And I must say, I am also surprised by this. Uh, we would like to find that uh, price of smartphones does impact adoption by poor households, so that poor households, if they get a subsidy or discount or 10, 15% or more, that they would adopt smartphones. But, um, but this is also in combination because poorer households, they, they live in areas which are not covered by networks. So even if they got the smartphone, then what they would do with it. Uh, so these two things come, these two, uh, these two policies of giving uh, subsidies is not by itself sufficient if you cannot really use uh, smartphones. So these things must come together, uh, developing infrastructure, 
and once infrastructure is developed, then maybe give them subsidies faster. And actually, this is a question that we can ask, and we should. So thank you for this comment. We can combine these two policies together and see whether this impact is stronger. Thank you very much for the discussion and the questions. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Them. And uh, thank you also the discussion. So following in the tradition that was started in the morning, maybe we can give them some applause and to just to acknowledge their efforts. <laughs> okay, yeah, so thank you very much. I think uh, now we can go back to the first presentation, the one uh, which was um, postponed. Is that the one by El uh, Elder? Elder. Uh, Boaz, uh, Boniface, uh, John, and Violet. I hope they are available and ready. So the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. We are waiting for the presentation to be put up. Yeah, they're waiting for the presentation to be uploaded. Okay, I think it's on now. Thank you. Uh, the presentation we are about to make focuses on disruptive technologies, agricultural productivity, and economic performance in Kenya. This was the case uh, for Kenya. And the first question we ask is why the disruptive technologies? Uh, from the morning, we've heard what constitutes disruptive technologies. And these are innovations that make substantial change in the way consumers, industries, and businesses operate. The first thing that disruptive technologies do is they are superior. They can affect farms by making them either emerge and produce more and new products or improve productivity and expand economic activities and hence performance. So in this paper, we focused on the second part, and that's why we are focusing on agriculture in terms of its productivity and hence its impact on economic performance of the country. We know that in Kenya for the last three decades, there has been major investments in technology and innovation and ICT is one of the sectors that is expanding quite fast, constituting around 8% of the GDP. 
We have the digital economy blueprint, which has five pillars. The first one being the digital government uh, provisions. We have the digital businesses, and that's where e-commerce is categorized. Infrastructure expansion, innovations also in uh, uh, skills, as well as in innovations that drive various entrepreneurship activities. Uh, we have under infrastructure of major um, investments, which include uh, the SICOM, the TIMS, the EC, and also the LIONS, uh, fiber optic cables. And this have enabled the country open up when it comes to access to technology and also access to uh, the various services and infrastructure that we require for uh, disruptive technology up uptake. In the case of um, agriculture, we know that in Kenya, Agriculture constitutes around 26% of uh, our gross domestic product, but much of it is from the smallholder farmers who are in the rural areas. And hence, when it comes to uptake of uh, disruptive technologies, they have potential of improving the inputs and also the outputs. Agriculture also uh, is characterized by a number of disparities, particularly when it comes to access to markets and information. We also have issues to do with climate change and hence the need for uh, uptake of uh, disruptive technology innovations. And here we are talking of um, applications that are coming up in the space of agriculture uh, relating to uh, for instance, data, we also have uh, uptake when it comes to uh, the farm inputs that the various farmers uh, use, and also this requires high level skills and also ICT technology. So this work then endeavored to look at where are we in terms of um, the uptake of uh, technology in agriculture, and here we are looking at um, the nature of uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, we then look at the factors that affect the uptake and also the performance, as well as productivity in agriculture. Uh, we go further to look at the enabling environment in agriculture and what Kenya can do to uh, benefit from uh, the use of disruptive technologies in the sector of agriculture. This chart gives us the nature of disruptive technologies. That's as per the first objective. And the various uh, forms of uh, disruptive technologies in agriculture include uh, crowd computing, automating businesses, internet of things, financial technology, adoption of uh, specific inputs, which will be our major focus, as well as the modern irrigation uh, frameworks and systems. We also have um, data, big data management, and this is where Kenya has also invested a lot. And in the area of agriculture, even in small scale farms, the farmers are able to uptake various innovations, uh, such as the Digi Farm, the M Farm, the Sun Culture, the Solar Freeze, uh, the I Procure, the Was Up, and also the Twiga foods where the farmers and also the producers are able to enhance their supply chain and also provide 
uh, mechanisms for distribution. This work used um, uh, two models. The first model is the one on agricultural production. Another one is on economic performance, where we are able to estimate the impact of uh, various forms of disruptive technologies on agricultural productivity and thereafter on economic performance. We use the growth model. Sorry, there. And from the output model, we have various inputs. And these inputs are used to proxy for uptake of uh, uh, innovative uh, mechanisms when it comes to production, and also the uh, proxy for technology when it comes to economic performance. Uh, for the output model, we use use of fertilizers, use of um, certified seed, manufactured feed for livestock, and also the capabilities when it comes to education. For the model for growth, we use macro level data where we have uh, the gross domestic domestic product as our uh, outcome, and we measure the impact or the effect of um, uh, the volumes of transactions that are operated using uh, the mobile uh, applications and also the mobile payments as well as internet access while controlling for other factors in the growth model, including access to credit and also uh, the private sector parameters. Uh, the data we've used comes from various sources, both from the national uh, sources and also from the household level for the uh, productivity in agriculture sector model. The outputs and also the results are as follows. We have an observation whereby use of fertilizer was found to have a significant and positive impact when it comes to agricultural productivity. The use of certified seed and also manufactured feed. What this then means is that for farmers, who are able to adopt to the disruptive technologies as proxied by the various inputs as I've indicated, they are able to also have their productivity uh, being higher than for those who have not used the various inputs. At the same time, given that majority of the farmers are smallholder farmers, then innovations, including the use of the various inputs like certified seed, uh, could have potential for improving their productivity. When it comes to the economic performance model, the use of mobile transactions, particularly through the M-PESA, and also the internet access and education were found to have positive and significant effect while controlling for other factors as well as internet access. Which then uh, brings us to the point of trying to understand, uh, given that in the agricultural productivity and economic performance uh, models, uh, there is a positive impact that comes from the use of uh, various proxies for disruptive technologies in the sector, we ask where do then farmers obtain the various inputs from? And we found that for fertilizer, for instance, much of it is from the uh, government subsidies 
and from the government subsidies, it is possible then to improve agricultural productivity if farmers are supported, given that most of them face various challenges when it comes to uh, climate change, drought and floods. They could be supported through the uh, innovative uh, use of uh, the various applications and uh, inputs to improve their productivity. Uh, when it comes to seed, most of the farmers who are using certified seed at around 89%, and this has a positive impact, and hence, if most farmers are supported to use certified seed, then that will also improve uh, in terms of their productivity. Uh, when it comes to the enabling uh, environment factors, uh, the team was able to link various parameters starting from access to infrastructure to uh, the various outcome indicators such as um, the product, the output per county. And here, uh, the first indication is that as much as the country has higher uptake in terms of um, use of internet and also the access to internet, there are counties that have been left behind and these counties will need to be supported when it comes to access to internet connectivity and also access to electricity. When it comes to opportunities of um, use of capacities, and here we are linking uh, the connection between uh, the various counties and also uh, the inputs. And here we are looking at education, for instance, uh, the capabilities tend to fail across the counties. We have counties where their levels of education are higher compared to others. And for these counties where the level of education is higher, uh, they are able to also uptake when it comes to access to internet and also access to other disruptive technology applications. Uh, we also tried to look at the link between uh, the years of schooling and access to university education. Uh, there are major disparities where counties like Nairobi, uh, the counties uh, like Nyeri the, in the central region, they have higher levels of um, uh, per capita and also higher levels of education, which then has implication on the uptake of disruptive technologies. Those counties have higher level of uptake compared to counties in the northern part uh, where the uptake is low and also their education attainment is uh, relatively low. Another indication is that when it comes to education, over 42 percent of the population have only attained primary education, and there is a major move to having a higher access to secondary education, where we have a 100 percent transition, and that will also improve on education as being one of the capability parameters when it comes to uptake of uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, counties that are doing much better off in terms of average years of schooling rate to uh, Nairobi, Mombasa, but we have counties like Mandera, Kwale, Wachia, where the years of schooling are less than six years, which then means um, need to look at how the uh, capabilities can be enhanced for them to uptake in uh, the various innovations in productivity of agriculture and uh, also uh, in disruptive technologies, irrigation, use of mobile te telephone, uh, higher education, and also reducing the digital divide. When it comes to policy implications on 
ICT, the first entry point will be the area of uh, NA+. Plus. And here we are talking of ICT infrastructure because it's one thing to have the heavy infrastructure like uh, we have had the fiber optic cables uh, compared to what we have in counties which we think uh, they might be left behind if we look at the digital divide, then it will be important to see how equitable is infrastructure for disruptive technologies for that to improve um, agricultural productivity in those areas. Another area is in skills development, supporting private public sector partnerships, particularly in skills development. Uh, looking at the legal and policy frameworks, going further to have supportive uh, online uh, learning because if we have low levels of attainment in some areas where the uptake is uh, low in terms of uh, disruptive technologies, then one option is to enhance the skills for the youth in those areas so that they are able to use the same in agriculture. Uh, communities of practice will also be important. And when it comes to uh, the critical aspects for the northern part where we've seen the counties seem to have lower access to uh, the parameters that affect the uh, uptake of disruptive technologies, then the first entry point will be um, having skills uh, making sure that there is uh, higher use of fertilizers and as well as uh, irrigation. And here we also have uh, livestock where we look at issues of um, extension services. Another area is to do with um, uh, promoting modern farming technologies and use of the applications and finery areas of um, awareness among farmers because earlier on as we found uh, education seems to play a key role for improving uh, productivity in the agricultural sector and also in the uptake of uh, disruptive technologies. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that presentation and also for keeping to time just uh, overriding by one minute or two. So I think we go straight to the discussant, and the discussant is uh, Dr. Jacob Omolo. You have 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I think uh, to me, the paper is coming at uh, a very appropriate time, particularly for us in Kenya, where we are almost at the point of finalizing our fourth medium term plan and the counties are actually working on their county integrated development plans. So it means that uh, the synthesis from this paper in my view can uh, effectively be integrated into the national policy framework but also at the county level. In the interest of time I will mention uh, just a few things that one, uh, the study is actually contextualized on the basis which is true that uh, agriculture plays a critical role in uh, promoting employment, income generation, and livelihoods. That is actually very important uh, for us and that we have relatively low levels of agricultural productivity, uh, thereby leading to uh, yield gaps. And so the question is, what is the place of disruptive uh, technologies in uh, promoting agricultural productivity and economic performance? Uh, the, 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 the background, in my view, is uh, well laid out in terms of uh, uh, the status, uh, the methodology is also well laid out, uh, but just uh, some reflection based on certain findings and also my focus here would be on the policy insertions. Uh, it's been stated here correctly 
that use of fertilizer, uh, satisfied, uh, certified seeds and manufactured feeds increases agricultural productivity. Uh, yes, that is, that is fine. But somebody may also want to raise an issue that farmers are already using fertilizers. We already have uh, uh, people using certified seeds. So the issue here is that in the context of policy, what do we establish that will make the farmers to deepen the use of fertilizers, certified seeds, and all these other innovations that we talk about? Because they must see uh, something, something different. And I agree with the uh, elder and the team when they said that the issue of awareness is critical in technological adoption, but more importantly, accessibility, affordability, and capacity issues do constrain uh, farmers. So then, uh, uh, maybe it was uh, out of the scope of the paper, but then, in respect to policy, uh, I would have loved to see what government at the national level, at the county level, and other non-state actors can do in order to address uh, problems of awareness, as you have said, accessibility, affordability, and capacity. But there is also the issue that consideration uh, has been made as if farmers are homogeneous. In agriculture, we have different categories. We have smallholders, we have uh, uh, peasants, we also have medium-sized and large-scale uh, farmers. Do they have differential uh, uptake? And if there is differential uptake, which aspect is unique to which group? So that in terms of policy intervention, then we can talk about targeted uh, policy direction. Uh, maybe for uh, another discussion, but in one of the findings, it was indicated that use of fuel power and crop chemicals reduces agricultural productivity. Uh, first of all, just an explanation of what could lead to this, but more importantly, what is the pol policy implication? Because in respect to policy, we find that uh, there are farmers who are already using uh, fuel power, uh, chemicals, uh, crop chemicals. So if indeed it reduces agricultural productivity, then in respect to policy, what do we advise? Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, if it could, the paper could also find a way of uh, bringing out that issue of uh, uh, differential uptake of disruptive technologies between small and uh, smallholder and large-scale farmers, it would be critical in my view, given that, as mentioned in the background, much of agricultural GDP is attributed to smallholder farmers. And then uh, we also need to come up with, uh, to identify the binding constraints that different categories of actors in the sector face in uh, adopting the use of disruptive uh, technologies. And of course, if we were to do, because a number of policy options have been given, but uh, would, we, would it be appropriate for us to see how this should be sequenced? For example, if we were to cover the aspect of awareness, accessibility, affordability, and capability, can we implement them as a package or there is an appropriate sequencing mechanism? Uh, I also thought 
that uh, as much as we have uh, mentioned a lot of, uh, uh, a number of uh, correlation analysis has been done, but uh, what, in my view, would have been more interesting from the correlation analysis and the results thereof is to bring out the implications of those particular relationships and also to find out if counties have the same potential because you've also done the county analysis but what I, I missed are if the counties have the same potentials and if they are different potentials and capabilities then what could be the core disruptive technologies required by the counties uh, so as to help us get uh, targeted policy interventions. Then finally, uh, I just want to encourage that uh, for uh, effective uptake of uh, the research output, I would suggest that the policy impl implications as brought out be more targeted and particularly by asking the how question. I give an example uh, where you say that the government uh, through the Ministry of Livestock and uh, Agriculture and Livestock uh, should offer sustainable extension services. So then the question is how? Because I'm imagining if uh, we take this to the Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture, we take this to the Principal Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture, the issue would be how? Because as we are aware, uh, we have low extension services because of shortage in uh, human resources for agriculture, but we also have inadequate budgetary provision. So then the question is, what are uh, some of the possible options? Do we do commodity-based extension? Do we provide extension as a commercial service or do we localize extension so that it is client-based or cli uh, client-controlled? Uh, Chair, in the interest of time, I want to stop at that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, discussion, Dr. Jacob, for that. I think you have raised some very uh, critical and useful uh, observations. So I would again open it up to the floor if there are any additional um, inputs, questions, clarifications before we take it back to the presenters. Uh, yes, uh, Lema. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I just have two comments. Uh, number one, on the regression equation, uh, the first regression equation, I think uh, there, is, there could be misspecification because the the components of the, the production function like labor or capital indicator are not there. So, you know, don't do something about it. The second one, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the dependent variable is. What, what was it? the second regression? It, assuming it is agricultural output, uh, the ne you, you found a negative statistically significant coefficient <laughs> for internet, the internet. How, how do you explain that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lema. Uh, any other question? Okay, so then we can take it back to the presenter, uh, Dr. Elder. You can um, comment on the observations. I don't think you have to answer everything, but you can just uh, comment on the ones that you can. Thank you, back to you. Okay, thank you. I also wish to acknowledge the comments on the contribution this paper can make in the Kenyan policy space, particularly uh, in the various planning processes that are going on. And that gives us a challenge to then move faster to have uh, the policy briefs that the discussants has proposed so that we are able to inform the various targeted stakeholders and also the two levels of government because 
the paper looks and at the two levels and also the analysis uh, covers the two levels, particularly the county level. Uh, the question on what comes first when it comes to recommendations and uh, also the fact that um, uh, work has been going on when it comes to extension services, but then uh, we need to look at um, where do we start. Uh, that, I think, um, points us to uh, going deeper in the policy brief to give some targeted indications on what can be done at the county levels on awareness, on capacities. But when it comes to costs, and this is where affordability comes in, then we ask ourselves what can we do at that higher level to ensure that uh, all the, most of the uh, local communities have access to these applications and also to the enablers that we are talking about, like internet, electricity, among others. Then the next set of um, uh, questions, uh, we look at the uh, level of uh, specification and also try to address that uh, if uh, there's any gap that maybe we left out. Uh, there are some variables that we, int we introduced as uh, controls, but we have not uh, brought them up in the results. We'll also bring them up so that uh, there's no indication of any variable that is left out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Edda, and your team. Uh, so I think, uh, again, we just acknowledge the presenters <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the discussants. Thank you very much, and of course, the, the, the participants. So if I'm, uh, unless I'm otherwise guided, I think we move on to the next presentation, uh, which is on digital technology, adoption, uh, productivity and employment dynamics in the manufacturing services in Senegal. And this is by Tierno Malik Diallo, uh, yeah, Sambo Andre Dumas and the former Kamya ben Benjamin. So I think you have the floor. I don't know whether you are, yeah, so you are physically present. You have 15 minutes to present, so okay. welcome. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Malik Diallo from Senegal. It's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about our research paper entitled Impact of Digital Technology Adoption on Employment in Senegal. So we have changed the title a, a little bit. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank AERC for giving us the opportunity to work on the topic of disruptive technologies. And Senegal is 
an interesting case study because the government has been doing a lot recently to make the, the ICT sector more dynamic. But because of the lack of data, we still don't have much evidence on how ICT is affecting the economy, especially the labor market outcomes. Uh, so in our paper, we try to look at this issue by investigating the effect of digital technology adoption on participation in public employment programs and access to employment and on employment dynamics across industries. So we did this based on a set of empirical models and what we find is, and, and what we find is adopters of digital technologies And what we find is adopters of digital, of, uh, adopters of uh, digital technologies tend to participate more in public employment programs and are more likely to use, and are more likely to continue active job search. But, but the use of technologies has no impact on their unemployment duration. We also find that the use of the use of technologies ha have a positive and significant impact on both the share of skilled and unskilled employment. Now to go into more detail, first I will talk about the motivation and the objectives of the paper. Then I will describe the data sources and the empirical framework. And finally, I will, I will, I will present the findings. Uh, so let me talk about briefly the motivation of our paper. Over the past years, the government of Senegal has been doing a lot to make the economy more, more digital. In 2014, the country has initiated a new, a new, a new development master plan which aims to make Senegal an emerging economy by 2035, making the ICT sector a powerful economic engine. In 2016, the country has also taken steps to, to develop the ICT sector by adopting the, by adopting the digital Senegal strategy 2025. And the target here is to increase digital up to 10% of the country's GDP and to, and to create 35,000 direct jobs in the ICT sectors. As a result, the country is now characterized by a widespread use of technologies. Now more than half of the population have access to the internet and the country ranks 14th in Africa and among the top in West Africa in terms of network readiness. The country has also one of the highest smartphone adoption rate in West Africa, and Senegal alongside with Kenya uh, is, considered, uh, is considered as uh, one of the continent's leaders in terms of the contribution of the internet to GDP. So we can see from this background that technologies have a great potential in terms of employment in Senegal, but we still don't have specific evidence on how technologies are affecting th the, the labor market. Mm -hmm. So in our paper, we try to look at this issue by investigating the effect of digital technology adoption among job seekers and enterprises in the manufacturing, trade, and service sectors. Uh, we have two objectives. The first one is to estimate the effect of digital technology adoption on participation in public employment programs and access to employment. And the second one is to estimate the effect of digital technology adoption on employment dynamics in the manufacturing, trade, and service sectors. To implement our study, we use two data sources. For the first objective, we used a labor force survey conducted in 2018 in Senegal. The survey collected a wide range of information, including the use of technologies, participation in public employment programs, and the 
labor market before and after participation in a program and so on. For the second objective, we use an enterprise survey conducted in 2014 in Senegal. The survey collected information on, on employers and employees, uh, including their age, gender, education. The survey also collected information on the use of ICT as a change in, as a change in employment between the date of creation of the enterprise and the date of survey. Now, to estimate the effect of digital technology adoption on participation in public employment programs and access to employment, we used the following model uh, and divided our sample into two groups, adopters and non-adopters of digital technologies. Here, our main independent variables is digital technology adoption, which is a binary variable taking the value of one if job seekers use internet or newspapers to get information on the labor market. We have two outcome variables here, participation in, in, in public employment programs and access to employment, which is captured by in employment, in employment duration and labor market discouragement. And finally, to deal with the issue of selection bias on observable factors, we use two matching methods, which are the PSM and the IPWRA. To estimate now the effect of digital technology adoption on employment dynamics across sectors, we use the following model. Here, the dependent variable is a change in employment between the date of creation of the enterprise and the date of survey. And our main independent variable here is also, is also digital technology adoption, which is captured by, by a composite index using the multiple correspondence analysis approach. Uh, of particular interest in this model is a parameter beta. If positive and significant, it indicates a positive, a positive employment effect of, of technologies. That being said, we think that technologies are potentially endogenous. In fact, an enterprise's decision to use technologies are not random. Rather, it is linked to a set of observed and unobserved factors which can lead to biased estimate of our parameter beta. So one way to deal with this endogeneity issue is to use an IV approach. In this paper, we use two instruments, the, the share of firms with access to a computer and the sectoral ICT intensity. So in this figure, we report the findings of the determinants of digital technology adoption among job seekers. The question we ask here is who use digital technologies for job search purposes? And in line with previous research, we find that youth and women are less likely to use technologies for job search purposes, indicating a significant gender gap adoption. Education and language and language skills also matter. We find that better educated individuals and those with good language skills are more likely to use technologies for job search purposes. In this figure, we report the findings of the impact of digital technology adoption on participation in public employment programs before and after matching. Before matching, we can see that the adoption of digital technologies increases the likelihood of participating in employment solidarity contract by 4% and decreases the likelihood of participating in employment adaptation contract by 5%. And after matching, meaning after controlling for selection bias on observable factors, we find that adoption of digital technologies increases the likelihood of participating in employment solidarity contract by 4% and decreases the likelihood of participating in employment adaptation contract by 4%. We also find before and after matching that adoption of digital technologies does not significantly influence the likelihood of participating in incubator internship and spin-offs contracts. 
Uh, in this figure, we highlight the impact of digital technology adoption on job search before and after matching also. Before matching, we find that the use of digital technologies increases the likelihood that unemployed individuals will continue their active job search by 2% and decreases the likelihood that they will withdraw from the labor market by 1%. However, technologies have no impact on the unemployment duration. And after matching, we find that the use of digital technologies increases the likelihood that unemployed individuals will continue active job search. However, the adoption of digital technologies has also no impact on unemployment duration. So here, in this figure, we report the findings of the impact of digital technologies on employment dynamics across the manufacturing, trade, and service sectors. And we can see from this figure that the adoption of digital technologies has a positive and significant impact on both the share of scaled and unscaled employment. Overall, the adoption of digital technologies increases the share of skilled workers by 2% and the share of unskilled workers by 3%. The effect of digital technologies on the share of skilled workers is 2% in the manufacturing and just 1% in the trade and service sectors. So these findings indicate that the adoption of digital technologies has a larger effect on the demand for unskilled jobs in the manufacturing sector and a greater effect on the demand for skilled jobs in the trade and service sector. In this figure, we examine whether the employment effect of digital technologies differs by gender, and we find that adoption of digital technologies increases male employment more than female employment. Next one, please. So in this paper, we investigated the effect of digital technology adoption on labor market outcomes and employment dynamics across the manufacturing, trade, and service sector. And based on a set of empirical models, we find that the use of digital technologies can help in employed participate in public employment programs and continue their active job search but the use of digital technologies has no impact on the unemployment duration. We also find that the use of digital technologies has a positive and significant impact on both the share of skilled and unskilled workers and does benefit men more than women in terms of employment. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, yes, we clap after the discussion. So thank you very much for that uh, very clear presentation. I think we move on straight to the discussant, and that is uh, um, Dr. Lasana Sisoko. I don't know whether you are a person. Yes, please, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, before, I, I just wanted to clear one thing with uh, Malik before moving forward. The, uh, the second equation that you have shown on the, in the, for the second objective, yes. you, met, you, you put delta, uh, the change in employment. Yes. But in the paper, it is written LN. Did, is it LN or is it just the change? It is it the log of the change or just the change? It is both the, it is both the log and the, okay. the change. Because in the paper, actually, it is okay. the, cha the log okay. of the change that you have. Thank you for that uh, clarification. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I personally found uh, this paper very interesting. Uh, uh, it is on the impact of digital technology adoption on employment in Senegal. And uh, I uh, agree that it has a great potential for policy recommendation, uh, especially for Senegal with uh, a high uh, rate of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Uh, furthermore, uh, the different governments of the country uh, have put uh, some effort, actually, uh, specifically on uh, to uh, or to reduce or to uh, actually reduce uh, youth unemployment. Uh, Senegal also uh, has a, a, a framework in in the framework of West Africa. Actually, in the framework of West Africa, is characterized by the relatively high. 
uh, in, uh, intensive use of ICTs. Therefore, I find the subject of the paper very interesting, and uh, it could help evaluate actually uh, some public policies, uh, youth unemployment policies, for instance, in this context. Uh, so uh, uh, I uh, put for the author for the relevance of the topic and the analysis. Uh, the paper actually set uh, three objectives in my uh, understanding, even if it is summarized in two, uh, because we, they set to measure the, objective, the effect of digital technology adoption on, youth, on, on young people's awareness of public employment program and their access to employment, uh, to measure the effect of digital technology adoption on employment dynamics and in the manufacturing, in the manufacturing and service sector, and also to measure the effect of digital technology adoption on productivity in the manufacturing sector, even if uh, uh, that third objective in the end uh, did not receive uh, any attention uh, from the, uh, in, in the paper actually, but it, I think that the author suggested remove it, but it is uh, in the paper there, so probably it is just a, a, a typo or something like that. So you should remove that objective in the paper since there, has, uh, there is nothing about it in, in the paper. All right. Uh, now, so reading the paper, actually, uh, I, I f the paper is very interesting, but I find it a bit difficult because uh, the way the paper, because of the way the paper was structured, it is like uh, they tried to uh, 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 summarize two different papers together at the same time. So, which actually, in terms of structure, makes it a little challenging. So, uh, and the reader sometimes uh, uh, is a bit, you know. Has, the, has some, some difficulties. Uh, and the author tackling at the same time supply side job seekers employment issue and the demand side firm employment dynamic issues in Senegal. So that also actually, I think, uh, uh, they're trying to do a lot at the same time in one paper. But anyway, I think uh, 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 I will uh, just go along with the comments. Uh, in the literature review, uh, just a just few or minor comments. So actually the paper is, uh, on unemployment, or employment, actually. All right, so the research will actually just give a lot more attention to ICT's effect than employment itself. So I think it, uh, uh, it is, it, you guys uh, probably should uh, actually uh, uh, correct that in uh, uh, giving some more uh, uh, review on, on employment itself. And some previous work has, has been done, have been done in Senegal. I think it is, it is good to to mention those those jobs on employment, I think you know uh, you know those jobs, uh, can and Al in 2020 <coughs> and can in 2014. I think those uh, papers you uh, you have access to them. You should probably mention them and show how different your your work is uh, with respect to there. Uh, now coming to the model issues, so I will I will go differentiate uh, by objective since we have we have two method models with uh, uh, two, the, the two different objectives. So. Uh, so you are using uh, uh, inverse probability uh, weight uh, regression adjustments and PSM. And in your discussion, you raised the issue of observed and unobserved heterogeneity, actually. Uh, but you did not make any case to rule out the latter, the unobserved heterogeneity. So in the instance of individual make decision making, I think unobserved heterogeneity plays important roles. Uh, so if it is not, uh, if it is really an issue, I don't think that PS propensity score matching or other method based on the estimation of propensity score will be adequate for to, to answer this question. I think there probably uh, my recommendation is just to do as you did in the second objective to use uh, a regression with instrumental instrumental values in order to correct that 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 part. Uh, uh, it, for the second model, which is about employment dynamic in firms. Uh, Employment variation here is normalized to age ratio. I, I do not think that this measure could capture actually employment dynamic of a business. The age is different between the firms, and the variation of, between the, of the two extremes uh, cannot tell us what is going on in between actually, uh, in at, at employment dynamic, specifically about the between variation uh, within, within the two periods. So uh, the, the, the interval of time for the different uh, firms is not the same. Even if you normalize, I don't think that just that can give us uh, uh, an insight about what is going on really in terms of dynamic within, within the firms. And in the specification, uh, in the papers, there is a Z, I, 
All right, beta 3 zi and you did not mention what it is. So if it is not uh, uh, something that is interesting, so you should just probably remove it in the specification of the model. Now coming to data issue, uh, uh, in the first, in the first objective, young people awareness of public, uh, of, of public employment programs and access to employment. So, based on the test that you have showed, you have, you have, you have carried, uh, you show that most of these two, the two groups, the participants and the non-participants, are very different. Actually, in most of the statistics. So, or probably I, I, I got the ideas wrong. But in the paper, that's what I, I understood. So, in that case, I just think that probably. Uh, uh, it, is, it, is, it is going to be very difficult for propensity score matching or uh, the method that we have chosen to, to actually do a, an adequate job for, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the, for the uh, research. And for the second objective, uh, firm employment dynamic. In equation four and six, the author used the change in employment age ratio. So it begs also the question of what about the negative numbers or the zeros? Because I, it is very less likely that all the differences are positive. So some of the differences might be zero or, or negative. So if you take the log, those numbers will disappear. So in that case, uh, your results are doomed to bias. Why? Because the data will be just uh, truncated, only uh, showing the firm who was successful. And the, f those, the firm that are less successful actually in increasing their labor force will disappear from the data. So in that case, that's uh, a very big issue and you need to give more detail about that. Uh, so, and I think also that the performance of firms in individual locality like, depend on some characteristics with respect to town or cities. So, the, you should control for the uh, regional demise or town, town demise, uh, city demise. I don't know what uh, the uh, geographical distribution that we have. Probably you should control for locations, uh, which is, and uh, you put also size of firms within the, within the regression. How did you measure it? Uh, all right. So is it the number of employed people or how did you measure size actually? It is, it is interesting to, to know since you are actually, you have changing of employment on the, on the other side. Uh, and uh, I pre propose to use also probably demi variables, right? To, to capture the different size, small, medium, and large enterprises. That will help you actually capture the size specific, some of the size specific effect that might, uh, you know, uh, uh, that might uh, actually put some, uh, some problem in, you, with your, in your results. Uh, and at last for the, la for the data, the author did not mention anything about the informal, informal firms. So it, most of the firms in Senegal are informal. So, uh, so if you do not actually uh, uh, consider that in your analysis, actually, uh, it, it, in my sense, it's like a, an incomplete analysis, actually. So it is important that you, uh, uh, or if it is just formal firms that you have, in the data, so in that case also, you, you, you come into truncation problems because the data will be truncated in the case that, you know, if the informal firms that are hiring a lot of young people in Senegal will, we are not in the data. So those are actual issues with the data that you should probably pay attention to uh, in, your, in the research. And at last, if you allow, to just to, to finish with the results, uh, I think the, the in the first model, the problem is an observer still remains. And as I said, I think you should use a, 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 a regression model with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, instrumental correct, uh, with a relevant instrument to, to correct for the uh, endogeneity. And while uh, uh, in the second model, the main issue actually, uh, and first of, even in the first in the first objective, you talk about the duration of the of the uh, uh, um, unemployment. I think you should, you should use the duration more than in that case. They are more appropriate to, to explain duration, duration issues in, in, uh, uh, in, in economics or in the labor market. Uh, so I will just uh, leave some of the comments for, for that one and go to unemployment, firm employment dynamic. There I think uh, uh, the interpretation you did with the data is not, with the results is not correct. Because if you have uh, the, uh, the change, the log of the change of unemployment, and the other side, you have the ICT, which is not a dummy variable, it is a continuous variable, and you interpret the results as like it is a, a do on, use or not use, uh, so the results could not be interpreted in terms of percentages. I think unless you, you do other calculation, the interpretation that you did in the, with the results is, is wrong. I think you should, you should, you should check for that. For, for that. And 
how would you interpret also the, that's a question, how would you interpret really the results with respect to education, level and squared? Because it is a bit strange. The one is positive and the other one is negative. So what does it mean? Less education, more uh, hiring, and more, more education, less hiring. So I will just, uh, 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 just I, I think I will uh, stop there since uh, there is a time pro pro problem. I, uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Anyway, I will send it to Malik. The, I, will, I will share with you the rest of the comments that I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Sisoko. I think you can share the written comments with the Secretariat and also with the presenter. But those are very useful uh, comments. So I think, again, I'll open it up for the floor uh, before we go back to the presenter. Um, Okay, yes, over there, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, just a, a quick one. I don't know if I got it correctly that uh, use of digital technology does not uh, smoothen school-to-work transition because it does not reduce the duration of unemployment. I just wanted to know what uh, this could be attributed to. Thank you. Thank you. Prof, did you? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Mine is also brief. Towards the end of the presentation, you alluded to a gendered dimension of um, the use of digital uh, technologies. You, s you suggest, did you, did you refer to that? If so, can you remind me? What you, it sounded like there was a gendered dimension. I thought I heard you say, men are more likely to get employment by digital technology than women, all, th um, all other factors being equal. All, is that correct? Okay, all right, thank you. And if you can expand on that, why you think that may be, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we can take it back to the presenter. Um, some of them are suggestions, some mm. are need for clarification, so you can just Address the ones you can. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair, for giving me back the flow. Uh, I would like to thank the, the discussion for his insightful comments and, and, and uh, suggestion. I think uh, he was sent the older version of the paper because uh, issues related to productivity was removed in the paper. Uh, it's true also that uh, we are working on two different papers or on two different objectives. And I think uh, that's what makes our paper interesting because at the end of the day, we can have many publication from this project. Uh, regarding the, the methodology issues, I totally agree with you that uh, the PSM and, and also the IPWRA cannot control for unabsorbed factors, which is a, which is a drawback in, in this paper. And I think that uh, the, most, the most straightforward way is to use instrumental variables, but the problem is we are yet to find a good identification strategies but we will reflect upon it. Uh, we, we do use a gender dimension just by including other variables, okay, male or female. So we don't, we, we did not have, have the opportunity to go deeper and, and, and try to do separate estimation. No, we just include gender as, as an, explanatory variable. Uh, for the rest of the comments uh, or question, I just take it like a comment and we will try to incorporate in the final version of the paper. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, your team, for that uh, good presentation. Uh, thank you to the discussant and uh, all to the participants, so let's acknowledge them. And uh, I think that brings us to the last paper, the last presentation.
which is on digital technologies and uh, manufacturing performance in uh, South Africa. And this is uh, looking at farm level evidence. Uh, I think we have Elvis uh, and uh, Jason. I don't know whether, it, yeah. Yo, so you are on 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, while we're just waiting for the slides to come up, I just want to thank the organisers and coordinators of the, the forum. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here uh, as I present uh, a paper termed Digital, Digital Technologies and Manufacturing Performance in South Africa. Permanent evidence uh, written in conjunction with my colleague at the Centre for Competition, Regulation and Economic Development, uh, Dr. Alvis Avenue. Uh, just by way of an overview of how I'm going to structure the presentation, I'm going to spend some time going in, you know, introducing some of the core issues, uh, highlighting, highlighting some of the Africa key uh, context, particularly looking at the uh, dichotomy between. Uh, do you want to have a sign this? Where am I pointing? There. Ah, right. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time, like I said, on the introduction, then I'm going to delve into the South Africa specific context. And then speak a bit about a, a issue that we threw back and forth between ourselves as, as authors, and we also had it in other workshops uh, for this project, was this notion of disruptive versus in incremental technologies uh, and what it means for different industries when you look at them uh, in different scenarios. And then I'm going to jump through the data, uh, summarize our findings, and of course see what this uh, means from a policy recommendation point of view. Now, in the way of introducing some of the key ideas at the heart of our study, we leverage several strands of literature. Now, this literature points to the fact that the fourth industrial revolution for our uh, digitalization and more importantly, new technologies are key to structural transformation and are becoming catalysts for change in many economies, sectors, and industries globally. Now, these cataclysmic shifts in technology, methods, and procedures are transforming manufacturing processes in new and exciting ways, influencing a host of different uh, areas of business from innovation, production, trade, uh, consumption even, and even a host of other uh, business processes. Now as well, both disruptive and incremental technologies and technological changes and upgrades are simultaneously altered and being altered by uh, global, regional, and domestic value chains. This is leading to transformations in where, how, and what is manufactured. Now, the fourth industrial revolution and the commensurate digital technologies associated with it are also leading to the creation of entirely new markets, new jobs, and is facilitating an, a deepening of supply chains, and hence allowing us and in different industries to experience greater levels of integration into international markets. However, the adoption of 4IR and other disruptive technologies encompasses with it an approach to understanding uh, how value is created. We really need to rethink this approach. Now, it's criti cri critical to understand who can potentially benefit the most from these shifts, considering many African countries are still considered followers of technological changes. Moreover, the experiences of different firms, industries, and geographies are not synonymous across time. Rather, digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution are being experienced differentially across the globe. And these differences are due to several challenges being faced in very specific country contexts. As well, the COVID-19 pandemic has also emphasized the need for an acceleration in the uptake of digital technologies across all facets of society, government, and business to try and mitigate the already large digital divide and digital chasm between developed and developing economies. An accelerated uptake of digital technologies can open up new avenues for productivity, value creation, value addition, and of course give us gains in product quality. This can also help us break into new and niche markets and move along, up along the value chain. Despite this, the prospects for development in African countries driven by digitalization are not one and at this stage. And our knowledge of the baseline of existing technological infrastructure in many industries is lacking a crucial firm-specific nuance. Now, the pervading narrative in much of the literature on the effects of advanced disruptive digital technologies on manufacturing firms' outcomes remain inconclusive across the world, particularly in developing economies. While the available evidence suggests a positive net effect of adoption on advanced disruptive digital technologies, 
on manufacturing performance, the evidence tends to be anecdotal in most cases. And thus, this paper sought to fill an important gap in this literature by using a first of its kind survey in South Africa in particular to examine the readiness and attitudes of local firms in different industries to gauge how they are approaching this new era of manufacturing and what effects disruptive and incremental technologies may have on manufacturing outcomes in South Africa. And the contribution of this paper are threefold. Firstly, the paper provides one of the first empirical evidence bases examining the effect of digital technologies on the performance of manufacturing firms, specifically in a South African context. It departs from the anecdotal discussions of the effect of digital technologies on firm performance in developing in countries by providing an empirical examination of this relationship. Secondly, as I mentioned, the paper employs an innovative firm level data set. And thirdly, it contributes to the literature by constructing and using an adoption index that aggregates adoption behaviors of firms across different groups of manufacturing. In order to provide some context to the study, we sought to first understand some of the nuances related to the given country in question, that being South Africa. Now, in terms of the specific South African context, we find that various studies have shown that South Africa is still stuck in what some have termed a, mid termed a middle income trap, brought on by persistent issues that can be traced back to a combination of institutional and political economy problems caused in large part due to the premature deindustrialization of the economy in the latter years of the apartheid era. Moreover, the South African economy is still reeling, I guess like much of the other African countries presented here, from the fallout caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the lasting impact, at least at this stage, that this has had on local, regional, and of course, global value chains and supply chains. This has exposed South Africa's lack of resilience in manufacturing subsectors with the best equipped subsectors being able to recover quicker or experience significantly less severe impacts from various economic shocks. Now, crucial to the project of economic resilience is a continual upgrading, modernization, and of course, diversification of the economy's product space or export basket. An early indication from this survey and other case studies we've done at CRED uh, of manufacturing subsectors points to a stark technological disparity between locally owned South African manufacturing firms and of course, their foreign owned counterparts. The evidence suggests and highlights that the African manufacturing capabilities tend to be relatively more worn out and more out of date. Thus, it stands to reason that South African firms can benefit positively from the adoption of more advanced technologies to aid in their respective industrial recoveries and set them on the path towards growth. Yet to date, there exists sparse evidence about the current state of technology adoptions in Africa, and even more so about where individual firms view themselves in the immediate post-COVID future. Now, coming to this uh, the, the dichotomous discussion between disruptive or incremental technological changes, within the literature there exists a robust debate regarding the nature of disruption of 4IR technologies and processes. Uh, many authors are still skeptical of whether 4IR is actually a thing. Uh, if we're not really seeing a almost a Industrial Revolution 3.5, uh, rather than an actual 4IR uh, jump. Now, some authors argue that disruptive innovations create high degrees of new knowledge, whereas incremental innovation creates low degrees of new knowledge. Other authors writing on this topic describe disruptive innovations as technologies that were previously new to the world and contrast this to incremental innovations as being rather just improvements or enhancements in existing technology and technological performance. The key point that we use here is that disruptive, the disruptive potential of these new technologies, while having differing impacts on actors at different levels of the value chain, must be implemented on a sliding scale. What this entails is understanding that disruptive technologies can be either complementary, i.e. they can supplement existing products, processes, or business models, or can act as a substitute by replacing existing practices in a sector or a value chain. However, the degree to which technologies are considered disruptive or incremental may not be the same across time, firms, and industries. And thus, the disruptive potential of various technologies and process advancements are also dependent on the relative settings in which they are adopted. For instance, a disruptive technology, such as additive manufacturing, could represent an incremental innovation in one industry, while at the same time be a leading and or even revolutionary industrial change in another uh, industry, 
mark a fundamental shift in that industry's manufacturing ecosystem. Right, now this project, and particularly the evidence base on which it is written, was made possible through multi-institution collaboration uh, funded by South Africa's Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and supported by the South African Research Chair in Industrial Development and the Industrial Development Think Tank, which is housed at the Centre for Competition, Regulation and Economic Development. The data utilised in the study of digital technology adoption was gathered through a first-of-its-kind survey in South Africa related to digital skills and technological adoption. It is important to point out that the survey was put together based on similar surveys conducted in other countries such as Brazil, Argentina and Ghana, among others. Now, the South African specific survey covered 560 manufacturing firms associated with one of either three sector education and training authorities, or as you call them, CETAs. For the purposes of this study, we honed in on the questions relating to both the current and future gaps in technological adoption, the capabilities, and of course, digital skills. And this was to ascertain details about the export and innovation capacities of South African manufacturing firms and about firms engaged in a concerted effort to adopt advanced technologies, whether in a disruptive or incremental manner. So we have two main findings in this, in this study, and the first finding shows a strong correlation between firms engaged in exporting activities and their likelihood to have higher rates of digital technology adoption. These results tend to echo the findings in well-known literature, while also pointing to other critical factors that are important in impacting the ability of the African manufacturing firms to export. These other factors include access to broadband, whether the firms are owned by foreign or domestic investors, as well as the age and size of firms. In line with the literature, our results should suggest that older firms tend to have a higher likelihood to export, suggesting the, the importance of experience in the market, as well as the presence of established supplier and production networks that really helps these I said, older foreign-owned firms engage in international markets. Now, this finding calls to attention the potential gains to be made for locally owned and less well-established firms to partner with these larger, well-established foreign-owned firms to try and foster and nurture their exporting capabilities and capacities. Now, from the standpoint of our second main finding, we find that firms tend to be more innovative if they possess more advanced technological infrastructures. Put another way, firms located on the digital frontier are more likely to break into new markets and create niches for themselves. Of course, there are again other factors and other contributing factors that impact whether a firm is likely to be engaging in innovation. And these include the age of the firm, with younger firms having found to be, have a high affinity toward innovation. Human resources, i.e. digital skills, here we found that more digitally skilled firms and workers tend to find it easier to be innovative. And lastly, our results also indicate that firms have greater financial resources, are able to invest in disruptive and incremental technologies that can help them in this facilitation of innovation. So to quickly round up, knowing the main findings, we, we now turn to what we recommend from a policy and intervention perspective to assist in the transition to a new digital future. Now, firstly, we need to understand that a new set of digital industrial policies must recognize the opportunities in the, this new digital era are about capturing value from both incremental and disruptive technologies and innovations as part of an emerging and new digital industrial ecosystem. Of course, this means understanding the dynamics at the firm level, as this will assist in this process by offering the ability to tailor evidence-based policies. These policies, of course, must be cognizant of whether the transition to digitally enabled business models is driven by disruptive or incremental adjustments and improvements. Secondly, policies designed with the intention to facilitate a digital industrial transformation must create the conditions for domestic value creation and distribution. Our evidence showed that the age and size of firms are strongly correlated with the ability of a firm to adopt digital technologies to aid their exporting and innovation capabilities and capacity. The evidence also pointed out that smaller firms have a higher affinity toward innovative activities, possibly as part of their attempts to carve out niche markets that they are looking to compete with in their own industries. 
Thus, policies must be both targeted and sectoral to ensure that both existing market shares are maintained while smaller firms are assisted in their efforts to exploit new avenues for value creation. Additionally, value can be created by exploring strategic partnerships and joint ventures with well-established foreign-owned firms that possess significantly ad more advanced technological infrastructures and deeper networks of suppliers. Lastly, it is vital to focus on strategic policy targeting collective innovation and an alignment of all of these to extract the most benefit from the digital, uh, the transformation of digital manufacturing. This is so that we know that the policy space, incentives and implementation are all working towards a common goal of realizing a digitalized future and ensuring a smooth transition for manufacturing firms as they look to engage in innovation and exporting activities. I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation and also thank you for keeping to time. So we go straight to the discussant, uh, Professor Kodongo. You have 10 minutes for the discussion. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, it was an interesting paper to read and uh, quite well written. Um, so I have a few comments um, organized under three themes. The first one is motivation, then literature, and then design of the study. So if I start with the motivation, I think the first question that arises is, why South Africa? Why is this study being done in South Africa? Um, there are bits and pieces of information about South Africa, and the manufacturing sector in South Africa is not adequately described, um, but in the motivation, some literature is reviewed that says that, limited, that there is limited adaptation of advanced digital technologies in developing countries. Um, I want to believe that developing countries as used in that statement includes South Africa. So the question is why are we doing it in South Africa if we already have information that there is limited adaptation in developing countries context. So the issue is, what is it that is different about the manufacturing sector in South Africa uh, compared to the developing countries that have already been examined and are typically uh, reviewed or examined the literature. Um, so if we can demonstrate, for example, that the manufacturing sector in South Africa is different in regard to specific characteristics, then we would expect different results from South Africa than what we have already in uh, developing countries, other developing countries. Uh, but we don't have a discussion on those characteristics. Uh, similarly, uh, if whatever has been done in developing countries has used a study design that is different, and this paper seeks to use a different uh, design, uh, then we would expect also that there will be some marginal contribution if we study the same issues in South Africa. Otherwise, it, it remains as uh, an attempt maybe to replicate uh, studies that have been done in other, other parts of the developing world. Uh, the other thing is, the focus of the study is on adoption of digital technologies, and the question is why? Uh, why are we focusing on adoption? Um, you know, where should the technologies being adopted come from? Why can't we, for example, focus on creation and use of digital technologies in South Africa? Why do we focus on adoption? You know? uh, so 
Um, uh, the second thing I want to say about motivation is is still linked to what I've said about characteristics of the manufacturing sector in South Africa. I try to look for stylized facts about the South African manufacturing sector. So, you know, I didn't find them, but I thought it would have been a good thing if you had linked uh, farm performance, for example, performance in regard to innovation or in regard to concepts like return on sales, uh, if you had linked that to adoption of digital technologies. So you have data or statistics on farm performance, and um, you have, on the one hand, farms that have adopted digital technologies, and on the other, farms that have not adopted. And if you can demonstrate that those that have adopted perform differently from those that have not adopted using, uh, you know, descriptive statistics, for example, like differences in mean or median, then it would be easy to argue that uh, adoption of technologies is value adding and therefore there is need to uh, find out what it is that drives the adoption of technology. Uh, also, there is mention in the paper of deindustrialization of South Africa. We talk about early deindustrialization and aging technology. Uh, but these are not backed by evidence. They are mentioned in the paper without uh, adequate attribution. Uh, but I thought uh, it would be a good thing to link them, of course, in addition to attributing them, to synchronize the two and then link them to uh, their role in export competitiveness and then by extension to the need for digital technology adoption, uh, you know, using either data or, I, or um, you know, literature that adequately links them so that you can be able to use them to argue the case for adoption of digital, digital uh, technology uh, in your motivation. Then the second issue is the literature. There's a paper that you haven't uh, referenced, which I found, a paper by Yang, Fu, and Zhang, that has a detailed review of the literature. It has developed a conceptual framework that is informed by that uh, detailed review of the literature. And the, liter the, the framework summarizes the drivers of digital technology into two groups, uh, internal factors and external factors. Uh, and you also seek to examine the drivers of digital technology adoption. And you pick factors, but the rationale for fact, the factors picked and included in your model is not clear. So the question is how are those factors situated in the literature? Uh, you know, since you don't have um, a, a conceptual framework of your own, uh, where do you pick these factors from? How do you justify their inclusion in the, in the study? Uh, so I was suggesting perhaps you could use uh, the model, the conceptual framework developed by Yang, Fu, and Zhang uh, to justify the inclusion of your factors, but importantly also to situate your study appropriately in the extant literature. Okay, um, the other issue which I believe is major is uh, on the design of your study. Um, now, the study did not include the data gathering instrument. And so I was forced to think about how the questions may have been framed 
based on table one of your paper, which, which speaks to the definition of variables, some of the variables included in your study. And uh, I think that uh, if the questions were structured in a way that is consistent with the definition of those variables, there are cases when uh, responses elicited by those questions may have been ambiguous and therefore yielding responses that probably uh, may be misleading. So I'll give a few examples uh, on the definition of adoption of digital technologies. It's a dummy variable that takes the value of one if firm's primary method of managing of production in five to 10 years is through machine to machine communication system and zero if managers, uh, if the farm manages production. Okay, there was a, an issue there uh, with the, the wording in the definition. So it's through partially or fully automated uh, process or simple automation with unconnected machines. So you have three levels there of uh, definition, but you have a dummy that is dichotomous, which doesn't cover all the three levels because of the dichotomy, you know, it could have been a trichotomy. Uh, so, so the, but in addition to that, uh, many respondents may find the wording partially or fully automated process, if not qualified, to be difficult to interpret, and therefore probably giving responses that are not consistent with uh, what is expected given that question. The other one is uh, the question on human capital. It says a dummy variable that takes the value of one if the firm has employees with uh, science, uh, engineering, mathematics, and so forth, qualifications and zero otherwise. Uh, the question I was asking here is the number of employees is not prescribed. So if a firm has one employee with STEM qualifications, does that qualify the firm to be included as having adequate, uh, well-qualified human capital? Uh, okay, so the number of employees is not defined, and so it is difficult to use it as a basis for uh, defining the human capital factor. Then there's the question of financial capital. It's a dummy variable that takes the value of one if the firm considers lack of capital to be an obstacle. Again, capital is not defined. Uh, talk about financial capital. Uh, is it in the context of you know, internally generated funds, for example? for acquisition of uh, technologies, or could it be inadequate access to the capital markets? So what exactly do you mean when you talk about inadequacy of capital and how is, it, how is financial capital defined uh, for purposes of gathering the data? Then the size of the firm is used as uh, an independent variable in the regression. Uh, it is reported that a large proportion of firms, sorry. Um, so, so the size of the firm is defined in three categories. In three categories, category one is for large firms, category two is for medium-sized firms, and category three is for small-sized firms. Uh, now you use this categorical definition in the uh, regression as an independent variable. Uh, the question is, if you have numbers one, two, and three, and you put them in a regression, how do you ensure that the, the, the system, the program, does not read it as a ratio or as a, um, a, an interval scaled variable? It's a categorical variable how do you ensure that the system doesn't read it as an interval scale or as a ratio scale, right? 
and therefore assign values that are inconsistent with the meanings of those variables. Okay, uh, then I also spot some apparent inconsistencies in the interpretation of statistics. Uh, for example, you say that a large proportion of farms without giving percentages are aged 56 years or more. And 90% of farms lack financial capital, right? Uh, in general, mature farms, if you have farms that are aged 56 years, they are either mature or they have gone past the age of maturity. Uh, mature farms generally uh, tend to have adequate amounts of internally generated capital uh, funds. But if they don't, they would usually be having good relationships with the capital market to enable them to uh, access the debt markets with ease. And so I find it difficult to reconcile the fact that a large proportion of farms are mature farms, but at the same time, 90% of the farms in the sample do not have access to financial capital. Uh, given what we know about uh, age and access to capital uh, and so forth. So they have, uh, I've, I've made uh, detailed um, uh, notes on this, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof, for the very detailed uh, discussion or comments, I'm sure they will improve the quality of the paper. So I will open it up again for the floor before we take it back to the presenter to respond or to just, uh, yeah. Okay, it seems like there's no um, need clarification from the floor. So I take it back to the presenter. I uh, think some of them are observations, uh, some are detailed, so you can just respond to the ones that you can now. And then uh, the rest maybe yeah, you can address in the paper. Thank you. Sure thing, thank you. Uh, thanks, Prof. Very detailed comments. Um, I was struggling to hear you at times. So I think it would be very good to maybe engage uh, offline here as well. Uh, so we can maybe just understand precisely what you're getting at. I'm going to pick on some of the, the issues. Um, the first obvious one, you asked why South Africa? Um, and I think we had the data. This was a long run project to get to the stage of collecting the data, uh, going out into the field with a, to, to interview, or at least attempt to interview thousands of firms and only getting about 516 or so respondents. So we had this very rich data set. Uh, it is the first iteration of it. Uh, so like we said, we don't really know, we can't glean too much from it. Uh, there is scope and interest among ourselves and our funders to really uh, look to do another round of this, uh, to just start developing a panel data set so that we can see how an evolution across time. Um, your question relating to different differences in manufacturing in Africa versus other countries, yes, I mean, there are stark differences. Um, and yes, if you had a different country, yeah, you probably would have come out with different results. But I think that's the beauty of doing uh, a country specific case study and not getting too generalizable results. So we were very, I think we were very careful in almost profitizing our, our conclusions to the point where we say that this is the be all and end all for all manufacturing firms. We preface this very much as being a South African related case study. Uh, you know, if there's other interests from other parties here who want to help us try and uh, conduct a study in, in your countries, I'm sure we can get some really rich data from those as well. Um, I take, I take all your points around the empirics that are the ones that I heard. Um, I'm not going to try and talk through them now. It'll just be too long-winded. Um, I definitely think it'd be great, like I said, to have a, an offline chat regarding the, those particular uh, issues. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm not going to spend too much time, Chair, just because we really are over time. Um, I just thank you, Prof, again for your time, uh, and I hope to engage with you for your further. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, both the presenter and the discussant. So maybe we just acknowledge them. And uh, I think that brings us to the end of uh, this, uh, these presentations. Uh, you'll agree with me that it has been, been, been a very long and rich uh, set of presentations. I will not uh, 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 try to uh, summarize everything, but I'll just try to highlight a few uh, uh, issues which came out. Uh, the first paper on dis uh, disruptive technologies in South Africa uh, bring out, br brought out the issue of the digital divide because of the issue of poverty. Uh, the fact that there, there's a digital divide that exists because of uh, poor people who live in areas without uh, network coverage. Now, there's also the issue of the fact that uh, uh, the, there's the, the relationship between uh, low mobile uh, money usage, which exists in uh, areas with less developed um, economy, that is the less developed economically, have less um, use of mobile money. And uh, <coughs> distance to financial, on the other hand, distance to financial uh, services increases the incentive to use the mobile systems. So this brings the issue of uh, the role of uh, physical infrastructure, which I think came out in the presentation by the executive director in, the key, in, the, in his opening remarks. So it's very interesting. And I think the conclusion which came from here is that um, there is actually a digital divide, which is geographical. And uh, as well as a bit economically. So there's geographical um, uh, divide and the, the, a divide between the rich and the poor. Uh, the paper on, uh, by uh, Dr. Elder on this this <coughs> and her colleagues on disruptive technologies in, in agriculture brought out very interesting issues. Uh, the fact that f the use of fertilizer and agricultural uh, productivity and then the existence of inequalities in access to internet, as well as uh, inequalities in education, and the implications that these ones have in terms of uh, uptake of disruptive uh, technologies. Now, this paper also highlighted uh, regional gaps in adoption, and uh, it therefore also brought out the issue of the ICT um, in uh, 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 technologies as an, as an enabler. But the, the discussant in, of this paper also brought out an, another impo other important issues, one of them being the fact that actually farmers are already using these improved technologies. So the question should then be how to deepen. And the role of policy, therefore, is how to deepen this. And then the fact, the issue of the heterogeneity of farmers also, uh, which is important in terms of policy targeting. Uh, then we had the third paper, which was also on uh, digital adoption in Senegal. And I think uh, the, one of the main issues which came out from here was uh, the impact of digital technology and adoption um, uh, by gender, where the, one of the results was showing that the males seem to do better than the, uh, than the females. And one of your takeaways was that the digital technology uh, should help to uh, uh, helps uh, to increase, uh, rather help than employed, but uh, it doesn't reduce uh, the duration of employment uh, that they undergo, un unemployment, sorry, that they undergo. So the last um, paper, which is what we have just uh, listened to on digital technologies in manufacturing in South Africa, uh, brings up about an important issue on uh, uh, the relationship between digital technologies and the ability of farms to engage in, in innovation. Uh, so uh, it seems like farms which are exporting more are likely to possess um, advanced digital technologies. And uh, one of the recommendations here is, uh, is uh, uh, that the digital um, industry players uh, should be recognized and the opportunities for digitization, uh, for digitization both, <coughs> both incremental and, and uh, disruptive uh, should be supported. So I think uh, that is, uh, those are some of the issues that came out of these four papers. 
and as I said, it has been a very rich uh, set of presentations. So that brings us to the end of the session. And uh, I think I take it back to the organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we wind it up with an applause for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rosemary. Um, we come to the end of PEPA's presentation. Uh, the next session will be policy panel. Uh, during the policy panel, uh, to make sure that there is a smooth transition to the next point, just stretch five minutes. Just walk out. If you are taking coffee, you can take coffee and come back, just to stretch a bit. As we set up the policy panel, uh, kindly, just stretch a bit as you walk out, we set up the policy panel. Uh, to save time, just walk out, stretch a bit, and come back. <laughs>
and also a BSc in political science and public, public administration, University of Zimbabwe. Uh, he also has a, a diploma in training management and diploma in uh, computer programming. Uh, he has worked uh, for the Zimbabwe Ministry of Higher Education, uh, Employer Confederation of Zimbabwe, and also with the ILO. And in his work at the ILO, he is based in Harare, Geneva, Addis Ababa, and now in Pretoria. And he's the director of ILO Pretoria, a decent work team te technically uh, serving 18 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. He also is the director of the country office, politically and administratively covering Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, and South Africa. Uh, uh, Dr. Musambayana, uh, welcome to the forum uh, today. Uh, I hope you are hearing us. I am hearing you loud and clear, Madam Program Director. Thank you very much, and okay. thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Let me introduce the others, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Mr. Mezi Gebu Amha, who is uh, a Senior Fiscal Policy Advisor and Coordinator of Economic Forum Unit within the Ministry of Finance in Ethiopia. Uh, prior to that, he served in various positions, including as a fiscal policy director uh, in various positions in the Ministry of Finance and other government institutions. And he holds a Master's uh, of Arts in Taxation uh, from the University of Canberra and uh, a BA in Statistics from uh, Addis Ababa uh, University. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me. I'll say in Kiswahili karibu sana. Uh, next we have uh, uh, Helen uh, Letter. Uh, Helen Letter is a, a, is the Ethiopian Chamber of Commerce and Sector, Sectorial Associ Association in Ethiopia. Uh, he, she is a researcher and policy analyst uh, professional. Uh, her academic creden credentials include uh, MSc in Development Economics and uh, BA in Economics. Uh, she has over 10 years experience. Uh, she's currently the manager of research and policy analysis in the department of uh, department at the Ethiopian Chamber of Commerce and Secretary sectoral association. Uh, her primary responsibility includes uh, operational studies on cross-cutting uh, trade and investment uh, uh, issues, also developing a national business agenda uh, for the private sector, as well as uh, 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 discovering uh, contemporary issues in private sector and undertaking quick uh, uh, response uh, studies. She has also worked as a project analyst, uh, a project analyst uh, where she was able to advise businesses on market and financial issues, tracking progress of industri industrial prog projects, and reviewing uh, uh, industry-related policy uh, documents. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you very much. And then, uh, finally, we have um, uh, Miriam Chepchumba Bomet, uh, Deputy Head Policy Research and Advocacy, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Uh, Miriam uh, oversees uh, uh, 14 manufacturing sectors operations at the association, uh, including uh, regulatory and legal advocacy. Uh, she has extensive experience in public policy, advocacy, regulatory governance and research in Kenya and within the East African region. She sits on National Public Committee on Trade Matters and Tax Matters, and she also has extensive experience in promoting social rights, including consumer rights. Uh, she is also instrumental in leading a sustainable uh, practices in the uh, manufacturing sector. Karibu sana. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rose. 
Okay, so that is the panel. And uh, from the introduction, you can, you can see that uh, they have quite a lot uh, related to the discussion that we had today. And I'll start uh, our discussion uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Musambayana. Um, and I want him to uh, guide us in uh, uh, trying to uncover uh, how uh, securing enough decent jobs uh, for Africans growing and the uh, youthful population uh, which will require strong private sector-led uh, growth. Uh, I want him to tell us um, the impact of digital transformation uh, in businesses and the workplaces uh, uh, in Africa uh, in actually supporting uh, the youth. Sorry, I'm hoping you hear me well now. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam Program Director. Let me start by a disclaimer that I'm here representing uh, Ms. Cynthia Samuel Olandwan, who was the original invitee, but unfortunately they couldn't do it. She's the Assistant Director General of the ILO and the Regional Director for Africa. So I really speak on her behalf. Um, the theme for today's Regional Policy Forum is very close to the ILO, to the ILO's mission and mandate. The question of how technologies have disrupted societies and shaped the world of work is a question we have been tackling in uh, ILO's over 100 years of existence. But it is a good question that needs to be asked time and again to ensure that we remain relevant. This is also because one of the biggest development challenges the African continent faces is, as you have rightly said, creating sufficient number of decent jobs for Africa's growing population. We know, of course, that Africa is the one with the youngest population. As to how to address the challenge, there is no silver bullet, but it is clear that digital transformation is playing an increasingly vital role. Over the past two and a half years with the COVID pandemic, we have seen accelerated digital transformations across the African continent. And I was privy to some of the presentations by your previous speakers who have spoken uh, on the same issues. And as an organization, ILO, we have invested considerably into understanding the trends and impacts that are taking given our mission and mandate in promoting harmony in the world of work and the pursuit of decent work. We have identified key opportunities that, decent, uh, that digital transformations provide for creating decent work, but also the risks that are associated with it. And let me fair, uh, share a few insights and trends. Uh, the first is that digital transformation has greatly facilitated the shift from remote uh, to towards remote work. And uh, it was a temporary solution during the lockdown and shutdowns of the COVID era. But we can see that it has also greatly enabled widespread use of communication and productivity platforms. Our research also shows that remote work was mainly concentrated more in the larger formal and better paying firms. The truth is that for the foreseeable future, workplaces in Africa will continue to be a hybrid between in-person and some shape or form of remote work. It is hardly likely to be that we'll see a mass wholesale shift completely towards remote working. So we see a hybrid. The second is that a key trend is the resilience of businesses on the digital transfer platforms. And these have taken different forms. We have this FinTech uh, platforms, of course, Kenya, you are the home of um, PESA, and we have seen digital payments that have enabled the private sector to grow and the economies to grow, and secondly, also generated large numbers of indirect jobs, particularly through mobile money agents. And we have seen that the digital skills required have continued to come down in this regard. Likewise, we have seen the growth of e-platforms uh, where we are and the instant hailing, ride hailing applications in this part of the world, we have things like Uber, like uh, Bolt, and we can see that there's a great diversity of these platforms, including platforms to match cleaners, plumbers, domestic workers with customers. Um, but last but not least, we've also seen 
web-based platforms that are becoming increasingly popular. And this provides services entirely online and those tasks are largely undertaken by, they require skilled, skilled capacity, but they range from micro task work to web and graphic design to programming. The third trend we see is the digital skills are becoming increasingly important for private sector development in Africa. And our, uh, we have done a study in South Africa. I am uh, cognizant that there was also a previous speaker who spoke about the South African experience, particularly on digital skills for young people. And our finding is that currently the demand for digital skills outweighs supply, meaning that many businesses lack the skills and talent required to operate and compete in the digital economy. And these digital skills are required in nearly all sectors of South African society, from agriculture, infrastructure, manufacturing, to financial services. We also find that intermediate digital skills are in high demand by small and medium scale enterprises, while advanced digital skills are largely the preserve of large enterprises. Finally, and fourthly, digital transformation has come across with some important risks that have impacted the world of work. One is that African economies cannot simply effectively participate in the digital economy, principally because of the lack of access to reliable and affordable internet high speed. So the, 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 the divide, the, the inequality that we are beginning to see with digital transformation, if you have access to electricity, access to high speed internet, you join the digital era. But absence of these two critical elements is really condemning particularly rural Africa to, 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 to being left behind. There are also jobs in the digital economy and on digital platforms come with a high degree of insecurity. A key challenge is that existing legal and regulatory frameworks in the labor market haven't been able to keep pace with the fast paced development of digital technologies. So for instance, one of the biggest areas of discussion is whether working arrangements of digital workers are they independent freelancers or are they employees? I'm sure we've seen court litigation throughout the world on this. But finally, a key impact is on social protection systems, which are largely absent in the digital economy. Therefore, to wrap up, digital transformation has considerable potential to create jobs for Africa's growing population, particularly her young women and men, but it also comes with quite a lot of risks. In the interest of time, let me stop there and hand back to you, Madam uh, Program Director. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Johnny, for those uh, very uh, stimulating uh, uh, comments uh, relating to uh, how the region can actually uh, exploit or uh, look at opportunities that are available uh, in generating a decent work for the youth. I want to go now to uh, Miriam Gomez and ask the question, um, uh, relating to how we are adopting um, emerging uh, uh, disruptive uh, uh, technologies, we have seen that uh, in as much as we are all at different uh, uh, stages in the, in the digital uh, technology uh, space, uh, it looks like the wave will not uh, uh, leave anyone uh, behind. But there are various aspects that need to be put in place uh, so that um, we can see a successful uh, implementation or tra transformation uh, that will give us uh, the welfare effect that uh, we require. Uh, my question is, um, uh, what do you think is changing in government uh, policy in the region uh, such that uh, 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 it can actually uh, propel or even support um, uh, this adoption uh, of uh, uh, disruptive technology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rose. Um, just to start by saying that um, the issue to do with disruptiveness is very good. It's one of the issues that is actually bringing in change. You know, whether it's uh, what we saw during the COVID period in terms of disrupting us, and now we are moving to uh, digital and technological disruptions. Um, I'll be skewed towards the manufacturing sector with regard to government policies. So um, an example of Kenya is that we do have indeed um, lots of policies that are supporting digitalization, 
technological advances, but what we are seeing is that um, there's a lot of growth in the service sector. And for us in Kenya, it presents a lot of challenges because of our economic situation um, with regard to our growth of the manufacturing sector. So we are seeing a lot of um, importation in terms of uh, products, um, technological products in Kenya. We are still not producing technological products, and that's the opportunity we need to take as, as Kenyans within the African region. Um, drumming up support for the trade agreements that are coming in and leveraging our manufacturing sector. So as much as the digitalization uh, space is coming in, we are not seeing the uptake in the manufacturing sector. Um, an example within the Kenyan sector is that it's a few sectors that are now embracing digitalization and also uh, technological advancement. And one of the reasons is what um, we had today in the opening remarks of the executive director, an enabling environment. So we are seeing a lot of um, fiscal uh, policies that are coming to disrupt the digital advancement and the techn technological advancement in the country. I'll give you another example. For the last three years, um, the manufacturing sector advocacy has been uh, trying to support um, reduction of costs, uh, taxation costs on their plant and machinery. And these are the things that would be the drivers towards digitalization and also um, embracing of techn technological advancement. So we are seeing the policies are there, but we see inconsistencies in terms of uh, making sure that um, the policies are consistent and there's a stable regulatory environment to drive this, especially within the manufacturing sector. The service sector is doing well, whether it's in the banking sector that we've had today, in the papers that are out there, whether it's in the telecommunication, the transport sector, they are thriving in terms of the growth within Kenya. But when you look at the manufacturing sector, there's a lot that needs to happen, and a lot of it is tied towards enabling environment and policies. Um, thank you for that, and I hand it back to you because of time. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, um, probably before I, I shift to another one, I still want Miriam to expound further and tell us uh, the fact that she's in, uh, in the uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. It means that uh, uh, that is where we see uh, incubation of innovations and also entrepreneurship. Uh, what, what do you see as the policy perspectives in this regard? Thank you um, again for the questions, and, uh, which is allowing us to be able to just put a few things which um, can help us uh, move this discussion further. But a lot of the issues came out from the papers um, in terms of um, what we really need to do to move forward, the gaps that are existing, and one of them, of course, is um, the issue of specific strategies that countries need to take. As I'd indicated earlier, <clears throat> We have a lot of policies within the African region, different countries with regard to digitalization and technological advancement um, with regard to that. The problem is the implementation stage. And what we've seen in Kenya in terms of some of the gains that we've seen are strategies that are developed, sector-specific strategies that can move us forward. Um, so those are the things we are trying to push for. Now we are advocating more for manufacturing-specific uh, polit policies with regard to um, digitalization and of course trying to take advantage of the disruptive um, technologies that are there and the uptake of that. Another issue is of course the issue of skills. Um, again, as we are seeing um, very low skills in terms of technological um, support, we are still seeing um, Kenya relying on um, foreign um, labor support with regards to their technologies and um, that is quite clear with regards to our immigration uh, policies in terms of trying to see how we can mitigate that and build the level of skills. There's a lot of work that is going on um, in partnership with the government agencies and the private sector and the manufacturing sector with regard to the technical support in terms of skills. But that of course takes a lot of time and it needs a lot of investment to move forward. The other issue is um, looking at the informal sector and that's where the majority of um, jobs are. That's where we can build up around the inclusivity uh, proposals and the incentives that we want to take forward, whether it regards um, youth and women who are always disenfranchised in the informal sector. 
So those are some of the areas that we need to look at, put strategies within those areas, and we'll start seeing um, an uptake, we'll start seeing some movement in terms of upscaling within these areas. And in that time, we are tackling what um, I think this forum and the papers that were being put out there with regard to inclusivity within this digitalization space is going to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I now move to Mr. Amha, uh, given that he's in the, in the government space. I'm j I just want to find out uh, from him um, uh, whether he can see the government uh, providing an enabling uh, policies uh, that would support uh, digital transformation in the region. And uh, what, what could be, uh, uh, what kind of policy environment do you think the governments are providing? And if they are not, uh, uh, what could be the challenges? Thank you, uh, Professor Rose, uh, Dr. Rose. Uh, and uh, thank you, colleagues, also, uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, important uh, forum. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, findings from research that could uh, may maybe help, you know, enrich our policies here. Uh, uh, so having said that, uh, I think uh, particularly uh, with regard to <coughs> countries in uh, South Africa, I mean, uh, in Africa, I think uh, we are uh, in a different stage uh, of implementation of digitalization so far. So uh, we have to also not uh, consider that into account, take into account that one. And so uh, particularly taking Ethiopia, for instance, uh, we are really uh, at, uh, I can say, uh, already as it has been pre presented, we are at low level of uh, uh, digitalization, and so uh, definitely we have to enhance this. But uh, for this, of course, we have put in place uh, uh, the various uh, uh, required regulatory and policy environment uh, in place so far. Uh, we have uh, the digitalization strategy we have uh, uh, already in place and we are implementing. Uh, and also, we have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ICT uh, policy uh, in place, uh, and uh, uh, we are also considering the uh, uh, policies for startups also. Uh, because, you know, uh, one thing I would like to uh, underline here is also, I think the importance of the digital sector uh, from two perspectives. One is the, it's, uh, it's uh, enabling, uh, you know, enable, as an enabler in a different sectors, in the service sector, in the agricultural sector, in the manufacturing sector, and also taking uh, itself as an industry is very important. Uh, so that is also where we are, we are working. Uh, definitely in this regard, one of the challenge I, I, I can say is in the first place, we are at low level of uh, digital literacy, literacy. That is a very big challenge. And also, uh, implementation uh, capacity is also, uh, institutional capacity is very, very, uh, you know, important uh, challenge that we are appreciating here. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, coordinating, you know, implementing policies is a very important uh, challenge, uh, which of course we have, we do have this uh, Ministry of uh, Information, Innovation and uh, uh, Ministry of Innovation and uh, Knowledge uh, in place, you know, already. And uh, so, uh, but the issue is, you know, uh, coordinating and implementing uh, all the, the, uh, the policies that we, are, we have, uh, you know, outlined is very big challenge I am seeing uh, from this, from this this perspective. The other is infrastructure level itself is also a very big challenge. Infrastructure is also uh, needs to be uh, harnessed and uh, private sector development, you know, uh, enrolling the private sector, engaging the private sector itself is, uh, is very important and uh, that, that also needs to be, uh, I think, uh, looked into. Uh, so uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, definitely uh, now uh, the 
we have seen the, uh, how the disruptive uh, you know, technologies are very important in you know, providing job creation and also enhancing economic growth. So we have to also you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, diagonize our existing policies and maybe we can enrich this uh, you know, input that we have heard in terms of improving the regulatory environment and the policy environment also. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amha. Uh, Ms. Reta, uh, ICT is a, uh, an enabler uh, for digital economy. And uh, in most cases, uh, what you find is the uh, disruptive technologies are related to uh, uh, telecommunication sector uh, uh, and the like. Uh, the question is, um, what do you see as the government efforts uh, uh, in putting uh, in place uh, a clear ICT uh, uh, sector uh, that uh, would drive and uh, get the impact that uh, we are looking for as far as employment, uh, job creation, and uh, the youth is concerned. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Rose. Uh, 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 as Mr. Uh, Amha previous, previously uh, described, uh, in general, I in our country, in Ethiopia, the uh, digital, dig dig digitalization or just supporting uh, the market system with the digital technology uh, is uh, uh, very in pr primary position. Uh, when I came to the ICT sector and t telecommunication, uh, uh, in this regards, of course, the government uh, uh, are doing different efforts to facilitate the information communication technology and the telecommunication sector. Uh, for instance, in, in general, the government do have the science, the STIZ science, the technology and innovation policy. Uh, it also uh, recently revising uh, the it's science, technology, and innovation policy. And uh, also uh, recently, uh, specifically since three years, uh, uh, there are a number of reforms uh, which the government of uh, Ethiopia are doing just to support the trade and investment with uh, digital and uh, it just prom promoting digital economy. And uh, in this regard, for, for instance, currently, the government of uh, Ethiopia is introducing the uh, national uh, identification. Um, uh, and r recently, uh, it might, might be after uh, six, 10 or 15 dates, it will be nationally uh, introduced and uh, launched. Uh, so uh, these are the positive in uh, initiatives and efforts from the government side. Uh, when I come to, uh, and also the ICT do have its own uh, 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 structure. Uh, it just the government have established the ICT industrial parks. Uh, 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 this, despite uh, there are a, lo a, a lot of issues that uh, the ICT uh, uh, industrial park is uh, 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 issues needs uh, are fulfilled or not, uh, but there are uh, established industrial park industries uh, which are is, uh, just uh, uh, established to pro promote the innovation, invention, incubation centers, and such kinds of efforts from the youth perspective and also the private sector uh, perspective. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, as uh, it's very difficult that uh, 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 despite having such kinds of efforts, uh, we are still uh, at uh, initial stage in developing ICT uh, and the telecommunication sectors. Uh, however, uh, recently, for instance, when it comes to the telecommunication, having the limitations of the telecommunications we have in our, in our uh, country, the governments are trying to pri private, privatize the telecommunication sectors. These are the positive efforts of the uh, 
government sites uh, and also currently in, in its uh, 10 years national plan. Uh, it, it just have uh, uh, interest just to meaningly uh, uh, engaging the private sector uh, in PPP frameworks, which is public-private uh, partnerships, just to uh, uh, having, notice, having noticed that there is both physical and ICT uh, infrastructure problems. The government is currently trying to engage uh, also the private sectors to have uh, engagement in the development of uh, physical uh, infrastructures. So these are the positive side efforts of the national government, our national government. Mm. This, despite the list of uh, kinds of uh, limitations that we have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to go back to Johnny. I hope you're still with us. Johnny? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Ah, thank you, thank you very much, yes. Um, I have uh, still one more question for you. It's, uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and... Uh, I, my question is, um, when you think about uh, uh, the disruptive uh, technology and uh, probably the opportunities uh, that is uh, uh, available, uh, for example, for uh, addressing the, the digital divide, uh, which is very high among women, among, uh, among the youth, uh, what do you think are the opportunities in the region to address uh, this kind of uh, 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 challenges or uh, bring out uh, or exploit the opportunities in actually uh, promoting a, a decent works. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Indeed, harnessing the full potential of digital transformation is not an easy task, but it is a challenge given the high youth uh, dividend which if not handled well could become a curse to our social and political fabric um, we we have to combat full uh, head on and capitalizing on technology and innovation to promote decent work uh, particularly for young women and men is a priority work of the ILO in Africa along with the whole UN system it is a priority that has been a reaffirmed by Africa's uh, 54 ILO member states uh, when they adopted what we call the Abidjan Declaration after a meeting in Abidjan, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And that declaration seeks to advance social justice and to shape the future of work or the changing nature of work in Africa uh, uh, as it is. And so going forward, what the ILO is promoting is what we're calling a human-centered policy agenda at the global, continental, and national levels. And what this means is that we need comprehensive action to transform the potential of digital transformation into actual decent work opportunities. And how can we achieve this? The first is we have to upscale, as I alluded earlier, investments in connectivity to ensure affordable continental-wide access to internet. Without accessibility, without connectivity to internet, we cannot reap the benefits of the, let's say the digital uh, dividend. But this is still a challenge across many countries on the continent. And this is, of course, particularly acute in the rural areas. And we know that the percentage of the rural area population versus urban area, while it is still very high, it's slowly transforming in favor of uh, urbanization with all the challenges it brings. But that presents an opportunity. I think it is common cause that we can best increase connectivity much more within the urban settings than the vast distances we have to confront in the rural areas. Of course, technology, particularly satellite technology, may bail us out. But this investment in connectivity is a key one. The ILO just published its flagship report, the Global Employment Trend for the Youth. And what that report shows is that investing in universal broadband coverage in Africa could result in millions of additional jobs for young people across the continent by 2030. Those job gains would not only be limited to the ICT sector, but they would spread 
across the economy, including construction, distribution, retail. So this is the first one. The second is to strengthen digital skills among the young people and create decent digital jobs for youth through partnerships, particularly with the youth themselves. The ILO today, we have a project called Boosting Decent Jobs and Enhancing Skills for, our, for Youth in Africa's Digital Economy. And we are, this is being done in many pilot countries throughout Africa, of which Kenya is, is, is one of them, Rwanda, South Africa, if I can mention a few, Nigeria. And this we are doing in partnership with the International Telecommunication Union and with the support of the African Union. And as part of this program, we have already invested significantly in broadening the knowledge base of what is required to create decent job, uh, digital jobs. We are also piloting digital skills training together with youth-led organizations. And of course, we are putting youth and youth-led organizations at the center because we are well aware they always say nothing for us without us. Um, thirdly and finally is the need to address the key challenges of digital transformation. We need to divest, intensify dialogue, social dialogue as we call it, between employer organizations on the one hand, the workers and the government. And in this we have a principle we're calling the human in control in our approach to the digital economy. And we say that final decisions affecting workers should be taken by human beings, not by algorithms. And that social dialogue should be able to help us domesticate laws, implementing the fundamental labor principles and rights for workers that should apply to all, including those in the digital economy. As I outlined in my earlier response, we see really a real threat in eroding worker protection and worker rights in the digital economy, particularly on issues around social protection. Through dialogue, we should therefore be able to place the issue of the employment status of workers and the provision of social protection at the center. Uh, let me, in the interest of time, end here, Madam Program Director. And it's, it's, it's more to do with um, the service sector. I still want to insist that um, we really need to look at um, digitalization and uh, disruptive technology from the perspective of the manufacturing sector, value-added goods, and how we can contribute as Africa to this big agenda and be able to get the value addition and the benefits of manufacturing some of these technologies. So I know there are a lot of opportunities that can come through that. But of course, the other issue that um, came out from the findings is the issue to do with um, uh, economic performance of countries and, that, and how that correlates with um, what we intend to do around digitalization and having these disruptive technologies um, work for us and they are already there and they are coming up and one of the things of course we need to do is to see how to enhance our economies and um, a very good example within the manufacturing sector is our automotive sector and specifically the motorcycle se uh, sector in Kenya. We've seen adaptation of um, a lot of digitalization um, whether it's in the assembly lines, whether it's in their supply chains and why this is happening is because of the growth of uh, the motorcycle industry, not only in Kenya, but within the East African level. And so we can see very close correlations and what came out from the findings about um, us prioritizing our economic performance as African countries and how we can move into quickly uh, take advantage of opportunities in digitalization, in um, jobs, um, growth of jobs within the private sector, and we'll be able to help the, the, the countries move forward in any kind of agenda that we want, apart from you know, digitalization and the disruptive technologies. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Miriam. I want to come back to Letta um, and, and, and ask her to, yeah, you gave us a very good uh, perspective of uh, the ICT uh, sector in uh, Ethiopia. But uh, I want to also ask you what opportunities have not been exploited? Or what opportunities are there to exploit more in uh, uh, accelerating the disruptive technology in the region? No, not necessarily the ICT, yeah. Uh. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Rose, uh, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, I, can, I can say that uh, uh, we, are, we are not uh, at all exploiting the uh, advantages of the uh, district, district technologies in, in our countries. So uh, uh, that means we will going have uh, a lot uh, to do uh, in order to exclusively uh, uh, using the advantage of disruptive technologies that we would have uh, the positive impact in our economic development uh, for youth employment uh, and of course in accelerating the poverty reductions uh, which is currently, uh, uh, these are the two uh, issues. I'm, I mean, just sustaining the, the economic, to sustain the economic growth of our country and to accelerating poverty reduction is currently the two critical issues of our countries. So we should have to explicitly use the advantage of the disruptive technology that we have uh, in the developments of our countries. So uh, in this rega regard, as it requires uh, us uh, from our uh, previous papers uh, discussions, we have heard that it just requires high capital. It just requires, uh, it, it might require uh, uh, high human capital uh, and also uh, requires the physical infrastructures so that uh, we should have to work more on uh, this uh, 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 areas just to explore the advantage of the disruptive technologies would have for our economy. Okay, thank you very much. I want to come to Hamza and uh, I've seen uh, you are working with the fiscal policy matters and I, I want to see whether there are any opportunities uh, uh, that, that we can have with fiscal policy in uh, supporting uh, uh, disruptive uh, uh, technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, again, uh, I think uh, uh, if I look uh, to uh, Ethiopian, uh, I mean, potential in uh, tapping uh, uh, the potential for uh, disruptive technology, I think uh, uh, number one, what matters in my view is, uh, you know, uh, the private sector in Ethiopia is still at low level, so one one area that we have to also promote, you know, uh, uh, and uh, enhance is private participation, private sector participation in the economy. So uh, in that regard, of course, uh, <coughs> Ethiopia is uh, providing a lot of uh, physical uh, support uh, for uh, private sector to engage even in this uh, area. But uh, recently, we are also looking into, for instance, uh, uh, promoting, you know, uh, I mean, supporting the uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, particularly the young entrepreneurs, which, you know, uh, startups, uh, which have no, uh, for instance, financial access. Uh, you know, the, they have lack of financial access. So that is a big problem that, that has been seen. Uh, so, uh, uh, that is where we are also looking into. Uh, of course, the other uh, investment, the big investments have already this kind of support uh, in the system. And uh, the, I mean, the gap that we are seeing is for small enterprise, for the startups uh, that we are seeing. And so in that regard, maybe we are working, uh, it is uh, a work on, on, uh, in progress, so we are looking into that. Okay, um, I think uh, we have had very good discussion and now I just want to go to parting shots uh, for all of you just to tell us uh, uh, now that you've been uh, in this uh, 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 forum uh, where we are thinking about uh, uh, the region and how we, uh, we can actually uh, deepen digitalization. Uh, what is your parting shot as far as uh, uh, policy action uh, uh, required uh, is concerned. And I'll start with Johnny. Uh, the fact that we have, uh, for example, a very new uh, administration coming in uh, for Kenya. We've just finished the elections. If you are to meet with a new uh, administration, what would be you, what is the key message you'd give them for policy action? 
Uh, let me start by wishing Kenya and the people of Kenya well in your just ended election. Many of us have been looking at you, wishing you peace, wishing you peace with yourselves as a people. We have noted the, the also the core challenge, and we hope that as a people moving forward, you will find each other. Uh, having said that, I think if I were to meet uh, the president elect Ruto, I would say to him, the young people are the future and that getting jobs for young people will be his most urgent task. And that the 230,000 votes by which he won may quickly disappear if he cannot place jobs for the young people at the disposal of the young people. And the biggest way to do that is to look into digital skills and to facilitate this digital transformation of the economy. And therefore, he needs to look at the issue of connectivity. Kenya already has a fairly good or high percentage, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 30-40% internet connectivity rate, but that is still very, very low. Uh, he needs to enhance that and to ensure that young people do have access to connectivity, particularly in the rural areas, and that they are enabled through digital skills training to be able to partake in the digital economy. I thank you. Uh, I go to Miriam. If you meet the next uh, Minister of Industrialization, what would you tell him or her? Uh, thank you again, Dr. Rose, and it's been a pleasure to be part of this panel. I think for me, it's to advance the regional um, perspective of the opportunities that we have and for us as Africa to leverage on strengthening digitalization and also to take the opportunity to get into the technological products um, space um, and especially because of the African Free Trade Continental um, Agreement that we've entered that is binding to all of us. We should be able to leverage on those opportunities and be able to take advantage of the opportunities that we have at a regional level. And just to echo also the, 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 the space of um, the youth and innovation, it is them who are going to drive it for us. So our policies must look at inclusivity, including women uh, within this space in the private sector. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I go to Nita. Uh, you are in the Ethiopia Chamber of Commerce and Sec Sec Sector Association. We also have a, a Chamber of Commerce in Kenya. If you are to meet the CEO, what would you tell him or her? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rose. Uh, uh, if, uh, I just got the chance to meet with the Chamber of Commerce or CEO of the Kenya. Um, I just, uh, uh, I would have to uh, explore the, the, their, the Kenyan Chamber of Commerce experiences in, re in regarding with the uh, in regarding with its efforts just to uh, uh, just push the governments just to devise uh, policies uh, that would have uh, uh, in the in the in endeavoring the private sector's engagements uh, in their national economy uh, uh, because as our uh, uh, earlier presenter from the government si side uh, in Ethiopia have said and explained to you the private sector's uh, engagement, especially in devising policy and just advising uh, of policies for the government is very minimal uh, and also its engagement uh, 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 in the, the development of the uh, actually, it that even the system doesn't allow the private sectors to have uh, meaning, meaningful uh, engagements, uh, especially in the telecommunication sectors uh, and also previously in public infrastructure developments. So that uh, I would have advised this Kenyan uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, executives their uh, experiences uh, uh, in this regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I finally go to uh, Amha, and I, I, I actually left you out uh, the last because you are a policymaker. 
Now, this floor is yours to give us your cutting shot as a policymaker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, as a policymaker, uh, we listened uh, to the researchers, uh, definitely, and uh, there are a lot of knowledge here. Uh, so, uh, tapping this knowledge to inform our politics is very important, and uh, we need to really uh, where these recommendations findings are fit into our economies. So we we really uh, we have we have no problem in uh, adapting policies and the strategies. So really, uh, com commitment is you know implementation commitment is where we have uh, problem, and so uh, really uh, we have to we have to be serious in that regard, and uh, we need to. Uh, you know, utilize all these resources uh, that we are, we are hearing here. Uh, so that's my, what I would like to, uh, you know, uh, take as a message for you. Thank you, thank you very much. He's spoken like a real policy maker. He's taken all your views. I don't know what else uh, I need to tell him uh, as a policy maker, but uh, it's been a very good, uh, wonderful uh, 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 panel. Uh, we've learned a lot uh, in terms of uh, uh, what needs, uh, what is happening in the various regions, uh, the challenges, uh, including uh, aspects of access to reliable and affordable internet divide, and especially the emphasis on the differences between the rural areas and uh, the urban areas, and how we can actually uh, do social protection uh, for those who would actually be disadvantaged as we do the disruptive technology. But we have also learned that uh, social dialogue is very, very crucial uh, between the employers, workers, uh, and the government. Uh, there has been a major, major emphasis that uh, uh, disruptive technology is seemingly biased to a uh, service sector, and there is very little happening in the uh, manufacturing sector, and that uh, that is a actually an area uh, that has uh, opportunities uh, for us to, to exploit. We've also learned uh, quite a lot uh, in terms of um, uh, the key uh, milestones that, uh, for example, a country like Ethiopia has done, coming up with a digitization, digitization strategy, ICT strategy, and also the reforms that are going on uh, in the ICT uh, uh, sector including uh, having uh, ICT parks that uh, would promote uh, uh, innovation with the incubation, uh, sec in incubation centers. And finally, um, I want to say that uh, uh, we've been told that uh, we need to promote uh, the private sector uh, because uh, it is through its participation uh, that would actually see um, uh, as yielding uh, the benefits of uh, uh, digitization. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I want us to applaud uh, the panel. <laughs> and I give back uh, uh, the mic to the organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, policy panel. We can give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we had a keynote speaker, and we thought that instead of interrupting the policy panel, he came in uh, with the, his presentation. Uh, we have Mr. George Njuguna uh, representing Peter Ndegwa from Safaricom. We know that um, Safaricom um, is an enabler of a disruptive technology of one of the major players in our Africa and MENA. Uh, Mr. George Njuguna, please. Yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> See, I think I got this on. Uh, sincere apologies from our CEO. Uh, he asked me uh, to represent him here. I can promise you I'm not Peter Ndegwa if you have questions for him. I just put them on the paper there and <laughs> they'll go to him. But I'll start off with a video. I think we've had a lot of talk. 
I'll just talk, uh, start with the video to just introduce you to our organization because I do note a lot of people are from around Africa and so in a global audience, uh, it's just a bit uh, appropriate to talk about who we are and our purpose. Uh, sound team, over to you. For over 20 years, Safaricom has played a critical role in the Kenyan society. We have grown from humble beginnings to becoming the leading telecommunication company in East Africa. We keep over 41 million customers connected by providing connectivity through a wide range of technology. 2G, 3G, 4G and 5G, covering over 99% of Kenya's population. Our purpose is to transform lives by connecting people to people, people to opportunities and people to knowledge. We also know that our future is interconnected with our society, people and with the planet. That is why we have integrated the Sustainable Development Goals into our overall strategy. Our vision is to become a purpose-led technology company by 2025. A technology company that puts our customer at the center of all that we do. A technology business that facilitates new ecosystems to power digital inclusion, health, agriculture and education. In digital inclusion, we are enabling Kenyans access more 4G devices under the Lipam Dogom Dogo financing plan. Lipam Dogom Dogo makes it possible for customers to purchase a smartphone via manageable daily installments of 20 shillings. In health, MTBA, our health payments e-wallet solution, enables over 5 million users to save towards healthcare expenses from as little as 10 shillings. In agriculture, Digifarm is a free Safaricom service that offers farmers convenient one-stop access to quality farm inputs at discounted prices, input loans, learning content and farming, and market access. In education, Shupavu 291 is a mobile web learning product that provides free and unlimited revision materials and content to primary and secondary students. We also run M-Pesa, the world's largest mobile payment system and Africa's largest fintech. Through our enterprise business, we are enabling SMEs and large enterprises thrive by helping them become more agile, productive and profitable. Our subsidiary, Safaricom Telecommunications Ethiopia, plans to deploy world-class network and services to contribute to Ethiopia's digital transformation journey. To support our purpose-led growth, we have adopted the KPMG True Value methodology. This allows us to evaluate, through an independent party, the total value we create for the society over and above our financial profit. Our latest true value earnings indicates that we created a total value of 664 billion shillings for the Kenyan society in our last financial year, which is 10 times greater than the profit made during the year, generating over 1 million direct and indirect jobs. The SDGs and our purpose of transforming lives are also the guiding light for the Safaricom and M-Pesa Foundation's work in the community. Since 2010, the M-Pesa Foundation has invested in large-scale and long-term sustainable projects that have impacted over 2 million Kenyans in education, health, integrated livelihoods and environment. The Safaricom Foundation, with a footprint in all of Kenya's 47 counties, has since 2003 implemented over 1,400 community projects, impacting over 3 million people in health, education, economic empowerment, water, disaster relief, arts and culture, and environmental conservation. Over the last two decades, Safaricom has become one of the biggest corporate supporters of sports, music, and the creative arts in Kenya. Through events such as Chapadimba na Safaricom, Tuaweza Live, the Safaricom Golf Tour, and the Safaricom International Jazz Festival, we have seen that sports, music and the arts have the potential to bring Kenyans together as well as transform lives. We are also exploring how frontier digital technology can save lives, create sustainable livelihoods and protect natural habitats. In partnership with the Kenya Red Cross Society, we developed M Salama in 2018, 
a tool to send out early warning text messages to people living in flood prone counties asking them to take precaution. In partnership with M Copa Solar, we have provided access to solar energy to over 800,000 households with an impact on 3.3 million lives. Together with Circle Gas, we are providing over 41,000 customers in low income households in Nairobi access to clean, affordable, convenient and reliable cooking gas. We are also involved in trees for carbon stocking and over the last eight years we have been measuring our carbon footprint to understand impact on the environment. The COVID-19 pandemic reinforced our belief that together we are stronger. We doubled fiber speeds, thereby enabling customers to work from home more efficiently and waived the M-Pesa transaction fees for amounts below 1,000 shillings. We launched Bonga for Good, an initiative that allowed customers to use Bonga points to pay for essential goods and services or to donate their Bonga points to those in need. This is now a permanent service with customers being able to redeem their points at any buy goods till merchant countrywide. We also set up the 719 COVID-19 hotline in partnership with the Kenyan government to support Kenyans in understanding how to prevent and manage suspected cases. As we look into the future and to becoming a purpose-led technology company, we commit to deepen our focus on more innovations and purpose-led growth that will further transform the lives of our customers. Thank you, Sound Team. Thank so, you, Sound Team. Thank so, you, Sound Team. Thank you, Sound Team. So for our visitors, I, I think that's visitors, a... I think that's a... Sorry, guys. I'm good? That's a brief overview of our young company. We're just about 22 years old, uh, but uh, certainly uh, making an impact. Our purpose does uh, remain uh, transforming lives and very much in line with uh, the African Economic Research Consortium objectives. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation uh, to be here. I'll take a very uh, short period of time. I must say, I can't remember the last time I was in a room with uh, so many doctors and professors. Maybe it's 13 years ago when I was uh, presenting my thesis. Uh, but uh, looking at one of the prof who was asking questions, I hope he doesn't dissect my presentation as he did Jason's. Uh, but <laughs> I'll try and do my best. So uh, just talking about us, uh, so our purpose does remain transforming lives. And we talked about our vision. Uh, we are telco with perhaps the most successful fintech in Africa. Uh, but we talked about how are we going to transform to be a, a technology company, but still retaining that we want to be purpose-led. Our br brand promise is about being simple, transparent, and honest. Uh, when our uh, former chairman, former CEO, uh, came back a couple years ago, he felt that we were a bit of a complex business and busy. And so he came up with what we call Safaricom Neo, which is about being simple, transparent, and, and honest. And this is what we live through in all our developments, solutions. We don't benchmark, uh, of course, against the banks. We benchmark against the global players. And very proud of the work my team has done recently that even when we do large upgrades, uh, we've brought down the time to less than nine minutes. Uh, because we realize it's not just about technology, evolution, and adoption of technology, but any minute that this service is unavailable uh, could be a life and death matter uh, for us. Later that the impact of the work we have in technology, not just connectivity and digital, is really uh, a modest estimate that over a million jobs are sustained uh, that we can actually uh, directly link. 
and then 6.5% uh, as we talk about our GDP. Uh, just talking about our mission, uh, we are looking a lot about how are we going to accelerate our growth, but uh, recognizing that superior customer experience uh, is still important and underpinning that is a bit on what you talk about, some of the technologies, looking at data and analytics. And I'll just touch a bit on, on what that means. But it's really getting the customer engagements and experience deepened. Uh, I'll digress a bit. Uh, just uh, when I looked at the topic and the conversation, uh, especially around uh, disrupting technologies, uh, taking you back memory lane, uh, in the 1700s, uh, the main technology was, was the mechanical loom. And what was really happening around that time was uh, going into mining and seeing how uh, steam engines can be used to uh, improve productivity, especially around mining. And so I always uh, hold the analogy that uh, the, the, the major people you may ask, was it the miners? the people who are mining, or was it the person who delivered the steam engine? I think I would submit that it was actually the people who developed the steam engine. Then we went into a mass production, and I'm certain uh, most of you uh, history buffs uh, know Frederick Taylor and scientific management, and looking at the factory and the assembly line, and we talked a lot about that, but I really think the genius was on the people who were actually building the mass production even though labor was largely organized uh, around, uh, I guess, labor, the people who worked in the factories. Uh, then came to the PC age, where many of us uh, entered into technology. I won't guess how many boomers or Gen Ys, Xs are in the room. But at this time, when the PC came, a lot of the images were more around uh, personal computers, IBM and companies like that, Microsoft, going into having the desktops across uh, companies and later into organizations. But again, the human capital, I believe, the big brains behind this was actually the people who designed the microchips and found ways to compact this into very small spaces that we now start to look in terms of nano. So I do submit that I believe in the industrial revolution. Uh, we've now come full circle and it's no longer about hardware but about software. And I believe the two true brains of the next evolution of technology and in the fourth, or now sometimes we say X industrial revolution, is actually going to be software engineers. And as we think about the policies uh, that are going to help us uh, leverage disruptive technologies, be able to create employment for our young people, be able to create uh, 10X, 100X factors in our industry, I strongly believe that it's actually in software engineering. And so as Safaricom, uh, over the last uh, two years, my team has uh, really grown from about 200 people to 800. And about 600 of those are software engineers, uh, people who are building solutions on I IoT, Internet of Things, uh, big data, uh, machine learning, and leveraging artificial intelligence. Moving from just buying solutions from vendors to actually creating the solutions locally. We're not only able to save costs, but we're creating jobs, creating value, and not just offering them to our consumer business, but now seeing a lot of interest from our enterprise customers and government to take this solution. I believe largely Africa is a net importer of technology, but if we begin to become a net exporter, then we begin to create jobs fascinated by the Kamataka region in India that uh, boasts of exporting $50 billion a year in terms of technology where Bangalore is based. I believe as Africa, we've not even reached there. And that's just one, one province state uh, in India. If uh, look at some of the big uh, shifts uh, that we're exploring. Uh, when uh, we went to, I'll probably stick one back, 
Uh, we attended uh, GSMA, uh, kind of the big mobile conference this year. The usage uh, to coverage gap is about uh, 3.2 billion people. What that means is connectivity exists, but those people are not able uh, to get onto broadband. I equate it to having a very good and slick road outside your house, but you can't get on the road. You see it, and sometimes we joke as we grew up in Kenya that uh, you'd go to some areas and uh, people would be using the road to lay maize and other things because there were no vehicles. And so the flat surface created opportunity to do other activities other than what roads were meant for. That's the same thing with technology. And what's the big challenge? It's affordability. I've seen it in one of the papers. There's skills, but also lack of content. I, when I, so, much, so much of the time when we look at uh, the big usage on our network, uh, actually you'll be surprised, it's TikTok. And how much African content is actually uh, coming off of there that's relevant? Uh, so if somebody can't speak English, can they consume this content? And so again, I think even on the content space, especially from what we see in, in, in Kenya and East Africa, a lot of the content uh, is also we are net importer. So what are we actually uh, going to produce? And to the researchers here and uh, people in academia and policy makers, we need to start producing more of local content, local solutions, and therefore that's going to spur growth and jobs in our economy. We're finding the talent was a big challenge. As I said, I've onboarded lots of people. I probably lost 25% of my team to global players. Now you're trying to do digital transformation and you really need talent, then you're competing with Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft opened a development center across the road from our HR director's office and put a big sign. He always jokes that every day he walks to the office, he knows that somebody there is looking at him smiling. But, and then Google announced <laughs> that they're coming to town. And we really can't stop people uh, from going. But again, the challenge, uh, we took this as an opportunity to relook at our HR policies. And we start saying that the only way to get growth and certain benefits and better pay is not just in management, but recognize uh, the, the need to put in what we call a contribution model. That you can just be a subject matter expert in your space and be paid as high as a director or a CEO because of the contribution that you're giving to the company and the expertise that you hold. That has seen us uh, curtail and address uh, some of the exits, but it will continue to happen. And you can't ignore talent because we strongly believe that it does set the tempo for change. And so you have to continue being in this, and you can check online uh, some of the talks I've given about the talent war. It's something that uh, we can't hide from. We need to keep addressing it. Uh, but also see how we can uh, come up with solutions to grow the base. How do we partner with academia to bring in a lot more people uh, with technical skills into the industry? So even as we lose some, we are, we are gaining a lot more each year. We, so if we look at some of the big opportunities uh, that we see through technology uh, that we've been able to leverage, I live in construction and manufacturing, a huge in terms of job creation, uh, healthcare and education, uh, remote access uh, that came up in terms of rural areas, uh, banking and industry, and then um, in, in terms of enhanced security, uh, productivity and efficiency. We've been using technology and innovation to solve social problems. Uh, you heard in the video on what we're doing on health with MTBA, on the agriculture side with uh, DG Farm, uh, on education, a number of uh, startups that we fund and power through connectivity as they put the content. Uh, looking at what we do in financial services, I think we're quite well known and it's been great to see uh, FinTech and investment blossom in Kenya and on the continent, I think a lot of the papers, their preamble is the M-Pesa story and we're happy to not just share M-Pesa with Africa but also share it with the world. I think our partnerships with public sector are quite important. 
Uh, for those of you who had to come to Kenya and get a visa, you probably went on a portal on a system called eCitizen. Uh, we host that system and we continue to work with government on improving it. Uh, if I had time, I'll tell you about when there was a downtime on it in 2019. I didn't sleep for 13 hours that night as we got it up, but we have continued to improve the infrastructure and not just be a trusted service provider, but advisor for government. A lot of the collections, as well as connectivity, uh, we work, especially what we call NOFB, uh, which is getting the last mile, is done in partnership with our government. So what, what do we need to do? I think we are working not just for us, uh, but our business, but also with many of our partners to build what we call digital radio organization. So we've changed our operating model and our entire structure uh, from traditional HR type of org uh, to what we call agile. So we have many agile teams that are, are built around a single objective. So it's not uh, vertical hierarchy, but very small uh, self-managing teams uh, that are delivering solutions uh, every two weeks, sometimes weekly, uh, that are, we've organized them into what we call tribes and squads. Uh, you can look at that uh, for more detail. But we're seeing a, a lot of improvement in how versatile we are. That means for my team, about 80% of them don't sit in the traditional uh, IT org, but are actually working in the business. They build solutions, support them, improve them, and are constantly hearing from the customer and the business and able to address their problems. I would say it's almost like devolution at hy hyperscale level with uh, real results. And I, we say the customer is the one at the center of the circle and not really uh, power. We've talked about mission leadership, uh, which is important. We have a mission. And what we tell the teams is uh, what needs to be done, uh, what, what, the what in terms of uh, where we're trying to go and why we want to do it, but we don't tell them how to do it. Uh, we believe that people coming into the workforce, uh, this knowledge economy, they are smart, and they didn't join our organizations to be given top-down instructions. They joined to be part of creating value and transforming lives. So by giving them just the big picture and enabling them to develop, adapt, and roll out solutions, they feel empowered and part of the creative cycle, but not people who are working in uh, the Frederick Taylor type of factories. Uh, a lot of collaboration we've done in terms of digital talent. I'm very happy with uh, what we're doing with universities. So academia, our partners, tech hubs, uh, we recently launched a digital talent program with about 40 organizations signing up. And we want a commitment to train a 1,000 uh, people in software engineering this year. And Safaricom committed to absorb 200. We're going to work with academia in terms of training them. I believe there's a large opportunity working with academia. If you look at new technologies like IoT, I don't believe we have a single institution in Kenya that can say that they have a center of excellence on IoT training. So again, what does that mean? We go to vendors. So we're not just importing technology and content, even people uh, to do these things. Uh, if I look at the graduates uh, that are being churned out, and I say this with a lot of humility, uh, they're still operating on curriculums that are not relevant to the challenges of the 21st century. So how can we put in place the right curriculum that when I want to hire a machine learning an artificial intelligence, an IoT engineer, I can go to the university and find 500 who are ready. And I, I'm not the only one who needs them. The people who are poaching resources from my organization need them as well. Uh, to get a technology like IoT working, it's not one institution that's part of that chain. There's the person who is building uh, the device, there's us who are providing connectivity, there's the person who's going to do the analytics from the data coming from it. It's an entire industry, but we are not, uh, as a country, at least I can speak in Kenya and in East Africa, where I've spent quite some time in my career, 
we're not able to produce people or to have people out of our universities who can leverage these opportunities. So we then look perhaps closest to India, sometimes to South Africa, and many times to Europe and other parts of the world. So how can we partner so that the curriculums, the projects, the research papers that are being done are actually leveraging the insights we have about the challenges we're looking to solve, where our business is going, where we believe the world is going, so that the proper partnership uh, is a cycle where research also tells us where things are going and what we should be, what type of products and solutions we should be producing. And they also give us people who can help to develop these. Uh, some of the challenges uh, we face, just in summary, I think certainly in our country, I think there is, I've talked about uh, the lack of expertise. We do see, I believe, in the public sector, uh, low level of investment in technology, if I'm honest. Uh, I heard about the parks, the innovation parks. Uh, we have Konza coming up. It's been coming up for a, a long time. I, I do hope and trust, uh, and I'm almost certain in my lifetime uh, that I will go to a uh, completed Konza. But I believe we don't just need one Konza Technopolis. We need these all over. I believe I dream of a, 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 not just a Kenya, but an Africa where somebody can just walk into their neighborhood and find a cyber, a cyber cafe that's free to use with connectivity, be able to plug in, learn some of the newest technologies, program solutions, the, take some of the products from their mom, take a picture, and be able to sell them online, right uh, from about a range of two kilometers, one kilometer, 100 meters from their house. I believe it's not about having these uh, just large innovation hubs, but how do we decentralize these to the communities so people can educate themselves uh, we take advantage of how much knowledge exists on the internet already so they can not just educate themselves, connect themselves to opportunity, but also connect themselves uh, to markets. Uh, there is definitely a concern I see uh, in, in our institutions about being left behind uh, by changing technology. I was surprised uh, recently I was in Dubai and I was expecting I need to go to the counter to uh, present my passport and everything and check in my bags. I did it myself. Then I thought I'd go to somebody at immigration to present my documents to leave the country. I did it myself. Now, those of you who came into Kenya and we've gone to Addis, go to Entebbe, Harare, you know what it means. <laughs> uh, not too long ago, I was at our airport and they had a blackout. And I can tell you it took three to four hours just for people to check in. And I boarded my flight with a paper written boarding pass. So we are being left behind. And some, I cringe at uh, some people from the West when they come to our country and go through these experiences. It's very difficult to tell them that we are not a third world uh, country. But these are small problems uh, that we can solve uh, through the use of technology, through automation and digitization, and also by ensuring that we address the poor governance and corruption. Because some of the large investments that go into uh, and the money that's wasted uh, through very little of it, even a small percentage by the numbers given, I won't quote our outgoing president, can just make such a big difference in terms of automating our institutions. And I just gave one small example. Uh, even a SIM card, uh, you go into the country, some countries, uh, no one asks you if you want a new SIM card. You find it in your passport and you connect and you activate and life continues. In Africa, I believe we are blessed with problems. These problems create opportunities for yourselves as well as ourselves, as well as our children. 
So my last slide, I think, uh, what are some of the key actions? I believe uh, development of ICT management legislation, standards and strategies is important. Uh, things that are practical, uh, not copy-pasted, and uh, I won't say not academic in this room. And then uh, <laughs> we, need, we need to invest more in ICT management. I think the tools, the processes, and people. Collaboration is important. Uh, I think no, even Safaricom, we cannot do it on our own. We need to collaborate with key partners, uh, government, academia, private sector. I think I heard uh, Dr. Rose say that in closing. It was a good cue for me to come on. Capacity building is important in the right spaces. Uh, we talk about, as I said, we talk about high numbers of unemployment, but how can we just, you can build capacity in, in technology without people needing to go to a school. They just need a device and connectivity and they can end up being some, some of the best developers I have never, have not even graduated from university. They were just started to self-teach, learn, and they're earning no less than $5,000 a month doing what they're doing, creating good apps uh, that are some of the highest rated uh, apps on the store. I think the research and partnership with academia is important. Uh, I have reflected that even M-Pesa, I believe, is we're not doing enough research in our in our universities on M-Pesa. I hear a lot of great stories of M-Pesa coming from Harvard, uh, but how come they're not coming from our universities? And you people in research are right here. You can tell the impact. You can talk more. So what are we doing? Uh, majority kind of uh, telling things from outsiders. Uh, because I think those who tell stories rule the world, but we need to do, tell our own stories and it will come also from doing a lot more research uh, in our industries and coming up with solutions. And that's the partnership we're looking to have. And then we need to be a catalyst for the democratization of technology. Uh, this means, uh, as I said, having those hubs in the communities where people can learn, being able to take solutions from there easily into research, into academia, into government, into private sector. And any time we see an opportunity, uh, not, we should not seek at a policy level uh, to create uh, laws and taxes that make it harder for people to access technology, but we should be making it easier. I think with those brief remarks, say asante sana, simple, transparent, and honest for you. Thank you. much uh, George uh, for that elaborate um, presentation and we have seen how um, mobile telephone industry or telecommunication industry is really shaking up or is really disruptive in a positively disruptive way thank you I hand over the session to Abebe well I, I think George you really Wrapped it, up, wrapped it up for me, um, and and uh, even you gave us some good ideas about when to host a keynote. <laughs> it's a disruptive <laughs> one, actually at the end of it. Uh, uh, because you know, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation, and of course, I mean, uh, I'm a fan of also Safaricom. Um, I think I lived uh, in a few African countries and when I came to Kenya, um, one of the things I loved was the simplicity of the banking system, and most importantly, Mpesa. I haven't had but cash in my pocket last three years, always just paying with Mpesa. So I used to uh, think for myself, how much is this guy taking for the transaction? Was, was it worth it? So simple, because it's, it's, it's also you know, addictive. Uh, I, I, and, you know, I, I have also some exposure in Europe. Let me tell you, the banking system here is probably in the frontier. Um, my U.S. bank doesn't work. You know, sometimes, you know, with a little glitch, you know, you, here you can make uh, international transfers. So one time I was even pleasantly surprised in Addis, I was able to pay all my bills, electricity, water, uh, and, and medical things for the family here through Mpesa. Mm -hmm. 
suddenly, I don't know, it was working my phone. I think there is some, so honestly, um, today we enjoyed all the presentations uh, from our researchers uh, and from our policy panelists, and I really thank everyone. Uh, we start with the Carnegie uh, Foundation. Hopefully next time, Safari Congo should be the one funding this type of <coughs> research. And by the way, we are doing also in another project, similar thing, just to evaluate the impact of MPESA uh, at the macro level, for instance, on uh, uh, monetary policy, but at the micro level also uh, on issues of financial inclusion uh, and also uh, a bit on the potential for interoperability of platforms uh, and what are the constraints uh, and especially catching up with the new technologies. Uh, so hopefully we can, ARC will continue to do what you have said, uh, is uh, uh, establish the bridge between uh, research and innovation uh, so that for us also to understand the whole data generating process uh, in this uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution, the one you have mentioned. Um, so uh, after that, I thank ERF, uh, the uh, Economic Research Forum based in Cairo, uh, who led this uh, collaborative research, so we are very appreciative of that. And then uh, uh, I thank, of course, our ARC colleagues who made this possible, our IT department uh, and our research department. And then I also thank Dr. Rose for your kind uh, and very able uh, uh, moderation of the session. Uh, so everyone have a good evening. And our discussants, lovely discussants, uh, and our participants online, uh, and all of you have a good rest. Uh, sorry we have run over the program. Probably next time again, this is something we have to really think about, uh, plan it well so that uh, we don't also disrupt people's lives. <laughs> so, <laughs> Asante Sana. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, but honestly, George, I mean, I would be happy to take your uh, card because we need to let you know what we're doing. So, uh, you, you, you are not left out. Record.